Before getting into the content of this course, we'll cover the course requirements or recommendations. First, it's recommended that students who enroll in this course should already have a basic knowledge of Python. The exercises, questions, and content of this course is introduced using Python, so without basic knowledge of it, this course may be difficult to understand. There are many online courses on Udemy and even free resources out there that provide you with the basic knowledge you'll need for Python, so please learn a little about it before taking this course. In this course, we'll be using Python 3.8.2 version. This course is suitable for students using Python 3 and above, but I would like to make note that whether all exercises work using all Python 3 and above versions have not been tested, so we cannot guarantee 100% that your version of Python will work exactly the same way as mine. Also, please have Python installed prior to taking this course. After this course is published, Python 3.9 or 3.10 may become available, but in general, there usually will not be any major changes, so it shouldn't be a problem. But as I mentioned earlier, I can't actually confirm this because I don't have access to all versions of Python, so please keep this in mind. Now on to my next point. In this course, I'm using an IDE called PyCharm. If there is a specific IDE that you like, there shouldn't be any problem using that. There are some free IDEs. Listed at the top is Visual Studio Core. This is very famous and free, so many people use this. Using IDEs like Visual Studio Core is also a good option. Now on to my next slide. I'll be using a Mac. If you are using Windows, your screen may look a little different. My next point, please understand that I may not be able to answer specific questions that you may have. If you do have any specific questions, please search for the answer first. For example, Google your question and try to find the answer. There is a Q&A section on Udemy, but it may take a while for a response to be posted, so I would first recommend Googling your question to get a quick answer. My last point is, please adjust the speed of the lecture if necessary. For example, if my talking speed is too fast or too slow for you to follow along, you can adjust the speed of the lecture by clicking on the bottom left section of the video. Please adjust the speed there and set it to a speed you feel is best for your learning. Now on to our next slide. There are some points regarding the codes that are used in this course. Reading from the top, the material and or exercises that are introduced in this course may not be reused in any form such as for other online courses, YouTube, blog, and published material. Posting a couple lines of codes and link to this course on sources such as on blogs may be acceptable. Next is, please do not post or make available the source codes used in this course in any format such as GitHub. Codes can be used for commercial purposes, but only after complying with the points as stated above. If unsure or if you would like to ask for permission, please directly contact me, the instructor, to request for permission. Now that we've covered the basics regarding the course enrollment, let's get to the actual content of the course. First, let's discuss briefly about what is algorithm. Algorithm is a process or is a set of procedures and calculations that provide the correct answer to a particular problem. Looking at the bullet points here, algorithm can be used to create the foundation for programming, can improve system performance, and can improve system maintainability. For these reasons, you can see that knowing algorithm is very crucial. Now let's look at how algorithm can be used in an actual work environment. When there's not much data that needs to be processed, an algorithm with a slow response time may be okay. But if there is a lot of data, speed becomes important. What you'll need is a good quality algorithm with a quick response time with source codes focusing on efficiency. Effective and efficient are the key. And as I have listed down below in bullet points, it's especially important to have good algorithms for projects such as Google's search function and Tesla's automated driving. If you think about it, good algorithms may be the reason why we're able to live in such a fast-paced, high-tech world right now. Even a couple seconds faster in processing time becomes important. Efficiency is important, and if you don't have knowledge of algorithm, you won't be able to write codes that can achieve this. 
So that's why candidates interviewing at GAFA, which is an acronym for Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, always go through a coding interview. If you don't know algorithm, you won't be able to answer their interview questions. So if you do want to work as an engineer, especially in the Silicon Valley, it's important to be able to answer coding questions. In some other countries, priorities may be different. For example, there may be countries where even candidates who are applying for an engineer position is tested on their communication skills rather than actual programming skills. But times are changing and the entire world is becoming more westernized. So even if there is no coding interview right now in a particular country or company, that may change in the future. Knowing algorithm isn't just important for candidates applying for an engineer position. Engineers who are already working on projects such as Google's search function and Tesla's automated driving also need to know algorithms to make their projects work faster and better. So please remember, all engineers, including engineers-to-be and already those who are highly experienced, can benefit from knowing algorithms. Next is what is data structure? Data structure is a particular way of organizing data in a computer so that it can be used effectively. We'll discuss about this in more detail later on in the course. So for now, please just try to get a general understanding. Data structures are a way we can store and retrieve data and are designed in a way so that we can get the desired result. Some of the major types of data structures that we'll cover in detail in this course are linked list, hash table, stack and queue, and tree. First, before we get into the specifics about algorithms, let me introduce big O notation. Big O notation is used to clarify algorithms according to how much time it takes to run the algorithm compared to the data input. It describes the performance or complexity of an algorithm. Before getting into algorithms, it's important to get a general understanding of this big O notation. On the x-axis here, we have data input. On the y-axis, we have time. So how do we interpret this and look at this graph? First, let's look at this here. We have O1 here, and we refer to this sometimes as order one or big O1. What does this mean? This means even if data input increases, time does not change. Time is constant. Typical examples of these are arrays. For the other ones, you'll see that the data input amount changes the amount of time needed. For example, let's look at this, O log N, log N describes a situation where as data input increases, the amount of time it takes becomes flatter. Then there's situations like ON, right here, which is referred to as linear time. And as you can see, as data input increases, time increases in a linear pattern. And then there are cases where as data input increases, the time it takes to process increases exponentially, as in O, N to the second, n to the third, and n to the n. It's difficult to try to understand this better just by looking at this graph. So now let's look at actual codes. Here we have examples of big O notation. To the right here, we have algorithms classified in order from best to worst performance. In order to better understand this, let's look at the code starting from the one here. This is the fastest possible runtime analysis and is commonly referred to as constant running time. Here we have func1 and some numbers. For example, a list of numbers. This means to return to the number at the beginning of the list. Accessing any single element in the list of numbers will take the same amount of time regardless of the length of the list. This number one is easy to understand. Next we have o log n which we refer to as logarithmic running time. We'll get into a little mathematics with this one, but we have func2, and then for n, we have, let's say, 10. We look at the if statement, and since 10 is greater than one, this does not apply. We'll look at the else statement. We'll replace the n with 10. 10 divided by two is five. Then n becomes five, and we'll look at the func2 at the top again n is greater than 1 still, so 
we'll look at the else statement. n is 5. We'll look at here, func2. 5 divided by 2 is 2.5. And then now n is 2.5, which is still bigger than 1. So we'll look at the else statement again. n is 2.5, so we divide that in half, and we have 1.25. So let's look at the number we had for n. We started off with 10, then 5, then 2.5, then 1.25. You divide the structure in half over and over again and do a constant number of operations for each split. In this case, the process is gradual, but the numbers gradually get closer to 1. Let's go back to the previous slide. Let's say that this point is 1. The numbers in log n gradually get closer to this 1. For people who've already studied mathematics, you may already know this, but log n results in a line where the curve peaks at the beginning and slowly flattens out as the size of the data set increases. Increasing the size of the input data set has little effect on its growth, since after a single iteration of algorithm, the data set will be halved and therefore on a par with an input data set half the size. This concept may be hard to visualize, so let's try to understand it better by writing some codes. We're going to write the algorithm we used for func2. First, we have log n. Then we'll define func2 and then write n. If n is less than or equal to 1, then we'll return. If that doesn't apply, then we'll print n and then we'll write func2 n and divide n by 2. Let's say that n is 10, so func2 10. And we're going to call the function. Then to the right side, we have 10, 5, 2.5, and 1.25. We see that the numbers are halved. So even if you have the number 10, that doesn't mean that this function is called 10 times, but just 4 times. So this is what log n means. Next, let's look at what was mentioned in our previous slide, big O of n, or what we call as linear time. We'll define it as func3, then numbers. Let's write for num in numbers. We'll simply print out the num. Then for func3, we'll provide the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and then run the code. When you run this, we see that the code was run 5 times. Let's increase the amount of numbers and include 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We'll run the code and now we see that we had to run it 10 times. So to sum it up, O of n means that your algorithm will take on the order of n operations to insert an item. Next, I'm going to make some space here and then write big O of n multiplied by long n. So what will this look like? We'll define it as func4 and then n. Let's use for loop and then in range integer n. And then write print i. And let's say no line feed after print. Then let's say print. Our if statement for this is if n is less than or equal to 1, then we return. If not, then func4 and divided by 2. For this one too, let's say func4 and input the value 10 and run the code. We see that in this func2n, we needed 4 times to run the code. 1, 2, 3, 4. Until this n becomes less than 1, we need to call func4. We need to do this 4 times, but when we did this, we need to refer to this for loop and print it out n times. So we printed it out 10 times here. Then next, it was 5 times, then 2 times, then once. We're printing it out half the number of times as before. So we have long n here. That is this highlighted section here. But to this, we multiplied it n times. That's why we have n times written here. That means compared to log n, this takes a longer processing time. Now I want to clear up some space, so I'm going to erase this section here. We'll write big O n to the second. We'll define it here and write func5 numbers. Then it's going to be 4i in range len numbers. 
How many times we execute the for loop depends on the length of the list. In addition, we'll also be executing for j and range len numbers within the loop. Executing this results in n to the second. For example, let's say print numbers i, then numbers j. This part is simple. And now, after we print, we want to add a line to make it easier to follow. And say func5, and then say 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We have 5 items here in this list. We'll run the code, and you'll see on the right hand side here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 groups. So we have 5 groups here. In addition, we have this for loop within the for loop, right here. We're doing this 5 times 2. So we see that big O n to the second takes longer to execute than the previous codes mentioned before. So as you can see from all these examples, by looking at the big O notation, we can get an idea of what kind of code it is and its efficiency. So now going back to the big O notation slide, we cover some examples of big O notation here. And by understanding these examples, you can get a better understanding of the algorithms in this course and be more efficient when rewriting codes. Knowing big O notation lets you analyze efficiency and scalability. So on to our next topic, we have stable sort. So we have here, stable sort, and unstable sort. We're going to briefly discuss about this since this is basic information that will be useful. First, let me show you the next slide. This here is a list of sorting types that will be introduced later on in this course. Some of the types of sorts that we'll discuss are BOGO, Bubble, Cocktail, Comb, and Selection. This isn't the complete list. And here is another page with the types. We have Gnome, Insertion, Bucket, Shell, and Counting. And our another list, Radix, Quick, Merge, Heap, and Tim Sort. So as you can see, there are many different options when it comes to sorting. And as you can see here, each sort type has a specific type of complexity of calculation. And on the right side here, we have a column for whether the sort is a stable sort or not. This is the section that we're going to discuss from now. Now getting back to our previous slide, what is stable sort? In stable sort, items that are equal to each other aren't reordered during the sorting process. Here we have stable sort and unstable sort. As an example of stable sort, we have here L equals 1 Mike, 5 Rena, 2 Bill, 4 Emily, and 2 June. As an example here, let's say that this stable is a black box and we're just reordering the items here. When we print, the result is like this. We have at the beginning of the list this 1, which is Mike, 2 as Bill, 2, June, 4, Emily, 5, is Rena. So the list is ordered by the smallest number to the greatest. Let's look at the two here. We have Bill and June. In the original data, we have 2 Bill and 2 June. First it's Bill, and then it's 2 is June. So this order hasn't changed, and that's why this is a stable sort. Now let's look at an unstable sort. We have a list here named L. We have a function here to reorder the numbers. Let's look at the results that are provided here at the very bottom. We have 1 Mike, 2 June, 2 Bill, 4 Emily, and 5 Rena. Let's look at the two. First it's June, and then it's Bill. So we see that the order here has been reversed, and that's why this is an unstable sort. In our next lectures, we'll be covering the different types of source, which is the foundation for all your coding needs. We have three pages worth of source. So as you can see, there are many different types. We'll discuss about the complexity of the calculation and whether it's a stable or unstable sort for each sort. There are many different types of source introduced in this course. So if you feel that this section is too long, you may want to skip some portions of it right now. On these slides, I have the most important source written in red, such as bubble, selection, insertion, quick, merge, and heap. 
These are the most important sources to understand. So if you don't have time to view all the lectures in this course, I would highly recommend that you at least have knowledge of the source written here in red. From our next lecture, we'll be covering source, which is the foundation for all algorithms. First, let's talk about BOGO sort, or also known as monkey sort. That's a really funny name, isn't it? It's sometimes also called random sort or shotgun sort. So why do we sometimes refer to this as monkey sort? Well, it's said that even monkeys can do this sort because it's a very inefficient sorting algorithm that even monkeys can do. Usually when we refer to sorts, we usually refer to sorts other than BOGO sort. Since BOGO is used mainly or only for educational purposes to contrast it with the other more realistic algorithms. But here in this course, we're going to discuss this sort and demonstrate this sort with our codes. For this sort, I won't go too much into detail about average, best, and worst case scenarios, but the idea is when we rearrange numbers randomly, it may take us one time to sort it properly or several attempts. The best scenario here is where we only have to do this process once. The worst scenario is where we shuffle the input array and see that it's not sorted. We'll then repeat the process of shuffling the input array, and if not in order, we'll repeat again. The process has no upper bound and can go on forever. So as you can see, it's not a stable sort, and it's mainly used for educational purposes, but let's look at the code for this. First, we'll write import random, and later on, we'll randomly shuffle the numbers. First, let's say bogo sort, and then write numbers, then print numbers, since I like to show you the list of numbers. And then we'll write main here. After we've written that, we'll write bogo sort and some random numbers like 1, 5, 3, 2, 6. And now we're going to run the code. On the right hand side, we now have 1, 5, 3, 2, 6. These are the numbers in our list. Now we're going to look at numbers. We're going to use the numbers that we imported and say random.shuffle. We're going to randomly shuffle the numbers. This random shuffle will return none, so here we'll do return numbers. And we'll do print here, and then after that, we'll run the code. Now to the right, we have 51362. What we input first is 15326. These numbers were randomly shuffled, and the result is this 51362. This is what BOGO sort is. It's a sorting method that involves randomly shuffling, sometimes several times. So after shuffling, you have to ensure if the numbers are sorted correctly. And in order to do that, we'll write the function in order. Then we have to refer to the numbers that were shuffled. So we'll write numbers. We'll check if the numbers in our list were sorted properly. And to do that, we'll need for i in range. We want to get each index number from the list. So we'll say len numbers. We'll be comparing two lists of numbers. So we'll say i minus 1. We don't have to be looking at it with a loop. This will be easier to understand after writing all these codes and running them. We'll say if numbers i, and then the numbers next to that, which would be i plus 1. We'll be comparing these two, and if the number on the left side is bigger, then that means that if it isn't in order, we'll say return false. Let's look at the example to the right here. At first, i is 0, and this is 5. And then i plus 1 is 1. When we compare this 5 and 1, if the number to the left is bigger, that means that it isn't sorted in order, so we get a false. If all these numbers do follow the rule of the left number being greater than the number to the right, then we can say that the list is sorted in order and say return true. If the list doesn't return any falses in this loop, then that means that it is return true. So here I want to check this one last time. We're comparing numbers i and numbers i plus 1. We don't have to go all the way to the last number. If we loop to the point minus 1, then that's good enough. In this case, minus 1 refers to this 6. 
If we refer to these with index numbers, this would be 0, 1, 2, 3. We can just program the loop up to the 3, and then for 6 and 2, we can just compare the numbers using i plus 1. So that's why this is minus 1. So now we're done with in order. To make sure if the numbers are sorted randomly after we're done with random.shuffle, all we need to do is compare. So we'll say while and if not in order, then we'll say to repeat the random shuffle. This means while the numbers aren't in order, we'll continue to randomly shuffle. So we have this in order here, and when it's false, we'll continue with the random shuffle. But when this becomes true, we'll get out of this while loop and arrive at return numbers. Then at this line here of print bogo sort, we'll get the rearrange list. So now let's run the code. And after we run it, we have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 5, 6. We see that the numbers have been rearranged and this is correct. Let's look at the function in order. We're using four lines for this, as you can see here, but you can actually write this in one line by using list comprehension. So how do you do this? We're going to start by writing return and then use list comprehension. We want to call i, and this is the same as the index number down below. We'll write i for i in range, and len numbers, and minus one. This part is the same. And from now, we're going to say numbers, then i, and compare that with numbers i plus one. We're saying here that if this left portion is the same or smaller than the right side, then this would be true. And for this, we're going to use the all function. If this all returns as true, then that means that this all is also true. If even one of the numbers i and numbers i plus 1 comes out as false, then we get a false for this return here. You see that we use four lines here, but the same calculation can be performed by using just this one line, using list comprehension. This approach of writing just this one line is also fine. From now, let's add on to this code. We have numbers here, which is a type of list. In Python 3, we can write the type here. This is a technique that makes writing codes more efficient. In this case, we'll write list. In this case, this means that we expect list to be included in the numbers. After you run this code, we get either true or false, so we can write bool to let us know that the result is going to return boolean values. Towards the bottom here, we have bogo sort. For this code, we can also write list, and after you run this code, we'll get a list, so we'll write list. If you write and organize your codes like this, you can easily identify what is the input and what is the output. We'll run these codes again, and we'll see that we don't get any errors. In addition to this, you can also identify what will be included in the list. This time, we see that we have integers. It's possible for a list to include strings and not integers. In order to make it easier to identify what types of values we'll be expecting, we can type here int. But in this case, if we run this code, we'll get an error message. I'll run this code on my end right now, and you see that we get a message saying type error right here. For those of you who have Python 3.5 and above, you'll just type in from typing import list. This means that we'll import the type hint. When we do this, we'll change this lowercase l to an uppercase l, and then run the code again. Then we'll see on the right side that this doesn't result in any errors. For this one too, we'll change the lowercase to uppercase, and write integer to indicate that we expect integers when we run the code. We'll change the upper section here too, we'll write list with the uppercase, and then int for integer, you can write type hints in this format, and it may make your code cleaner in Python 3. We went over a lot of information, and from now, I'll be writing codes using what we just covered. Before that, let's look at some documents regarding this topic. Here, we have typing and support for typing hints. In Python 3, you can write what type is going to be the input and what type is going to be the output. When you want to be more specific by assigning the type to the alias, you'll use from typing import list. 
Other than lists, you could have dictionary, tuples, and sequences. There are many different possibilities when it comes to assigning the type to the alias, and instead of explaining each one using a document, let's actually use it in our codes. But if you really want to know more about the details, please look at the Python documents. So on to our last point in this lecture. We aren't using too many numbers in our BOGO sort, so I'd like to add more numbers by using nums. We'll write random, randit, and say 0 to 1000. And for in range, and let's say we'll run this 10 times. And then say print nums. We'll comment out this line here and then run the program. Now we see that 10 numbers between 0 and 1000 have been randomly selected. This is our list here. And let's run this code again. This time we still see 10 numbers, but the numbers are different from last time and have randomly been chosen. We want to use these numbers for the BOGO sort, so we'll go back to this line and use nums for this BOGO sort. When we run this code, it takes quite a while for the result. What does this mean? This means that we're shuffling the numbers randomly, so it takes time for the numbers to be rearranged. Now we get some 10 numbers on the right. Bogo sorts take a long time to run in general. If you are lucky, you might be able to run the code quickly. But if you aren't lucky, it may take some time. And that's why Bogo sort isn't that commonly used. Now on to our next topic, which is bubble sort. In this lecture, we'll be looking at bubble sort, which we have here. To make this easier to understand, I'll be explaining while using a video that illustrates the sorting of the elements. This is our video with our scenario for bubble sort. The numbers we're working with here are from the left, 2, 5, 1, 8, 7, and 3. Let's assume that these are the numbers that are included in our list, and we want to sort these elements. First, we'll look at 2 and 5, and if 2 is smaller than 5, then the order is fine, and we leave as is. Next, we move to the right and look at 5 and 1. 5 is greater than 1, so we'll swap these two numbers. We'll look at 5 and 8, which are in order. Now on to 8 and 7. 7 is smaller than 8, so we'll swap. Then we move to the right and compare 8 and 3 and swap. After we've done that, we go back to the beginning. We'll do the sorting from the beginning just like how we did it the first time but we'll stop sorting when we get to this red line that says limit. We place this limit line before the last number in our list. Now let's get back to sorting. We'll compare 2 and 1. 1 is smaller than 2, so we'll swap. Next, we have 2 and 5, that's fine, and also 5 and 7, which are both fine. Then we have 7 and 3, we swap these two around. Now we've reached our limit line, we'll repeat the sorting and place the red line before the second to the last number. We compared 1 and 2, and then 2 and 5, and now 5 and 3, which we have to swap. We'll move the red line one number closer, and repeat the sorting. These are both okay, then one last run. We'll compare 1 and 2, and there's no need to swap. Now we can say that our list has been sorted. Now that we understand how bubble sort works, let's use a Python program for bubble sort. If the concept of bubble sort was difficult to understand, I would recommend going back to the beginning of this tutorial and playing the video a second time or maybe a couple times to really understand how this works. Then move on to using Python. Let's move on to doing bubble sort in Python. For example, in an interview, you may have a coding test. You maybe explain what a bubble sort is and then be asked to actually make this possible using Python. Bubble sort is a simple sorting technique and it would be great if you're able to actually write the code for this on Python without having to look it up. So it may be good practice to try writing the code yourself for this too, while watching this video. Imagine that an interviewer is asking you the same question. So let's start writing. First thing is to write from typing. This time too, we want to use our list, so we're going to do import list. After this, we'll define bubble sort. Then we'll write numbers, which is a list that contains integers. Then we want our output to be a list of integers. So that's why we write list int. Now we want to determine the length of the numbers. That's why we'll write len numbers. We'll get the length of numbers from here. This may not be easy to understand, so we'll say 
if name underscore underscore main underscore underscore. As an example, we're going to use these numbers to the right. Nums 2518873. Then write bubble sort nums. Then print len numbers. And now when you run the code, we'll see six. This six is just telling us that there are six numbers in this list. That's the length of this list. And now let's use a for loop for i in range, then len numbers. We want to get the i, so I'm going to delete this and write print i. When we run the code now, we see at the bottom 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We have these numbers showing here. We want to do iteration the same amount of times as the number shown here and rearrange the numbers. For example, for the first loop, the limit is here at the very end of the sixth number. You want to compare all numbers up to this point. In this case, first you want to compare the 2 and 5, then compare 5 and 1. It might be easier to actually write the code than explain it. So first I'll delete print i and then write 4j in range and then length the numbers negative 1. This just means that if the limit is at the very end of the list of numbers, we need to just compare 7 and 3. If we say that j is 7, then we just need to do j plus 1. Instead of going to the very end of the list, we just need to look at the numbers that's one less. And then we subtract i from that. This means that we're going to be moving the limit gradually towards the left. So what does this all mean? Let's look here. We have 0 for i at the very beginning. This means that this is 0. For this, this is len number minus 1. We don't have to subtract anything. So in this case, it's 6 minus 1, which is 5. The answer to this equation is 5, meaning we'll have 5 loops. We have 6 numbers total here, but we only need to loop until the 7. After doing this, all we need to do is compare the numbers and decide on which is bigger. First, we'll do if numbers and then j. At the beginning, this is 0. Next, we'll say the numbers and then j plus 1, and then compare it with the next number. Going back to our example, in this case, it's 2 and 5. j at the beginning is 0 and j plus 1 is 5. We'll compare the two and if the first number is bigger than the second number, we have to switch the numbers. For that, we'll write numbers j, then numbers j plus 1, which is the next number then numbers j plus 1, comma, then numbers j. This is what you would write when you want to switch the order of two numbers. Then all we have to do is say return numbers, and this is all there is to bubble sorting. Now let's just briefly review what we wrote. At the beginning in this loop, i is 0. That's why we have what's written down here. We have the numbers 0 through 5. Since i is 0, Range will be len numbers, which is 6, and then minus 1, minus 0. So the range is 5. Let's look at the sorting video to the right and review. For the first loop, we'll compare 2 and 5. In the next loop, we'll compare 5 and 1. And 5 is greater than 1, so we'll switch. Then for the third loop, we'll compare 5 and 8. No change. Then for the fourth loop, we'll compare 8 and 7 and switch. Then now to the fifth. 8 and 3, we'll switch the two numbers. We just completed 5 loops. And the limit moved 1 towards the left. We need to complete the steps up to this point using this for loop. Here. We have this i here. In our next loop, i is 1. Since len numbers is 6, it's 6 minus 1 minus 1. So that's 4. 4 is the number of range. This is 4. So the number of times we'll compare numbers is 1, 2, 3, 4. Four times. And within those four times, for example, let's take the 2 and 1, and let's resume the video. If we need to swap, we'll swap. There's one loop, second loop, third loop, and fourth time is 7 and 3. We'll switch the order for these two. I'm going to stop the video here and explain. Again, the limit moves one number to the left. So this highlighted code here is what's actually happening in this video up to this point. Let's make sure we're doing bubble sort correctly by writing print bubble sort. 
Let's run the code to see if we did it correctly. And looking at the bottom section, we have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8. The numbers have been sorted correctly. And this is what bubble sort is about and what it involves. Now we'll import random and try bubble sort using big numbers. We'll delete the nums and use list comprehension and write random. Ran it. For example, let's say 0 through 1000. And we want Python to randomly choose numbers between 0 through 1000. And let's say we want 10 numbers, so we'll write for i in range 10. Let's run the code with this and we get the numbers 75, 98, 116. We see that the numbers have been sorted from least to greatest and the numbers have randomly been chosen. Since the numbers have been randomly chosen, that means that if you run the code again, we'll get a different set of numbers. So this is a summary of bubble sorting using this highlighted code. Bubble sort requires a pair of nested loops. We have the outer loop and we have the inner loop. Going back to the big O notation, that means that this is n to the second. Now let's move on to the next sort. In this lecture, we're going to cover cocktail sort. This sort is also referred to as the cocktail shaker sort. And to the right here, we have written here, it's an improvement of bubble sort. It's very similar to bubble sort. And for understanding this sort, think of bubble sort as an old fashioned sort while I explain the details of the cocktail sort from now. First, we see that we have four, five, one, eight, seven, and three. Let's say that we have these numbers in our list. Just like the bubble sort, we're going to look at our list from the beginning. First, we have four and five, and that's fine as is. On the bottom here, we have swap equals false. When we do actually swap the two numbers, this false becomes true. Let's look at the next set of numbers, five and one. We need to swap the two numbers. Then the swap down below becomes true. Five and eight is fine, and eight is seven. Seven is smaller than eight, so we'll swap the numbers. Next, it's eight and three. Three is smaller than eight, so we'll swap the numbers. And now that we've gone through the list once, we'll start sorting the numbers from the opposite direction. At this point right here, we already have eight to the very right, which is the largest number on the list. When we're at the very end of our list, the swap here will be back to its initial state, which is false. Now we're going to be moving in the opposite direction. We know eight is the largest number, so we'll move the limit one space to the left. Next, we'll compare seven and three. Three is smaller, so we'll swap. Next, we have five and three, same here too. Three is smaller than five. We have one and three, this is fine as is. And four and one, one is smaller than four, so we'll swap. We see here that the smallest number has come to the very left. The next step is to move the limit one space to the right and then start comparing the numbers from the list. We have four and three, we'll switch these two, and once again, the swap becomes true. We have four and five, no change, five, seven, no change. Next, we'll move in the opposite direction. The swap down becomes false again. We'll continue comparing the set of numbers as long as the swap stays false. And now, we're looking at three and four, which is fine, so we didn't have to change the swap to true at all. And that means that we've reached the end of our sorting and the numbers have been sorted correctly. We can say that this cocktail sort is a sorting technique that can end at the time when we know that this swap will stay false, even if we haven't gone through comparing all the numbers. Unlike bubble sort, we don't have to continue running a certain number of times comparing all the elements over and over again because that's what we said in our algorithm. For this reason, cocktail sort is faster than bubble sort. Now that we've covered what cocktail sort is, let's move on to writing this using Python. First, we'll write from typing, import list. Then we'll move on to our next line. We'll define cocktail sort. We'll write numbers. This is a list with integers. And the result is also a list of integers. So we'll write list int. Now we'll write len numbers equals len numbers and get the length of the list as our numbers. Next, let's write swapped equals, and for the first time, let's use true. What does this mean? This means that while swapped, we're making the decision as to whether it's true or false, but first we want to include this during the while loop. When we start the sorting, we're going to start with false. In the video here to the right, we see that we start off with swap equals false. This swap equals false is our starting point. 
Next, we're comparing 4 and 5 and 5 and 1. So that's two numbers from left to right. Later on, we'll be moving in the opposite direction, from right to left. So let's focus on the start and end index numbers. Let's say that start is 0 and end is len numbers minus 1. Y minus 1. When you look at this, you notice that when you start the iteration and get to the 7 and 3, if you add 1 to the 7 here, you'll get to the last number in the list. That's why we have minus 1 here. From here on, it's the same as bubble sort. So we'll just write the codes here and explain briefly. We have 4i in range and look at the list from start to end. Then we'll say if numbers i is larger than numbers i plus 1, then we'll stop the numbers. So we'll have here numbers i and then numbers i plus 1. And we'll switch that with numbers i plus 1 and then numbers i. When we swap the two numbers around, that means we also have to change swapped to true. So we'll do swapped equals true. Now let's resume the video. This for loop here that we just wrote is the for loop for when the sorting action moves towards the right direction. We're looking at 5 and 8, then 8 and 7, then we switch the numbers. Then we compare 8 and 3 and swap the numbers. Let me stop the video here. At this point, the swap here is true. That means we have swapped the numbers. If at this point you haven't swapped any numbers, then we'll write if not swapped and exit out of this loop. And that means that we're done with the sorting. So for that, we'll write break. At this point with our example, we're still not done with the sorting because we have swap is true. That means that we have to continue sorting and compare the numbers in the opposite direction. So we'll write swapped equals false and reset the swap flag. And now to the end. Our limit moves 1 to the left, so we have n minus 1. I'll resume the video here. We reset the swap flag to false. The limit moves 1 to the left, and this section is the n minus 1. Now we want to use for loop and move in the opposite direction. So for i in range n minus 1, and then start minus 1, and move one number at a time in the left direction. This is how we write the for loop, and after writing this, we'll copy the three lines from the top and paste that to the bottom here, like so, and we'll do the same thing as before. So this section here that's highlighted right now may be a little hard to understand, so let me show you using interactive shell. For example, let's look at the very top, len numbers, and this results in a 6. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 numbers, so it's 6. And when we subtract 1 from 6, it's 5 here. And we have n minus 1, which is a 4. Here we have another n minus 1, so we have a 3. So here we're going to use list comprehension and say i for i in range 3. And then since we started with 0, we'll write negative 1, since 0 minus 1 is negative 1, and then minus 1. What will our index number be? We'll get 3, 2, 1, 0. Looking at this, the index number is at first 0, then 1, 2, 3. We're using this index number and the number to the right and swap these two around. We're comparing numbers while moving in the opposite direction. And that shows that this for loop is working properly. So now we're done with the coding for looping through the list in the opposite direction. After we've reached the end, we'll do start and start plus 1 so that this limit here is moved 1 towards the right. And let's resume this video. We have 7 and 3, which we swap, and the swap flag down here becomes true. Then we compare 5 and 3, then 3 and 1. That's fine. Then next we have 4 and 1, which will be swapped. Now the limit moves to the right. This section of where the limit moves 1 to the right is this section here of start plus 1. We're done writing the code, so all we need to do is write return numbers. And as you see here, we have swapped equals true. If swap is true, then we'll start from the beginning and then swap flag will be reset to false. So the flag will be reset at the beginning of the loop here. And at the end, if we did swap any numbers, we have if not swapped and we have the break statement here, meaning the list has been sorted. So let's run the code. 
we'll say if name underscore underscore main underscore underscore. We'll write import random again and say nums random rand int and say 0 to 1000 and then for i in range 10. After that, we'll say print cocktail sort then nums. When we do this, we get on the bottom 257, 365, and other numbers, and we see that this has been sorted correctly. When we execute the code another time, we get a different set of 10 random numbers that are also ordered from least to greatest. We've tested and confirmed that our code for cocktail sort works. Writing the index numbers may be confusing, so just make sure to be careful when writing this section. And now that we're done with this cocktail sort, let's move on to our next sort. In this lecture, we're going to cover comb sort. Comb sort is a relatively simple sorting algorithm and is a sort that is a variant of bubble sort. In this sort, we use gaps or increments of size more than one. We'll get more into this after watching this video animation for comb sort. This is our video animation for comb sort. The word comb comes from the comb you use when combing your hair. Imagine you're gradually shortening the length of the comb as you sort. First, let's look at what we have down below. Down below, we have written gap 7 divided by 1.3 equals 5. This number 7 is a number that's included in this list. And this is divided by 1.3. And 1.3 is a predetermined number. Please think of this gap 7 divided by 1.3 equals 5 as the length of a comb. You take a set of numbers that are 5 increments apart and compare and swap them if needed. Then you gradually decrease this gap. Let's continue looking at this video. First, let's discuss about the 5 increments. In this case, it's the 2 and 3. We compare these two and if there isn't any need to switch the two around, then we move on to the next comparison. Next, we move one increment to the right and we're comparing 9 and 5. 5 is smaller, so we swap the two numbers. In our next loop, we're going to be working with gap 5 divided by 1.3. This 5 refers to the number we used in our previous gap. We divide 1.3 by this 5 and we get 3. The length of the comb is now smaller. It's decreased from 5 to 3. We repeat the same process, but now using 3. So we'll compare 2 with 8, which is 3 increments to the right from 2, which is fine. Then 5 and 7, which is also fine. Then 1 and 3, which is fine. And 8 and 9, which is also fine. Now the gap is 3 divided by 1.3, which is 2. We'll repeat the same process again. We compare 2 and the number that's 2 to the right, which is 1. 1 is smaller, so we swap. Then it's 5 and 8, that's fine. Then 2 and 7, that's fine. Then 8 and 3, 3 is smaller, so we switch the 2. Next we have 7 and 9, this is fine. Next the gap is 2 divided by 1.3, which is 1. We continue comparing numbers until our gap is 1. We have to continue with our sorting until there's no need to swap anymore. So we'll be using swap equals false. Let's continue with our sorting. We'll look at 1 and 5. That's fine. Then 5 and 2. We'll swap those two around. At this time, swap equals true. Then we swap 3 and 5. Then 5 and 7, which stays as is. Then 7 and 8, which is fine. Then 8 and 9, which is also fine. We'll change the swap to false and look at it one last time. Just because the gap is 1, that doesn't mean that the sorting is complete. So we have to continue comparing numbers until swap equals false. We can say that the sorting is complete when we do one last round of comparisons when the gap is 1 and swap stays false. First, we'll look at 1 and 2. That's fine. Then 2 and 3, which is also fine. 3 and 5 looks good. 5 and 7, that looks good. 7 and 8, that's fine. And then 8 and 9, which is also fine. And swap stayed false. We didn't have to change it to true, so that means that our sorting is now complete. Now that we understand how comb sort works, let's get to writing the algorithm. We'll start by writing from typing import list. Our function name is comb sort, and just like in our previous lectures, 
We'll write numbers, then a list that includes integers. That's the input, and the output is also a list with integers. Next, we say len numbers, and then that's the length of our list. Then we write gap, and that equals the length of our list. So we input len numbers. Next, what we do is write swapped, and by default, it's true. That's going to be our initial setting. Now, I'd like to resume the video to the right here. At the beginning, we have gap 7 divided by 1.3 equals 5. If the length of our list here is, let's say, 7, then we divide by 1.3 and we get 5 as our gap. We continue sorting until our gap becomes 1. So we'll write this using a while loop. While gap is not 1, we'll continue with the while loop. In addition, we'll have gap equals integer gap divided by 1.3. If gap becomes less than 1, then at that time, we just need to change the gap to 1. So now let's look at our video to the right. If you look at this, we see that our gap is 5. We need to look at two numbers that are 5 increments apart. So we'll say for i in range, and we start from index number 0, and compare with a number that we say is the length of our numbers minus gap. For example, if we look to the right, len numbers is 7, so 7 minus 5, which is our gap, is 2. We'll do this twice, so we compare 2 and 3. Then we compare 9 and 5. I'm resuming the video here. We finish 2 and 3, and here is 9 and 5. We swap these two around, so this means that we need to do the comparing twice. So just like before, with our for loop, we'll write if numbers, we'll compare numbers i, and then this time numbers i plus gap. We compare these two numbers, and if numbers i is bigger, then we need to swap. So you write numbers i, and then numbers i plus gap. We need to switch the order, so you write numbers i plus gap, followed by numbers i. This is what needs to be written, and after running this while loop, then we do return numbers. If we stop here, it means that we can sort only until gap hasn't reached 1. But this is missing the final part of this sort, where we check whether swap is false when gap is 1. So let's resume the video. Here we have gap 5 divided by 1.3 equals 3, and our increment is 3, as you see. The code that we've written so far on the left section here is fine for this portion of the video. Now the gap is 3 divided by 1.3 equals 2. We're comparing two numbers that are two increments apart. We compare at this point 8 and 3, we switch the two around, and then compare 7 and 9. Those two are fine. The next step is the part where we need to focus on. We previously mentioned how we need to refer to swap equals false. We have to write the code for this section too. So I'll pause the video. We have written here while loop while the gap isn't 1, and then we include or swap for when swap equals true. We need to continue the sort while the swap is false. So at the beginning here, we need to make swapped equals false to reset it back to its initial state. After making this false, we need to include a line to say that we want it to be swapped equals true when we do swap numbers around. If we have swapped equals true and it doesn't change to swap equals false, then this swap becomes false and we can exit the while loop. So when gap equals 1, we need to use the boolean values for swap and confirm that the code that we wrote works properly. Now let's run the code. So we'll write if name, then main, then nuns, and like the numbers in our list here, we'll use 2, 9, 1, 8, 7, 3, and 5. Then we'll write print comb sort and use these numbers. And what do we get? We get the numbers here. 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 9. We see that the numbers have been properly sorted. Let's play around with this more and now use random numbers. We'll write import random and I'm going to remove these numbers and use list comprehension and write random dot rand int and say to use these numbers that are between 0 to 1000, and for i in range, use 10 numbers. 
When we run the code, we see 10 random numbers sorted properly, even though the numbers are much bigger than before. Let's do the sort one more time. We see a different set of numbers that have been correctly sorted. This is how comb sort works, and now let's move on to our next sort. This lecture is going to be about selection sort. First, we're going to watch a video illustrating the general technique involved with selection sort. Then we're going to introduce how to write the code. First, at the beginning of our list, we have two. For now, we're going to temporarily place this two right here, where the arrow is pointing. Then we're going to compare this two with the next number, which is five. Two is smaller than five, so we're going to move on to the next number. Next, we're going to compare one and two. One is smaller, so we're going to replace the two with one, since one is the smallest number here. And we're going to keep on doing this. Next, we have eight and one, then seven and one. One is smaller, then three and one. One is smaller. Now, we see where this one appears in the list. This one is the smallest number in the list, so we're going to swap places with the first number in the list. Now, one, which is the smallest number, is the first number in our list. Next, we'll look at the next number, which is five, and start the same sorting from here. We're comparing two and five. Two is smaller. We compare eight and two, then seven and two, and then three and two. Two is always smaller, so we swap the two with the first number of this iteration. Now we move to the next number, which is a five. We put it down below temporarily. We compare it against the eight, seven, and three. And three is smaller than five, so the five is replaced by a three. Just like before, we move the start line one space to the right and compare eight and seven. Seven is smaller. Then we compare seven and five, and five is smaller. Five is the smallest number in this round, so it's switched with the eight, the first number for this round. We move the start line and then start with seven, we replace 7 at the bottom and compare it with the 8. 7 is smaller, so no need to switch. Select sort is also another straightforward sorting technique, and when you write the code for this, it's also not too complicated. So let's start writing the code for this. Let's start with from typing import list. Selection sort is a famous sorting technique, so it's best if you learn this and be able to write the code off the top of your head. So here we have selection sort, numbers, list integers. That's our input, and our output is also a list with integers. That's how we're going to define our function. We have len numbers, and that's going to be len numbers. We're going to write for i in range, len numbers, so that we can use a range loop. Let's look at i here. It's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. i is 0 for the index number here. If you recall, we wanted to keep this 2 which is index number zero temporarily on the bottom. I'm going to resume the video a little here. At the beginning, we're gonna temporarily place this two down below. The index number for where the two is, we're going to write min index equals one. And once we've done that, we're gonna compare the two, which is the first number in our list, and we're gonna compare it with the numbers five, one, eight, seven, and three. So we need to write the for loop for that section. For this, we're going to write for j in range, and i at the beginning is 0, so we're going to write i plus 1, then len numbers. And after the loop, we're going to say if numbers min index, right now it's 2. So we're taking this 2 and then going to write numbers j. This j is going to start with 5. That means that we're going to be comparing 2 and 5. If min index is bigger, then that means that j is smaller. So we're going to write min index and j. Let's resume our video. Next, it's 2 and 5. 2 is smaller, so we move on. And next, it's 1 and 2. 1 is smaller, so the 2 is replaced with the 1. That's done with this section here, where it says min index is j. We're going to continue with this loop. We compare 1 and 8, then 1 and 7, and then 1 and 3. We're going to go all the way to the end, and at the end, the 1 is the smallest number. The index number is the 1 here. All we need to do is replace this 1 with a 2, which is the first number in the sequence. So that means that when we're done with this for loop, 
we need numbers i and numbers min index need to be replaced. So we're going to write numbers min index numbers i. We're done with the sort at this point, so we're going to write return numbers. And now that we've done that, let's resume the video and check our understanding. Right now, the smallest number is 1. The 1 and 2 should be switched. So we'll resume the video and see that 1 and 2 are replaced. Then the start line shifts one number. I'm going to pause and the start line moved one space to the right and that means that I shifted by one increment. Next, we focus on the 5. We replace a 5 temporarily at the bottom and start comparing this with the next index number. So it would be 2, 8, 7, and 3. So this for loop section is about i plus 1. So even if i shifted one increment, we have i plus 1. So in this case, that means that we can start comparing from the number 2. We're done writing the code, so all we need to do is run the code. We'll write main right here and then nums. Let's use the same example that's shown in the video here. We're going to use the numbers 1, 5, 2, 8, 7, and 3. Then type print selection sort nums. When we run the code, we get 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8. We see that the numbers have been sorted correctly. Let's write import random and use random numbers that are going to be between 0 and 1000. So we'll write random randit 0 to 1000 and 4 in range 10. When we execute the code, we see these numbers 129, 187, and so on. We'll run the code again and see a different set of 10 numbers that have been sorted correctly. We've confirmed that our code here works for selection sort. Selection sort is famous, so try to really understand and be able to write the code for this. Now let's move on to our next sorting algorithm. In this lecture, we're going to go over gnome sort. Gnome sort is similar to bubble sort. Let's first understand the concept with this video. Here's our video and gnome sort is very similar to bubble sort. At first, we'll compare 2 and 5. That's okay. Next, we shift to the right and compare 5 and 1. 1 is smaller, so we swap the two. In bubble sort, we continue to shift towards the right, but in gnome sort, we move one increment to the left after we swap two numbers. So in this case, we go back to comparing 2 and 1. We're going back and comparing two numbers that haven't been compared before. So we have 2 and 1, 1 is smaller, so these two numbers swap places. Now we compare 2 and 5. That's fine. Then 5 and 8, that's also fine. Then we have 8 and 7, 7 is smaller, so we need to switch the two. We go back one increment and look at 5 and 7. That's fine, 7, 8 is fine, and 8, 3, we compare and we swap places. Now we compare 7 and 3, 3 is smaller, so we switch. If we switch two numbers, we go back one increment. This means that this three will be placed in the appropriate place in the list. Once we get to a point where the two numbers don't need to be switched, we move towards the right. We continue moving towards the right and confirm that these have been sorted correctly. Gnome sort is a sort where a number that hasn't been sorted is compared against other numbers and gets to its proper place by a series of swaps. In that sense, it's similar to insertion sort. Now let's move on to Python and write the code for this gnome sort. Let's get right to this and start with writing import list. First, we're going to define a function for gnome sort. And we're going to write numbers and a list with integers for the input, and then a list with integers also for the output. Now we're going to do len numbers. And just like previous algorithms, we're going to take the numbers as the length. Next, we're going to do index equals zero. And in this case, it's going to be two because that's the first number in our list here. That's the number we're going to pick up. And next, we're going to use while loop. Since we're using index numbers, we're using while loop instead of for loop to indicate the index and look at the content of the list. Here, we're going to say less than len numbers. Next. If index is the leading number in the list, then index equals index plus 1. This means that we're going to move one increment. Index means the first number in our list, and we can compare just with this, 
So we're taking the number that's the next one. Once we do that, we'll get to the next loop. Next, we'll say if numbers is index, the index moved one number to the right. So that means that in this case, it's five. We want to compare this five and two. So if numbers index is greater than or equal to numbers index minus one, which in this case is the two, when we compare this section, this is five. If this is bigger, all we need to do is take the pointer to the next number. So in this case, we'll say index equals index plus one, and this will move the pointer one number to the right. Now I'm going to resume the video here. We're comparing two and five and no change, so move one number to the right. As you see here, we compare two numbers and when no change is needed, we move one to the right. So that's why this is index plus one. Next, what we're doing is comparing this five and one. One is smaller than five, so we have to switch these two numbers around. In this case, we'll write else. To explain this further, this just means that if numbers index is now one and numbers index minus one is five, one is smaller than five, so we'll apply the else here. In this case, all we need to do is switch the numbers index when the numbers index minus one. So we'll write here numbers index minus one and numbers index. If you recall, we mentioned how after switching the numbers, you have to move back one number. Let's confirm this by resuming the video. The numbers are swapped here and then we go back one and compare the two numbers. For this, we'll write index equals index minus one. This is all we need to write for this algorithm. So we'll write return numbers and run the code. For this section, index plus one, you can abbreviate and write it like this. If you're used to using Python, shortening the code by writing an abbreviated format is also fine. So I put a minus here, that's fine. And now let's see how this code turns out. We're gonna say if name equals main, then we'll write the numbers that we see in the video here. So two, one, five, eight, seven, and three. Next, print, gnome sort, then numbers. When we run this code, we get the sorted results here. One, two, three, five, seven, and eight. Just like in our previous videos, we'll import some random numbers by saying random, and I'm gonna delete some numbers here, and write random dot rand it zero to 1000, and then for in range 10, meaning we'll have 10 randomly selected numbers sorted as our results. We'll run the code and we see 59, 141, and 151, etc. These are 10 randomly selected numbers sorted. And just to confirm, we'll run it again, and we have a different set of 10 numbers. To deepen your understanding of this sort, please try writing a code to reflect the sorting that's done in this video. When you have an interview question that requires you to write the algorithms for, you might be asked an interview question where you have to write the code for a gnome sort with numbers similar to this. To prepare for that too, it may be a good idea to practice and be able to quickly write a code like this. Now let's move on to the next sorting algorithm. This lecture is going to cover insertion sort. This is a famous but really simple sorting algorithm that works similar to the way you sort playing cards in your hands. First, we're gonna compare one and seven. No change is needed. Next, we're comparing seven and three. Three is smaller than seven, so we need to compare three to the elements before and place it in the appropriate place. This next one may be most suitable to understand this sort. We compare seven and two, we switch the two, and then we compare three and two. Two is smaller, so the three moves to the right, and two takes the three's place. Three is smaller than seven, so we move on. Seven and eight is fine, so we move on. Next, we compare eight and five. We want to place five in the appropriate place, so we temporarily put five at the bottom. We then compare seven and five and swap the two. Five takes seven place, and this is how insertion sort works. With insertion sort, you take on an element and place it in its correct position in the sorted part. The algorithm for this isn't that difficult either. So now let's start writing. Let's start by writing from typing import list. We'll write define function 
and insertion sort, numbers, and list with integers. For the output, we also want a list with integers. So we'll write here, list int. First, just like in our previous lectures, we'll write len numbers and say we want the length to be the numbers. Then with for i in range, we want to look at each number, but we can start off with not the index number zero, but from the first index number and up to the len numbers. If you look at this video, index number zero is this one. We want to look first at this seven. The first step is to put this seven right here in tenth. So in the next line, we're going to write tenth equals numbers i. Next, we're going to use a variable j and say j equals i minus one and write while well, j is bigger or equal to zero. Let me resume the video to explain further. I'm going to fast forward this a little and for example, we have our two here. We want to compare the two up to the very end and then bring it to the appropriate place. And for this, we'll say while j is greater than zero, then we refer to this while loop and do minus one to j. I want to show you how this all works. So we'll run the function above. We'll write if name underscore underscore main and we'll write nums and our numbers in our list one, seven, three, two, eight, five. Those are the same numbers as the ones in the video and we'll print and write insertion sort nums. For now, I'm not going to write a return statement. And now going above, we'll print J here. For this time, we're going to say we're not going to start a new line by including space. And with this print, we're going to start a new line. We want to see how in this outer loop, how this J will work. So let's run our code now. And once we run our code, we see that J is 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 3, 2, 1, 0, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We see that the numbers are getting smaller as we move towards the right. So for example, let's look at this 5 in our video to the right. This 5 is moved increment at a time so that it's placed in its appropriate place. And that's why in our code, we're doing this minus 1 to j here. And now I'm going to delete this print section. And in place of that, I'm going to write while we're running our while loop numbers j plus 1 then numbers j. So we want to store numbers j in numbers j plus 1. By doing this, we'll be able to move our j one increment at a time. And with this, let's resume this video one more time. We see that this 5 moves. We're switching 5 and 8 around. As a result, the 5 moves one position to the left. Then the 5 and 7 switch places. And looking at our code, this highlighted section is telling to move the 5 one space at a time. Next, we need to think about how many spaces will move the five. This time we'll write and numbers j, and we have the five that we used for temp. We'll move the five until the other number becomes bigger than five. If numbers j becomes bigger than our temp, at this time we exit our while loop. And once we exit the while loop, right here we have j minus one. I'm going to remove the print here and write numbers j plus 1. We're going to store our temp in numbers j plus 1. Then we'll return numbers. Let's run our code with what we have right now. And when we run our code, we get the numbers 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 8. It's been sorted correctly. So this confirms that our code for insertion sorting is working correctly. This j plus 1 may be difficult to understand. So I want to explain while resuming our video here. We want to look at our number 2 here, and in this section we're comparing 7 and 2. 2 is smaller, so it takes 7's place. We place 2 in 10. 7 was originally here, but it moved one space to the right. This is the numbers j plus 1 equals numbers j. The numbers are able to move one increment because of this line. And now let's continue with our video. Next, we're comparing 3 and 2 and the 3 moves 1 space to the right, and 2 takes 3's place. Placing 2 in its appropriate place in the sorted list is this section here of numbers j plus 1 equals 10. 
During this while loop, we're doing j minus equals 1. So if j is here, then plus 1 would mean that the 2 is placed here. Now we're going to make changes to the numbers. We're going to say import random, and for nums, write random.randint 0 to 1000. Then for underscore in range and 10 for 10 times. We're going to run the code now, and as you see here, we have 10 random numbers sorted correctly. We'll run the code again and confirm that this code is working properly. Now that we understand insertion sorting, let's move on to our next sorting algorithm. In this lecture, we're going to cover bucket sort. On the right side here, I have under comments, utilizing insertion sort. We previously discussed insertion sort, which is a famous and simple sorting algorithm. But bucket sort uses this algorithm. We have here order n plus k. k here is the number of buckets to use, and so this changes depending on the size of the list. I'll discuss about this further in detail in my next slide. Let's get into details about bucket sort. This time I won't be using a video, but this slide, since I think it's easier to understand. First, let's say that we have a list with random numbers such as 1, 5, 28, 25, 100, and so on. Let's say that we have a list with these numbers. We're going to sort these numbers using insertion sorting, but before sorting, we're going to distribute the numbers into buckets. On the left side here, think of these as a bin for the numbers or buckets to place our numbers from our list. This time, I decided to use 10 buckets, but instead of using 10 buckets like this, you could just use 5 buckets, or if you have a list with many more numbers, you may have many more buckets. Making changes like these are not an issue. When you're deciding on the number of buckets, you see that the biggest number is 100 here, and there are 10 numbers in the list. If you divide 100 by the amount of the numbers in the list, you'll get 10, and that's one way to decide on the number of buckets. The number of buckets isn't that crucial. For this example, we created buckets from 0 to 9. From now, we're going to take these numbers here and distribute them into the buckets here on the left. The size here is 10, so we'll start looking at the number from here, the 1, and divide it by 10. The quotient is 0, so for this one, we'll place it in the 0 bucket. Let's look at 5. 5 is the same too. The quotient is 0, now 28. When we divide by 10, the quotient is 2, so we place it in the 2 bucket. Any number that's 20-something will be distributed in index number 2. Numbers in the 50s will be placed in index number 5. Numbers in the 90s, like 91, 99, will be placed in index number 9. We have 100 here, but 100 divided by 10 is 10. We don't have any index number 10, so we simply place it in the 9. That's why we have our 100 here, and that's why we have 191, 99 distributed here. And after we distribute the numbers in its appropriate bucket, just like what we did, we start the insertion sort process. The order of 1 and 5 is fine. We have 28, 25, 27, 22. These aren't in order, so we rearrange these numbers using insertion sort. As you see here, we sort the numbers in each bucket. Then we combine the sorted numbers. We get 1, 5, 22, 25, 27, 28, 52, 91, 99, and 100 when we rearrange these numbers using insertion sort. Bucket sort may not be as famous as other sorts, but let's write this algorithm in Python. This is the portion that we previously wrote with insertion sort. We'll be using this insertion sort, so I'm going to continue writing from here. We'll define our function, which is bucket sort, and write numbers, then a list with integers as our input, and the same goes for our output, so a list with integers. Then we're going to go a little down. I'll replace this with bucket sort, and this num section will change to 1, 5, 28, 25, 100, 52, and then 27, 91, and the other numbers that we used on the slide to the right. Now we're going to write our code for bucket sort. We're going to make some space for this right here. First, we're going to take max num and identify the max number, which is 100. We could say here to define the max size for this bucket sort, like this. 
but this time we're going to use maximum down below, as you can see, to pick up the maximum number. Then len numbers, and we're going to take the length of the numbers. And when trying to determine the size, we'll write max num and divide that by len numbers. And as you see to the right, the size here will be 10. For example, you could simply define the size by writing 10. That's one possible way to write it like this. But this time we're going to go with max size, as you see here, divided by len numbers. In this case, the size is going to be 10. So now moving on. Now we're going to say buckets and you want to make a list inside the list. So that's why we're going to use list comprehension and write for in range size. After that, we're going to say for nums and numbers and take the arrays in the list one at a time. To determine which bucket a number is going to be assigned to, we're going to say i equals num divided by size. And if the quotient isn't 10, so in this case, if the quotient is between 0 and 9, as you see here to the right, then we can say buckets and then i for index number, then append num. So for numbers 1, 5, 28, 25, we just place them in the appropriate bucket. When we have numbers like 100, 100 divided by size, which is 10, so the answer is 10. In this case, we don't have a bucket with a 10, so we put it in a bucket with a 9. That's why we're going to include this else statement. If we have 100, that means we're going to place it in the last bucket. So far with this code, we can allocate the numbers 1, 5, 28, 25, 27, 22 to the appropriate bucket. Next, what we're going to do is for i in range size. We have a list of numbers that have been assigned to each bucket. We want to look at each of these numbers, so we'll need to say buckets i. For example, if we say bucket with index number 0, that means we're looking at 1 and 5. From here, we'll do insertion sort and then rearrange the numbers. When you do this, that means that these lists will be sorted using insertion sort. Now all you have to do is combine the lists in each bucket, so we'll say result for i in range size. Then all we have to do is say result and then add buckets i to this. Then we're going to say return result the code should be fine, so let's try running it to confirm. We've run the code and see towards the bottom. We have 1, 5, 22, 25, 27, 28, 52, 91, and 100. We do see that the numbers have been sorted correctly. Just like in our previous lectures, let's try using random numbers now. And as you can see here, the list has been sorted correctly using bucket sort. So this is the end of my explanation about bucket sort. Bucket sort isn't that crucial. So understanding what it is and how to write the code for it may be good enough. If it's difficult to understand, I'll remove the comments like this and then print buckets to make it easier to understand. You'll be able to better understand what's happening to the buckets. For example, we have one and five in this bucket. You see the 1 and 5 on the right hand side here. We have these numbers in the 20s in this bucket, and we have 52 here, and then the last set of numbers we have right here. We're able to confirm what's in our bucket with this line. Then we have this insertion sort, and we take the list of numbers in our bucket and sort. After sorting the buckets, we'll also show the results here and run the code. When we execute, we see the results of our second bucket. We have 91, 99, and 100. We see that it's been sorted. You could confirm this and then move on to writing the last part. If the codes are difficult to understand, then including print at times in your algorithm is one way to make sure you're understanding what's happening at a certain time. So this is the end of my video on bucket sort, and now let's move on to the next sorting algorithm. In this lecture, we'll be covering shell sort. 
Shell sort relies on increment sequence or gap sequence. So it is similar to comb sort from this perspective. And to the right here, we have noted that this algorithm is a variation of insertion sort. First, let's look at a video to see how shell sorting works. This is the list we're going to use for shell sort. We have 5, 6, 9, 2, and 3. The length of this list is 5. First, we want to identify the gap. Let's say n is 5, so the gap in this case is 5 divided by 2. This is an integer, so let's start off with the gap as 2. The gap is 2, and where the index number 2 is, is this 9. We'll take this 9 out, and two numbers before this 9 in this list is 5. We'll compare this 5 and 9. 5 is smaller than 9, so this is fine as is. Next, we'll be looking at this 2. Since the gap is 2, two numbers before this is 6. We'll compare and we'll switch. Next, we have 3 and we'll take this number out and compare it with 9. 9 is greater than 3, so 9 takes 3's place. Then we'll look at the number, that's two numbers before, where the 9 was, which is 5. 5 is greater than 3, so the 5 moves up, and then the 3 takes the 5's place. Now, on to the next step. Gap is now 3, so we'll do 3 divided by 2, which makes the gap 1. We repeat the process now with gap being 1. In this case, we'll start off with index number 1, which is this 2. We'll take this 2 out temporarily and compare it and swap with the 3, since 3 is bigger. Then 2 takes the 3's place. We're halfway there. Now we're going to compare the 3 and 5. And the order here is fine, so 5 will just go back to where it was. 5 and 6 and 6 and 9 are both fine, so we leave it as is. We've reached the end, so we're done with our shell sorting. I think it's easier to understand this algorithm while writing the code, so let's try using Python now. Let's get to writing the code. First, we'll define the function. This is shell sort, then numbers with a list of integers. It's going to be our input, and our output is also going to be a list with integers. Next is len numbers. We're going to take the numbers in the list as the length. First, we want to figure out the gap, so we'll do len numbers divided by the integer 2. This is the line for calculating the gap. I'm going to resume the video. It's n divided by 2, and the len numbers here is 5, so it's 5 divided by 2. In this case, the gap is going to be 2. We're going to continue with the gap until it reaches 1, so we'll write while gap is greater than 0, and use a while loop to continue the loop. Next, we look at this 9, and the number that's two number before this is 5. We'll write for i in range, and the gap is 2 right now. So we'll start with index number 2, and n at the last index number. So that's why we'll write len numbers. Next, you see on the right that we have 9 in our box temporarily placed at the bottom. We'll write temp, equals numbers i. Then we'll write j equals i, which in this case is the index number for the gap, which is 2. We'll use this j and use while loop. So first we'll write off with while j is greater than gap and numbers j minus gap is bigger than temp. We'll continue the loop. Let's look at the video to make it easier to understand. As you see here, we have 2, and 2 before that is 6. Since 6 is bigger, we'll move the 6. Then after 2 and 6 are switched, we have 3. We'll take the 3 and put it in our temp box. 2 before the 3 is 9, and 9 is bigger, so it moves. Then we look at two numbers before this, which is 5. 5 moves to the right, and then the temp takes the 5's place. This happens after we move the 5. Let's play back the video a little to review. We have this 3, and our gap is 2, so 2 before this is the 9. We compare the two numbers here. Then we have to continue this while j is bigger than the gap. If we compare two numbers before our j all the time, j will eventually be negative. So that's why we're going to write j 
minus equals gap. We'll be moving j in the negative direction. We're telling Python to continue moving j in the negative direction up until gap is greater than j. We have our condition here. If it meets this condition, then we have to move it to numbers, which is why we'll write numbers j equals numbers j minus gap. We have to rearrange the number, so that's why you write it like this. After we're done moving all the numbers, we'll write numbers j equals temp. So in our video to the right, I'm going to fast forward this a little. Three is in our temp box, and after the five moves, then the three takes the five spot. And this is j. Now all we need to do is say gap, which right now is two, divide by two, and that means that gap is going to be one. Then we're done writing our algorithm, so we're just going to write return numbers. So let's check our code. We're going to write if name and underscore underscore main underscore underscore. And just like our video on the right here, the numbers we have in our list is 5, 6, 9, 2, and 3. Let's write these numbers here and now print shell sort and nums. When we execute the code, we get 2, 3, 5, 6, 9. So the list has been sorted correctly. Now let's do import random and rewrite the nums. This time we'll write random dot rand int and 0 to 1000 for i in range 10. We run the code and see the random numbers are correctly sorted. We'll run it again and see that these numbers too are correctly sorted. This is the end of our shell sort explanation. I think it's easier to understand the code if you actually write this while watching the video to the right. So if you're having difficulty trying to write the code, please rewatch this video and check this code against yours. Next, on to our next sorting algorithm. In this lecture, we're going to cover counting sort. Counting sort runs in order of n, time, meaning that it requires less time for calculation. This is a faster algorithm than other sorts like quick sort or merge sort, but there are some cons. First, let's look at our next slide and discuss about this sort in detail. This is going to be our visual for counting sort. We're going to be referring to this slide for this sort instead of a video, since I think it's easier to visualize the sort this way. First, we have a list with random numbers. Our numbers are 4, 3, 6, 2, 3, 4, and 7. Let's say we're working with this list. Our first step is to identify the largest number, which in this case is this 7. Then what we need to do is prepare a list of index numbers that includes 0 and includes numbers up to 7. So now going back to this 7, if this number is, let's say, 100, then we need to prepare an array of counters up to 100. So it would be 100 as the last counter, since 100 is the largest number in the list. And that's one of the disadvantages of this counting sort. It may require a large space cost. In our example, the largest number is 7. So we have a list with 7 numbers prepared, including 0. After this, we have index number 0. But we first have to count how many zeros we have in our list. For our list here, we don't have any zeros, as you can see, so we write zero here. Now moving on to one, how many ones do we have in our list? We don't have any, so that's why we have zero. And for two, we have one, two, so we have one here. For three, how many threes do we have? We have one, two, so that's why we write two. For four, we have one, two, so we put a two here. For five, we don't have any 5, so we put a 0. For 6, we have 1 6, so we put a 6. And for 7, how many 7s? We have 1, so that's why we have a 1 here. So just like what we did now, our first big step is to count and fill in, like this, how many of a certain value we have within our list. Then our next step is to add these results. We have 0 and 0 written here. We're trying to figure out how many numbers there are up to that number. For this 0 and 1, 
we have 0, 0 listed, so it may not be the best example. If we add 0 and 1, we get 1. We have a 1 since the sum of the numbers listed before this is 1. Next, we'll add this 1 and this 2. 1 plus 2 is 3, so that's why we have 3 here. And then 3 plus 2 is 5. And next, we'll do 5 plus 0, which is 5. Then 5 plus 1, which is 6. 6 plus 1, which is 7. This total represents how many numbers are present prior to a particular number. This may be difficult to understand, so let's move on and I'll explain more. This is going to be our next step. We start looking at the numbers from the back. We have our 7 here. We need to think about where this 7 should be positioned. If we look at the index number for the counts for 7, it's 7. This means that counting from the start, this 7 is the 7th number. So looking at our blank list on the bottom, we should have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. The 7 should come here. This is a Python list, so we start with 0. We do 7 minus 1, which is 6, so we include the 7 in the index number 6 position. Since we put 7 in the box here, we need to take 1 away from here. This becomes 6. After we change this to 6, we look at the next number. This may be difficult to understand, so let's do some more. The next number is 4. For 4, we have the count for this, and the count for this is 5. Counting from the beginning, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This number 4 comes here. We place a 4 here, so we look at this 5 and take away 1, and therefore we get 4. Let's look at the next number. Next, we look at 3. We look at index number 3 and place it down below. Then we take away 1 away from this 3 and get a 2. If we don't do this and keep on going, we'll get to this 3 again. We can place a 3 in the same position. If we have a 2 here, that means we place the number here. So just a reminder that we always have to reduce by 1. Next, we look at 2. Same as before, we look at index number 2 and it says 1. So we place the number at the very beginning. We take away 1 and get a 0. Next, we look at 6. So we look at 6, we figure out that we need to place it in the 6 spot. We reduce by 1 and get a 5. Next, we look at 3. We look at index number 3, and we have a 2 here, so we place it in the second spot. We take away 1 from 2 and get a 1 here. And now our last number is 4. We look at index number 4 and see that it should go in the 4th spot. We reduce by 1 and get a 3. And now we see that our numbers have been sorted properly. This is how counting sort works. This is order n, where we do n operations to insert an item. Specifying the max number and counting, it's possible for the algorithm to take longer than n times, but in general, it's said that this sort requires n times to sort properly. Here we said that our max number is 7, and we prepared a list with 7 plus 1 numbers. But if this were let's say 100 or a large number, we need to prepare a space that will accommodate for that. That's the disadvantage of this sort. This counting sort may not be as important as other sorts, but let's quickly go over how to write this using Python from now. So let's start. First, we'll write from typing import list. Then define the function and write counting sort numbers then a list that includes integers as the input, and the same goes for the output, a list with integers. First, we'll identify the max num. Let's look at our example here. In our example here to the right, we have the max num as 7. We want to bring this number. Then we'll say counts, and at first, we'll put 0. And then max num plus 1. Right now, we're preparing a list for our counting purpose. We have our results here. And then for this list, for our results here, we're going to create a line for that too. We'll put zero again and say len numbers. We prepare lists so that we can start sorting from now. Next, let's focus on counters. How many fours do we have? How many threes? We're going to count how many we have. We'll pick up what's in each number. We'll say counts here. And for example, we have this 4. We look at the index number 4, and then add 1. 
That's how we're able to count. We'll use the loop to do the same for all numbers, and we'll get the numbers right here. And we'll get the values for this counts. So let's confirm this. We'll write if name underscore underscore main, and we'll take the counting sort from the above and we'll say nums. We'll identify our nums. We have four, three, six, two, three, four, seven. These are the numbers from our example. And we'll do print counts and run the code. When we do that, we see the numbers 00122011. We see the same counts on the right side here. Once we've confirmed that, let's look at this section below. We're taking the number from the previous value and adding it. For example, we have one, so that's why we have one. Next is two, two plus one is three, three plus two is five, so we're just adding two numbers. We're going to write this section from now. We'll do that by taking this for i in range. We're going to skip the first number and start from the second number. So it's a one. And then to our last counter. So this is our for i loop. Then we'll say counts i plus the counts one before that one. So it will be i minus one. We'll write print counts to confirm. And now we get the values 00135567. We have the same numbers over here. Now that we've created this list, we're going to take this number and determine where to place it. We're going to start from the last number in our list. So we'll say i equals len numbers minus 1. We're looking at the last number. And you want to use a while loop. So we'll write while i is bigger than zero. First, we're going to look at the first index number. So index equals numbers i. What does this number i mean? We have seven as our last number in our list. The counters for the index number seven is seven. We take this number and place it in the seventh spot, which is right here. In Python, index number starts from zero. So we place it in the number reduced by one. We'll write counts index. And with this, we've identified the seven. We're going to take away one from this seven. We subtract one to the result. And we write numbers i so that this seven is placed in this spot. Now that we've done that, we're going to take the seven and reduce by one. We can do this by writing counts index minus one. Now we're done with the seven, so we're going to work on the four. To do that, we'll say i minus one to move one increment to the left. After this, we just need to return results to get our results. We want to confirm that we've completed writing the code for this, so we'll say print, and what results do we get? We get two, three, three, four, four, six, seven. Our numbers have been correctly sorted. Going back to this nums, let's do the sort using random numbers. We'll say nums random dot rand int 0 to 1000 and for i in range 10. I'm going to delete this and run the code. We see that the numbers are sorted correctly. Let's do this a couple more times. Each time we get numbers correctly sorted. This is counting sort, and again, counting sort has this disadvantage. You need to prepare a list like this for the counters. So if this 7 is 100 or 1 million, you need enough space to accommodate for that. We're done with counting sort here. So now we'll be moving on to radix sort, which utilizes counting sort. In this lecture, let's discuss radix sort. This sort utilizes counting sort. This sorting algorithm uses counting sort as a subroutine to sort an array of numbers. Let me move on to the next slide to get into the details. This is radix sort. Let's see how this works. For example, let's say you have a list with random numbers. First, you look at the ones digit and sort the numbers. For this number is 4, then 0, 1, 4, 1, 1, 5. We look at these numbers first and sort. When we sort these numbers, we use counting sort and look at the ones digit. When we do this, we have 10 here, 
since the ones digit is zero, then we have 11, then 201, 101, 24, 324, then 55. Counting sort is a stable sort, so the order of these numbers will never change. So that means that 10 will come here and 11 will come here. Then we have 201. The ones digit for 201 and 11 are the same, but because of the initial position of these numbers, 11 will come before 201. After we're done sorting by looking at the ones digit, then we look at the tens digit. When we do this, we first have 201 here since the tens digit is zero. This is a stable sort, so after 201, we have 101. We're sorting the rest by simply looking at the tens digit and applying counting sort. And last step, we sort the numbers by looking only at the hundreds digit. First, we have 10, which has a zero in the hundreds digit. Then after that, we have 11, 24, 55, 101, which has a one for the hundreds digit, and then 201 and 324. Our numbers are now rearranged properly. We use counting sort and divide the numbers by looking at the ones digit, tens digit, and a hundreds digit. This sort may not be as important as other sorts, but let's try writing this sorting algorithm using Python. So to the left, we see the algorithm we use for counting sort. We'll use this as the base to write the algorithm for radix sort. We want to define radix sort, so we'll say numbers and a list containing integers as our input and a list containing integers as our output. We'll write max nums equals max numbers to pick out the number with the greatest value. First, we're going to look at the ones digit, so we'll write place equals one. Later on, we'll increase the numbers to 10 and 100 for the digits, but first is the ones digit. We'll look at this until the max number is greater than the place value. We'll say numbers equal counting sort, then numbers. At this time, we're asking you to do a sort using the ones digit, so this is a new parameter. After this line is executed, then we have placed multiplied by 10. We're asking Python to do the same using the tens digit. Now we're going to return numbers. Right now with this section of counting sort, we can ask Python to sort using the ones digit. So in this parameter up above for counting sort, right here, we'll add place integer. For this counting sort, we won't use max number, so we'll remove that. And for this counts, we'll always use 10. It's a fixed number since we're only looking at the ones, tens, and hundreds digit. Now on the top section here where we're creating the counts, we don't have something like 100 as our index, but only up to 10. So we'll write int number divide by place, and if this is about the ones digit, we only want to look at the ones digit. So we'll divide by 10 and create the index. Whatever digit we're working on, we'll always have 10 indexes. This section where we're adding the numbers here is this section, and the numbers are limited to up to 10, so we'll change this to 10. Now on the bottom section where we want to include numbers in our list, we want to make this ones, tens, and hundreds digit. So we'll change this to int numbers i divided by place. We want to limit this to up to 10, so we'll divide by 10. We're done writing our code, and we'll change this counting sort to radix sort, and then run the code. When we run the code, we see that this has been sorted correctly. We'll repeat it a couple times, and you see that it's been sorted correctly again. This is what radix sort is about. This radix sort section is about using the ones, tens, and hundreds digit for the value, place, and when using counting sort, for example, let's say we want to use the ones digit, we focus only on the ones digit to do counting sort. If we want to use the tens digit to sort, then focus on the tens digit to do the counting sort. This is the end of our lecture on radix sort, and now on to our next sorting algorithm. Now let's look at quicksort. Quicksort is in red along with merge and heap. 
These are in red because companies often test candidates on these algorithms. So it's a good idea to really understand quicksort. Here we have n log n. We partitioned the array and we'll get more into details about this next with a video of how quicksort works. This is a video showing how quicksort works. First, it's important to understand the concept of partition. We have random numbers here, 1, 8, 3, 9, 4, 5, and 7. The numbers on the very right, which is 7, we'll refer to as pivot. We'll use this pivot to rearrange the numbers. On the bottom here, we have variables. We're going to make i equal negative 1 and j equal 0. We're going to use these two variables, i and j. First, we compare the j and the pivot. So in this case, it would be index number 0, which is 1, and 7. When we compare 1 and 7, 7 is bigger, so this statement is true. When our pivot is bigger than j, we swap the i and j. When a switch occurs, we add 1 to i. In this case, this variable changes to 0. This section might be difficult to understand, so let's resume this video. Next, we'll add 1 to j and compare this 8 and 7, which is the pivot. When we do this, 8 is greater than 7, so we don't need to take any action. When we continue on with this pattern, next we have 3 and 7. When we compare these two, 3 is smaller than 7, so we'll do i plus equals 1 and then swap the two numbers. When we continue, we see that the numbers smaller than 7 will be positioned before the 7, and numbers greater than 7 will gradually move towards the back. Next, we'll look at 9. 9 is greater than 7, so no action is necessary. Our next number is 4. We're going to compare 4 with our pivot 7. 4 is smaller than our pivot 7, so we have to bring 4 towards the front. We're going to bring it to the i equals 2 position, and that results in the 4 being positioned towards the front. If you recall, 8 moved towards the back. Next, we have 5. When we compare 5 and 7, 5 is smaller than 7, so we need to bring this 5 towards the front. Now i becomes 3. When we swap the 5 with the i equals 3, 5 moves towards the front and the 9 moves towards the back. When we continue with this process, we need to find the position for the pivot, which is 7. The 7 should be placed where i equals 3, so when we move the 7 there, the 7 becomes the partition that's separating the smaller numbers and larger numbers. Once we've done that, we look at the left side, and just like before with our partition, we'll repeat the process. We'll look at the first half. We have 1, 3, 4, and 5. It's already sorted, so no further action is needed. After this, we'll look at the latter half, which will be 9 and 8. When we repeat the same actions for when we did the partition, we'll see that the 9 and 8 will need to be swapped. This sorting is where we divide the list into smaller groups and, in the end, be able to sort the entire list. This sorting technique may be difficult to understand just by watching this clip of the numbers moving around, so let's get to Python and try writing the algorithm for this. So let's get started. First, we'll define our function for quicksort, then numbers, lists with integers. That's going to be our input. And then our output is going to also be a list with integers. First, we'll write name and then main underscore underscore. The numbers are 1, 8, 3, 9, 4, 5, and 7. We're going to use these numbers for a quick sort. And now when we do call the quick sort, if you look to the right here, we have partition here. This is our entire list. We refer to the left side as low and high for the right side. We're going to use our partition function referring to low and high. So for this example, we're going to define partition and partition numbers and list integers. We want to refer to the left side as low and the right side as high. And then for our output, if you recall, in our video to the right, we had the 7 end up positioned towards the middle. So we want to return the index number. So we'll write integer. And this is how we created another partition function. I'm going to write pass here. And we have quicksort here. 
From here, we're going to refer to the partition above here, and we want to refer to the low and high numbers. We want to call the left side and right side of the list. We haven't designated the low and high, so we're going to comment out for now. We want to create another inner function using quicksort. So here I'm going to define quicksort. We want to make one more inner function. We're going to write numbers and a list containing integers. We want the low to be integers and high to also be integers. At this point, we want to call the partition within this inner function. So we'll write if low is smaller than high. When the left number, the low, is greater than high, we can't call the partition. So while that isn't true, we commented out using sharp right here, but we're going to call the partition. When we do this, we'll get an index number for the result. So we'll say partition index. Let's say that with the partition, we're going to write this in a moment, but we were able to run it and the pivot number is going to be positioned in the middle. I'm going to resume the video and get to that exact point. So now we're here. The seven here is the red. The seven will move towards the middle and the numbers smaller are to the left, larger are to the right. At this time, we're going to refer to the index number of the seven in this partition index. Once we do that, we split the list between the left and right and call the partition once again. Once we get the index of the partition, we recursively call quick sort, then say numbers, low, then partition index. Where this seven is, we're going to refer to the number one before that, which would be the five. To do that, we're going to say minus one. That's the left side and now the right side. We're going to say numbers, then partition index plus one. We have the seven and the one next to it is nine, that and the eight, which is the high. And that's how we're going to recursively call quicksort for the right side. So to review, we have quicksort here, which is going to use these numbers. Then we're going to use our inner function, quicksort, and we're going to pass our numbers. Our low is going to be zero and the high is going to be len numbers minus one. Those are the numbers that we're going to refer to. And now I'm just going to write return numbers. When we call this quicksort here, we have these numbers as nums. These numbers are then used for this quicksort numbers. And when we call this quicksort, low is zero and high is the length of the list. We call this quicksort. Then when we look at low and high, low is zero, high is the length of the list here. Then we have partition index where we identify the partition. For that, we have partition and numbers. The numbers refer to these. Low is zero and high is the length of the list. This is how partition works. First, let's write that part now. Let's rewind a little and resume our video. Let's get the video to the appropriate place. So first we have i is minus one and j is zero. Our pivot is our high. So here we'll write i equals low minus one. That's how we get this i equals negative one. Now moving on to our pivot. Pivot is numbers high. Right now, we have our seven as our pivot. And I'm going to resume our video. Our pivot and one, we're going to look at these. So we'll say for j in range, then low and high. At this time, we'll compare numbers j and our pivot. j refers to the numbers right here. 1, 8, 3, 9, 4, 5. We need to say what number I should rearrange with. That's the purpose of this index. So let's do that section. If numbers j is smaller or equal to pivot, and I'm going to resume the video here. At this time, 1 is smaller. So under actions, we have i plus equals 1. Then swap list i and list j. Let's write the code for this here. Here, one is smaller than seven. For this, we do i equals i plus one, and also write i plus equals one. 
Then we write numbers i and numbers j, and then switch the order and write numbers j, then numbers i. Now that we've gotten this far, let's resume our video. Right now when we look at 1 and 7, 1 is smaller. And this 1 and 1 is the same spot, but we swapped it. And next we have 8. At this time, j increases by 1. Now we compare 8 and 7. 8 is bigger than 7, so no action is needed. If the numbers don't apply to this if statement, then we move on. When the if statement doesn't apply, this i plus equals 1 isn't put into action, so i is still 0 at this point. Let's continue the video. When we continue on with the sort, next we're comparing 3 and 7. At this time, 3 is smaller than 7, so we take the action i plus equals 1. i had been 0, or this value 1, all the time, but now it's i equals 1. So it's this 8. And let's continue. We'll swap and rearrange 8 and j. So that's why we see swap here. We switch the 8 and 3, so you'll see that part in the video right here. And the swapping action applies to this if statement. Next, j becomes the 9 here. I'm going to resume the video. j is the 9, and 9 here is bigger than our pivot, which is the 7. So for this, we see that no action is needed. In this case, the if statement doesn't apply. We'll move on, and next we're going to get to the 4 and 5. I'm going to speed up our video, and next we're going to be working on the 4. The 4 and 8 switch places, and next we have 5, 5 and 9 switch places, then we have the 7. We have i equals 3. This 7 is placed in this i equals 3 position. After 7 moves, then we have the numbers before it. We divide by the former section and the latter section and compare it against the 7. I'm going to rewind our video a little. This section where 7 is positioned in this place is what we're going to write from now. So we'll write numbers i plus 1, then numbers hi, which is where the pivot was, then numbers hi, then numbers i plus 1 to switch the two around, then return, then index number for pivot. So right here where i plus 1 is, that's where this 7 is. We're going to return this to its previously called upon function, which is this partition index. Then we're going to recursively call this quick sort for the left side with partition index minus 1. That's this 5 here. And the script here is for the right side. We have partition index plus 1, so that's the 9. We'll call this and continue on with the sort. Our code looks fine, so let's run it. When we do that, our initial list has now been rearranged properly. And now let's use random numbers to test it out. Let's say import random and for nums random.randint then 0 to 1000 and for underscore in range 10. And we see that we have numbers sorted properly. One more time, a sorted list appears again. We've confirmed that our code works properly and this is how quicksort works. During an interview, you may be asked questions that test whether you understand recursively calling a function. To do that, you might be asked to write a code for quicksort. This section with partition I showed you how partition works in this video, but you might be asked to write a code for this too. This part may be confusing to understand and write, but you may be asked to write it during a coding interview. Understanding the algorithm for quicksort may be important, especially for those getting ready for an interview. This brings us to the end of this sort, and let's move on to our next sorting algorithm. The next sorting we'll be working on is merge sort where time complexity in all three cases is n log n. This is our merge sort slide. I think using this slide is easier rather than a video tutorial to show you how it works. Here is our original list, 
we have 5, 4, 1, 8, 7, 3, 2, and 9. We split the list between the first half on the left and the second half on the right. So we have 5, 4, 1, and 8 on the left, 7, 3, 2, and 9 on the right. Focusing on this first half of our list, we can see that we split the list into two once again. The first half is 5 and 4, and the second half is 1 and 8. Splitting that list in half again, we are left with individual elements 5 and 4, 1 and 8. We repeat the same process for the second half of the original list. So we have 7, 3, 2, and 9 here. Next, we're going to reorder the elements. Comparing 5 and 4, we bring the smaller of the two to the left. So we are reordering to 4, then 5. Following this rule, 1 and 8 are kept the same. Now on to 7 and 3, we arrange to 3 and 7, and 2 and 9 stay the same. As you can see, Merge Store is known for simultaneously merging and reordering the elements of a list. Now comparing these two lists, 4 and 5 and 1 and 8, we merge and rearrange these two lists into ascending order. This will result in 1, 4, 5, and then 8. Applying the same principle to the right side, 3 and 7 and 2 and 9 will be merged and arranged into 2, 3, 7, then 9. Now, rearranging and merging these two lists together, we result in one big list ordered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, and 9. The big idea here for merge sorting is merging and rearranging at the same time. For example, comparing 4 and 5 and 1 and 8, we always compare the first elements of each list between 4 and 1. We know that 1 is smaller so we place the 1 in the very front. Now increase the index number by 1 from the element we placed. The new element we will compare is 8. We compare 8 with 4, the element that wasn't placed last time. 4 is smaller, so we place 4 in the next slot. Now increase index number by 1, selecting this 5. Comparing 5 and 8, 5 is smaller, so it goes here. We used all available indexes here, so this remaining 8 will be placed here. Hopefully you have obtained a big picture of how merge sort works. Next, we'll be applying this merge sort into Python programming. First step, import our list from typing. Then we define merge sort. Our input numbers is the list containing integers, ints, passed in to return our output a list with ints as well. What we want to be doing is split this first list into smaller and smaller pieces. We want to call this merge sort with recursion, ultimately resulting in single element lists. Once we have these single element lists, we want to return these lists. If the length of the numbers list is already one or less, we can just return numbers right away like so. This is for when numbers is already a single element list. Our return value would just be that one element, like 5, 4, 1, or 8. When our list is longer than one element, like here, we'll have to break it down. In order to do this, first we'll write center will equal the length of numbers divided by 2 for int division. Left will equal numbers up to center. Easy work using this slice function. We're done writing the code for the left and now to the right. Right will equal numbers, now starting from center up to the end. Our list is now split in half. Now we call merge sort on both left and right with recursion. So here we'll change this left to right. This way, the list will keep splitting in half until only one element remains, which is when the list is returned. Now we're going to look at this 5 and 4, which is rearranged to 4 and 5. We'll be implementing this reordering portion from now. Instead of focusing on the 5 and 4 being reordered to 4 and 5, we'll look at these lists 4, 5, 
and 1, 8. And how we create the list 1, 4, 5, 8. It will be easier to visualize the whole process. 4, 5 will be our left and 1, 8 will be our right list for now for this example. We're going to write the code for this from now. First, initialize the variables representing our index numbers i, j, and k to 0. Use a while loop condition of i less than len left and j less than len right. So what does this mean? Here, our variable i will represent the index number of left 4 and 5. J will represent the index number of right 1 and 8. Here we have placed the 1 at the front of our numbers list here, followed by the 4. K will be representing the index number of numbers. This condition ensures the while loop to run through all elements of left and right. We use an if statement comparing the first element of left, left i, and right, right j. If the element of left is less than the element of right, we can just place that left i into numbers k, like this. i plus equals 1 allows us to look at the next element in left. We'll write else, or when the element of right is smaller, that right j is placed in numbers k instead. j plus equals 1, moving on to the next element in right. Once we've done that, adding 1 to k allows us to move on to the next element in numbers that we need to work on. To explain further, let's say our list numbers here in merge sort was 5, 4, 1, 8. So our numbers here are going to be 5, 4, 1, and 8. Variable k represents the index number of numbers, which would correspond to 0, 1, 2, 3, like so. We have left and right here. Splitting the list, left and right will correspond to 5 and 4 and 1 and 8. We call merge sort once again on both lists here. This 5 and 4 is reordered to 4 and 5. So left will be 4 and 5, and right stays as 1 and 8. When we have a situation like this, i represents the index numbers for left, corresponding to 0 and 1, and variable j doing the same but with right like so. Breaking down the logic here, this if statement here is comparing left i with right j. So this 4 with the 1 here. 1 is smaller, so this first value of numbers, when k equals 0, is replaced with 1, like so. Next, we're adding 1 to k, which is this k plus equals 1 increasing the index number. This allows us to move on to the next element in numbers that we want to determine. In this case, 1, the element in right was larger, which would run our else statement here. This j plus equals 1 allows us to move on to the next element in right, 8, for the next comparison. In the next loop, we continue to look at 4 for the next comparison, since the value of i hasn't changed yet. Next, we're comparing 4 with 8. 4 is smaller, running our if statement here. So this 4 will come over to here. The second element in numbers will be 4, which is the same as our original value. Next, we add 1 to i, moving on to the next element after this 4, which is 5. Comparing 5 with 8, 5 is smaller, placing 5 in our number list here. Adding 1 to k, we move on to the next loop. However, i has exceeded the length of our left list, causing our condition to change to false. We can no longer run our while loop. As of now, 1, 4, 5 have been correctly placed into our list, but this last statement 8 has not been altered by this while loop. We'll add another while loop to account for the elements that weren't altered. This is the portion we're going to write from now. Since this may be confusing, I'll be writing the code first then breaking it down. Our while loop condition is the value of i not exceeding the length of left, meaning some elements left over in the left list. We place those leftover elements in numbers k, like so. We add 1 to i, add 1 to k as well. Regarding our example that we used of 4, 5, 1, and 8, the code we just wrote will not run since we used all elements in the first while loop. Instead, the last element in our write list, 8, was not used. 
this j didn't reach the 8. To fix that, we use another while loop. Condition j has not exceeded n right. If condition is true, then numbers k will be replaced with a value of right j. j plus equals 1 and write in the rest too. Now we return numbers and our method is complete. Now let's try testing out our method. Put our name as underscore underscore main underscore underscore. Nums will be set to our example here. 5, 4, 1, 8, 7, 3, 2, 9. We call merge sort on nums, then print. When the code is run, we get our expected list. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9. Our code seems fine and working, but it may be hard to understand at first. Adding a debugger and walking through the lines with step into may help. We can see our numbers here is 5, 4, 1, 8, 7, 3, 2, 9. Splitting that in half, the left here is 5418 and right is 7329. Continue moving through each line with step into. Here our numbers become 5418. Keep going with step into. Numbers split again for left to be 54 and right 18. Merge sort is called again, so you walk through again with step into. Numbers become 54. Keep going and our left becomes 5 and right becomes 4. Call merge sort again. Now len numbers becomes 1. So 5 will be returned directly. Same with 4. You can see with step into that it's returned directly as well. As of now, we have the 5 and 4 here as individual lists. And moving on to the next while loops, we'll be reordering 4 to the front and 5 to the back. We'll be doing this section in this while loop. Moving through the lines, we compare left i and right j. In this case, 4 is smaller, so 4 will be placed into numbers k when k equals 0. This while loop is only run once in this case, resulting in our list to be 4, 4, like so. Altering the original 5, 4, we have replaced the first element of list with 4, resulting in 4, 4. Our code has not used this 5 here from left yet, so our next while loop here will take care of that. And that's this section here. Proceeding with step into, our k currently equals 1, so 5 will go into numbers k when k equals 1 to create 4, 5. After 1 is added to both i and k, we have already went through all elements of left, so this while loop is over. Moving on to our right, we already used the fork to place here, so we skip over this while loop. We can go on to return numbers. Moving further, we can see here that left is reordered into 4 and 5. We'll do the same thing to the right list, 1, 8, using step into once again. Skimming through the lines, we compare 1 and 8 in these while loops. Even if you look at the while statement, it's obvious that 1 is smaller than 8, so going all the way to return numbers, right will result in 1, 8, and our left is 4, 5, as we previously saw. We see that numbers here are currently 5, 4, 1, 8. We'll be merging the two lists 4, 5, and 1, 8 into 1, 4, 5, 8. We'll be walking through that process with step into again. Left is 4, 5 right now. So we compare this 4 with this 1 right here. After that, in our if statement here, write j1 is smaller in this case, which will run our else statement here. Now with this 1, we replace it with this 5 at the front of numbers. Proceeding with step into, we can see here that 1 is now at the front. Add 1 to j, move to the next element of numbers by adding 2k. We want to look at this section, so we are back to this first while loop. We move to the next element of right, which is 8. So we compare 4 with 8. 4 is smaller, so that means left i is smaller. This if statement runs. 
4 is placed into numbers k. So you see here that 4 has been placed. Moving on, we're now comparing 5 and 8. 5 from left is smaller, so we click on step into. 5 from left is smaller, so we place 5 into numbers k. We now looked at all elements in left, so step into will skip over this while loop. The only element we haven't looked at is this 8 in the right, so running this last while loop will take care of it. Once we've done that, we can see that left has become 1, 4, 5, 8, just like this list here. Repeating the same process will eventually get to the properly ordered list here. If you get confused with your code, I recommend using debuggers and walking through each step with step into. So here is the debugger, and using debuggers are useful if you want to practice your skills. Scrolling over to the bottom, we import random, like usual. Nums will also equal random.randit from 0 to 1000 for underscore in range 10. Running merge sort, we still get this neatly sorted list. As you can see here with these numbers 6, 11, 115, 224, etc. Running a few more times to make sure our numbers are still sorted neatly. We can confirm that our merge sort works properly. Our merge sort method is complete, as you see here. So let's move on to the next sorting type. Next up is this heap sort. We will be elaborating more on heap sort with something called tree code later. And to the bottom we have tim, tim sort. We'll do a brief overview of the code for today, since it is a bit complicated as well. Here is the Wikipedia page for tim sort. You can see it was invented by Tim Peters in 2002, and this sorting method is also built into Python's default library. You may have already used tim sort in Python if you've ever used list.sort in your programs. If you look above here, tim sort is an efficient sorting algorithm created through combining aspects of merge sort and insertion sort. You can sort quickly because we use both aspects of merge sort and insertion sort. There's quite a lot of information here, and all of this here is quite complex. So for this lecture, I'm going to show you the code and provide you with a brief explanation. For people who are interested in learning more about Tim Sort, I recommend checking out this Wikipedia page in your own time. Now let's move on to looking at the actual code. We'll be looking at this code here that I've already written out. There is a code for Tim Sort that I've already provided and distributed, so if you are interested, please check that out. I mentioned this just a little while ago, but if you launch this interactive shell in Python 3, for instance, and make a list with random integers like this, let's try putting x.sort. Once sorted, you can see x has been properly rearranged to 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 4, 6, 7. So how was this implemented? You'll see here, this sorting was implemented by this tim sort method here. You can see this method includes insertion sort and merge sort. Focusing on insertion sort, you can see here the size is 32. This for loop here is repeated from 0 to the length of the list, increasing by size each time. So i is increasing from 0 to 32, 64, 128, and so on. For each iteration, we run this insertion sort here. Looking closer at this insertion sort here, here is the pass in data with the left and the right. This allows us to adjust what segment of the list you want to rearrange with insertion sort. You can make some changes to the content of the insertion sort with this. And this part should be familiar since it was already reviewed in our lecture about insertion sort. Here, we're basically running insertion sort for each subarray. Next, let's look at this section, this while loop here. We're running merge sort to combine each of the subarrays that were created by insertion sort, one by one. And here we see size keeps increasing. Merge sort, we can say, is responsible for combining each individual subarray 
into one. Again, this merge sort here is nearly identical to the code in my merge sort tutorial earlier. As you can see here, this is the basic structure of Tim sort. Tim sort wasn't covered in too much detail, but I don't think it's necessary to know how to code this exact algorithm. Having a basic understanding of how the sorting method works is probably enough. So now that we've gone through quite a few sorting methods, we'll have a quick quiz on sorting methods and move on to the next lecture. Until now, we've been learning how to sort numbers using different algorithms. From now, we'll be transitioning into finding an element from this list that has already been sorted. Here is our sorted list with numbers 0, 1, 5, 7, 9, 11, 15, 20, 24. We want to find the number 15 out of this list. We can look at each element from the very beginning and find this 15 here. We can search from the beginning of the list. This is called a linear search. However, a disadvantage of this searching method is that you have to search from the beginning of the list. The further down the number searched is, the longer it takes to find it. To prevent this, we'll be learning a well-known searching method called binary search. This will allow us to find numbers quicker. So let's look at how binary search works. Looking at this middle list, L stands for the very left, and R stands for the very right, and then M in the middle. If you add the index number of L and R and divide by 2, you'll get this middle index number, M. We'll be looking at this middle element first. If the middle element 9 is smaller than our expected number 15, we know that the expected number is located to the right of this middle element. Now we will start looking at the middle element of this right half. We already looked at this 9, so we bring L to the next element after 9. Our R stays the same. Adding the index number of L and R, then dividing by 2. By the rules of int division, our M moves here. The number contained in this index number is 15, which is our expected number, so it's a match. When numbers hop towards the center of each observed segment of the list, it makes the search much faster. And this is what binary search is about. Now that we understand how binary search works, let's get to writing the code. Now getting started, we import the list. Before we begin binary search, let's go over the code for linear search as well. Our input is an int list called numbers, as well as the number we want to search for. So we'll be writing value int right here. And then for the output, our output is the index number, the expected number is located. Here, our expected number was 15, so starting from 0 at the front, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 will be its index number. So the output will be index, which is int. Here, we use i for index using a for loop from 0 to len numbers. Then after that, if numbers i, so the index of numbers matches up with value, we return the index number at that value. If the value isn't found, return negative 1. If name underscore underscore main underscore underscore, then we create a list just like the one to the right with numbers 0, 1, 5, 7, 9, 11, 15, and 20, and 24. We created our list, so we call linear search on nums with our expected number 15. Running this code here, we see that 15 was located in index number 6. If we make our expected number a value not in our list, let's say 2, running the code we get negative 1. So 15 obviously wasn't found anywhere in the list. So that is our run through of linear search. If our returning int is easily mistaken for the actual values in the list, in that case you can go to from typing and import new type. You'll write index num to make a new type. We can name our returning int to be index num followed by our returning int. Switch this returning output to index num to correspond with the change. 
By doing this, we can remind ourselves that the return value is not the actual number in the list, but its index number. By looking at the string, the explanation for the value here is index num, which is pretty self-explanatory. Feel free to try a version of this on your own. Here, let's say you're searching for the number 15. Inside this for loop, you can put in print i. Run this and we get a 6. Our for loop has run 6 times from the front of the list, which means our if statement here ran 6 times. We want to reduce the number of times the if statement runs, which is why we are using binary search. Moving on to binary search, we start off with binary search. Input the same as last time being numbers, list, int, with our expected number, value int. Our return output is our expected number, so index num. We want to initialize the L and R in our list here, so left followed by right. And our left index will obviously be 0. Our right will be len numbers minus 1. Initialization is complete now. Now make a while loop condition left is less than or equal to right. This accounts for times when the expected number is not in the list. L will end up surpassing R. So for this, we'll write mid or our center will be solved by left plus right double slash for integer division by 2. This is how we solve for mid. So looking to the right, we have L and R, and in the middle we have M, which is this section here. Next, if numbers mid, which is our 9 right now, matches up with value, we have found our expected number. So we return our index number for that. If it didn't match up, we use an elif in the condition that the value of number mid, 9 in our case, being smaller than value. In that case, we equal left to the value of mid plus 1. In our case, expected number is 15. Our current number mid is 9. As shown in the visual here, we have m and we add 1 and that's the position for l. Now we repeat a similar process using while loops. Below this, write a while loop to repeat from the top repeating until our if statement here becomes true. Our code was fine for numbers like 15, but we haven't encountered for numbers like 1 and 5 and numbers smaller than the middle number. We need to include that too, so in that case, we'll write else right equals mid minus 1. Looking at our visual to the right, left side is L and right side is R. Our middle here is M, and it'd be 9, and say our expected number is 5 instead of 15. We compare the 5 and 9. 5 is smaller than 9, so we move r over here. Just like that, we start looking at the left half. So how long do we repeat this process? We do as long as this while loop is true, left being less than or equal to right. For example, let's say our expected number was 2. We have l, r, and m here. And when we compared 9 and 2, 2 is smaller, so r moves here, and m moves over here. Comparing this 1 from m and 2, 2 is larger now, so l moves over here. So now l and r are side by side, having an index number of 0, 1, 2, so it is 2 and 3. 2 plus 3 is 5, and 5 divided by 2 is 2. We have 0, 1, 2, and m will be here at index number 2. Now, comparing the m, which is 5, and 2, 2 is smaller, so now r moves here. At this time, l and r have switched places. That's this section of while left is smaller or equal to right. When l and r have switched positions, l has surpassed r, so our while loop here turns false. So we exit this while loop concluding that we cannot find the expected number. So we need to return minus 1 under here, so let's write the code for that. There we go. 
Now we'll try running binary search instead of linear search below here. Run the code. The console returns that the expected number is at 6. Let's add a print with some sharps to check how many times this whole loop ran. Here we see it only ran twice to find 6. Therefore, binary search did a much faster job than linear, who needed 6 repeats. Here, let's change 15 to 2, just to double check, and minus 1 is correctly returned. Just like that, we can probably code a binary search. Now to our final section of this lecture. We just wrote our binary search using a while loop, but there are some cases when you may be asked to code this using recursion. Let's now go over how to do that. I'll copy and paste this death line and comment out this section for now. The code is quite similar to the one above, but first write an inner function called binary search. Like before, an int list numbers followed by value int. This is followed by the index number of left and the index number of right which will be passed into through recursion. Our returning output is index num. When the list is divided in half like this, L and R move here. This L and R, we want to have them passed in through recursion, which is why these left and right parameters were added. Adding some more codes below, since binary search is an inner function that we want to call, we call binary search on numbers and add the value parameters. Left is 0, right will be len numbers minus 1. Now we can call binary search as an inner function. Below that, in the condition that the value of left surpasses right, we can just return minus 1. The code after that is nearly identical to the one above, so we do left plus right divided by 2. Once we find mid, we compare numbers mid with value. If they match, we return mid. If, if they don't, we compare numbers mid with value again. And if value is larger, we return our inner function, binary search. When calling binary search, mid plus 1 will be passed into left, and our right stays the same. This is how we recursively call binary search. For our else statement, we return binary search with the same first parameters, so numbers and parameters, but now left stays the same while mid minus 1 will be passed into right. Now that our code recursively calls binary search correctly, we finish up by returning this here. So now we'll call binary search on nums 15, being our expected. We run the code and get index number 6, which is correct. Now we're going to change the value to 2, and we get a correct return value of negative 1. This algorithm using recursion might be harder to understand, so it might be a good idea to review this on your own. This binary search that we coded today is a quite well-known searching method, so I hope you found this to be very useful. Now we're going to move on to linked lists. These are data structures that frequently come up in job interviews, so understanding how they work will be useful. And I think explaining written code may be more helpful than explaining visuals, so let's jump right in. Starting from what is called a head here, these data fields called nodes are linked to each other. The nodes contain data, such as numerical data, like the number 5, 10, or strings, like words and letters. This next pointer is in charge of linking this node to the other nodes. This repetition of linking is what allows packaging methods for lists to work. For example, in Python, this would be a list. This enables you to easily add data after this, eliminate nodes, and add elements to the beginning of your list. Linked lists make it easy to trace through the links and then perform the action. So you may not be a software engineer developing these data structures, 
but it may be useful as a developer to have a foundation of how basic data structures work. And having a basic understanding of linked lists can be helpful for any IT position. So now let's get started implementing this on Python. So now to writing the code. I'll have the visual we just went over on the right to reference to as we go over the code. Starting off this section here with data and next is called a node. We'll start applying nodes in this class here. We'll write class node. And for Python 3 users, you just need a colon to start writing your code below. But for Python 2 or for just following PEP 8, many recommend adding this object here. Again, Python 3 users don't need to take this extra step of including object. And here is def init. First, we want to pass in some data to our node. So we put in the data to self data, which is this line. And then for self next, just put none. This data can be anything from strings to numbers. So on the top, we put from typing import any, telling the Python the data can be anything really. So the data type here will be any. Now the header for our class is complete. So on the right, with this data and next here, we created a class. We just put none in next, but we can also put next equals none in the parameters here. However, we need to change the name to avoid having the same name as the built-in next. Change to next node, and then change this to next node as well. For the type for next node, we want to link it to the node itself. So we want to write node here, but see this error squiggle come up. Any version after Python 3.7, you can import something from future called annotations, and the error will disappear. So when you want your type to be the class itself that we are creating, you need to import this for older Python versions. This is probably not needed anymore in future Python versions, like 4.0. If you don't think it's necessary to declare a type, you can just erase that portion of code, like this, and simply write next node. That's fine too, but for this lecture, I'm going to declare the type. So I'm going to say node equals none, and let's get started with the code. So next, we'll write class followed by linked list and start making this class. You can think of linked list as something that manages or is an organizer for this whole thing. So we'll write def init self. In this case, we have no return value, so the type is none. We'll write self head and store none inside, which is this head at the front. Head starts without a value, which is why we put none. We can also put head equals none here and put head here. Now we're adding data, so we add a function append here. So what does that mean? On the right here, we have head and we have data next to it. But right now, our code only has this head in the front with no data linked to it. So what type of data do we put into it? We can add any type of data here, like numbers, strings, and letters, so we'll put any, and still remain with no return value for now. Then we create a new node. So we put data into the node from the node class that we created earlier. Now we have a new node object with data next. Moving on, we have an if statement with if self head is none or has no value stored inside. In that case, we put new node inside self head, then return it. Now this head, self head, is pointing to this first node with data and next. So on to our next step. If self.head is not none, but is pointing to one node, we have to link this node to the next node. We'll be writing the code for that next, but first we'll put last node and self head. So we'll put self head into this last node, 
Right now, our head is linked to this first node here. But let's say we have two or three of these. We'll need to use a while loop to link the next new nodes. And then at the very end, we add this after all other nodes are linked. So we store self head into a variable called last node. Below, we make a while loop that runs until last node dot next or the next node becomes none. So if our linked list had three nodes, we just need to find this last node here. So then the value of this last node is replaced to last node dot next. If we ran this code on this linked list, the loop will run until we find this third node here. And then you'll be able to exit the while loop here. Then all you have to do is say last node next, which the value is currently none, and we need to store new node here. Now you can use this append function to append data to this linked list. Now that we've appended our data, we're creating a new function called insert that allows us to insert data to the front of the list. Just like last time, the data type is any with no return value. Inserting data to the front is quite simple as you write new node and store a node with some data stored inside. And since we want to insert this node to the front and created a new node, we just need to have the next for the new node to become self.head. So we'll write new node next, then link to the self head that we already have. Now we replace the value of self head with the new node at the front of our list. So looking to our visual to the right, we just enabled our link to append and insert data to the front. To see if our code actually works, let's test it out and put name followed by underscore underscore main underscore underscore and we'll start calling these functions here. For this, I'm just going to simply write L this time storing the linked list shown above. We'll call L append and we'll just be adding the number one just to make it easy to understand. Once we do that, we can write print L head and data and try printing the data inside the head of L. We'll run the code and the result we get here is one. This time we'll do L append two. And right now one is stored in this first node, self head, and the two is stored in this next node. We just printed L head data, but now we can print L head next data, which will be our second node. We'll run this code, and now what do we get? We have two numbers, one and two. To match up with our visual, we can do another L append with three, our next print statement, printing L head next next data. And then now we get the three numbers, one, two, and three. So we are able to confirm that our data is linked properly. Next, we want to use this insert function that we also made. After all these L appends, let's try inserting zero. So L insert zero. After that, our L head data here will be storing the data at zero. So zero should show up on our console first. So here we have one, two, three, and we just insert it in front of our list. Zero, one, two, three is what we should have now. This line will print zero, and this line should print one. The next will be two. We want to print the last one too, so add another line and squeeze in another next here. We'll run the code and we see zero, one, two, three. We successfully confirmed that both our append and insert function work properly. As you see here, I had to write next, next, next data just to print 0, 1, 2, 3. And that's quite tedious. From now, we'll be adding a function that'll make this section printing easier. Here, we'll write print self with no return value since we're just printing values. We create a variable called current node, which stores self head, which will be our front node. After that, we'll make a while loop that runs until current node becomes none. Right now we have self head at the front. 
we have self head here and we'll use the while loop to examine each node. We'll do that until we hit this none. We keep printing until we hit that point. So we'll write a print statement, printing the data in the current node like this. Then we have to replace the value of current node with the next node. So add a next here. Right now, current node is self head. So to move to the next node, we just replace this current node variable with current node next. Eventually, current node next will become none, which is when we exit our while loop. This way we can correctly print all data in all available nodes. We'll try our last activity again. We have L append one, two, three, and below I have four print statements here, but we're going to delete these. We'll write L print and then run it. Below we get one, two, three, which means our print function was called and executed properly. And one more thing, we'll add this insert statement here and run one more time. Down below we get zero, one, two, three, so it does work. Now that we are able to add and print data, we are creating a function to remove or delete nodes from our linked list. When removing nodes, we'll be deleting the node of the first instance of the expected data that we find, which is why we have data in our parameters. Let me show you an example. I'll open this terminal, Python 3, and open interactive shell. If you have a list L containing 1, 2, 3, 4, and let's include L, and then do L remove 2, and then run. Here this is L, we get 1, 3, 4. Now 2 is removed from L. Overriding L, let's say we have 1, 2, 2, 3, 4. We have two 2's here. We can try doing L removed 2 and then put L. As you can see, it only removes the first two found in the list. So from now, we'll be writing our remove function to match how this works. We put data type any as a parameter with none as the return value. First, we want to remove, so let's store self head inside current node. So we'll write current node self head. If the frontmost node is the one that we want to remove, we'll remove the node right there. If the data we want to remove is not in the list at all, we can't remove it. So to check whether the data exists right now, self head is stored in current node. We start an if statement, and if current node exists, then it already has the potential to be removed. So if current node exists and the expected data matches the data in current node, we will be removing the front node. So now self head will have current node stored. Current node will store none. Then we return. When we are removing this front node here, this second node that this next pointer is pointing will become the head, which is why we stored current node next into self head. As of current node, this node will be removed, so we no longer use this variable, which is why we put none. You don't necessarily have to put current node equals none, you can just leave it to Python's garbage collector and wait until there's enough memory to run it. That's one way to do it, but it's better to declare it as none yourself. You can also add an import statement here. It's better to import things at the top, so we'll write import gc, and here call gc collect for garbage collection, and that's another alternative we can do. This way we don't need this current node equals none. For today, we opt out of the garbage collection and stick with current node equals none. Next, we're accounting for the case that the data we wanted to remove is not stored in the front node. In that case, we have to go down the linked list, examining each node. So we'll be using a while loop as usual. We put previous node none, which saves the node before each node we look at. We're going to make a while loop with a condition of current node existing and current node data does not match the data we want to remove. When this is true, we save current node into previous node. 
What this means is that, for example, we have three nodes here. And let's say we want to remove the middle node. We have our previous node, and the next of the previous node, or node before that, will have to now link to this data here, which is why we need to save its data here. Now put current node equals current node next, which will be repeated through the while loop. If this while loop happens to run until the very last node, it will mean that the data we wanted to remove didn't exist. Then we casually exit the while loop and account for it with the statement if current node is none. In this case, it means that there were no nodes that we wanted to return, so we can just write return. If this is not the case and this while loop, we eventually do see that we have a match, we exit this while loop because our condition is now false. At that time, current node will store current node next, so none will not be its value. Some data will be stored that matches the data we want to remove. So then we want to remove this node with the expected data. In that case, we put the next node of the previous node that we had saved to store current node next. That's what we're doing here. So if current node was this middle node here, previous node next will be linked here. This is the current node and it's next to the current node. So that's what we stored here. Once we've done that, this current node we no longer needed. So we delete it with current node equals next. We'll now try out the remove function we just created. So for example, underneath this print statement, we put l remove two. Under that, we print our list with l print. And to make it easier to understand, we can squeeze in a print statement with sharps before that and run the code. Below, we can see that after the printed data of 0, 1, 2, 3, we now have 0, 1, 3. So the 2 was properly removed. We were able to confirm that our remove function works properly. We were able to successfully create several functions for linked lists, such as append, insert, and print, and remove. I hope you found this to be useful. It may have seemed a little rushed, and you may feel like you didn't understand everything. It may help to review the code again while looking at the visual and review what we went over today. Our next lecture will be doing the same thing, now using recursion. We'll begin by launching the terminal and write Python 3 and check this out using the interactive shell. Let's say the list has numbers 1, 2, 3, 4. L dot reverse will reverse the order of the elements. If we take a look at L again, we can see the order was reversed into 4, 3, 2, 1. We'll be creating this reverse function for our linked list from now. Here is the remove method that we created last time, and we'll create our function right before that. So skip some lines in between, and we'll begin from here. Starting off our reverse function, we can do this in two ways, using while loop iterations or using recursion. I'll change the method name by adding underscore iterative. So I'm going to change the method name here and our return value is going to be none. So no return value. What we're doing here is that this head at the front is this first node here and has nodes linked to its right with the next pointers. This node here will have to point the opposite direction to this node. And this next pointer here will point to this node here. We have to end with this none here. So this next pointer will now point to none. This head will have to point to the new front node, which will be this one here. We're trying to create this relationship with our code. I'll erase the annotation for now. So how do we approach this? We can use a while loop to examine each node down the linked list. Let's say this node is our previous, and this is the node we are looking at. This node will then be our current node, and this will be our previous. The next pointer of our current node is pointing to this node to the right, but we want it to point to our previous node instead. Again, this may be hard to understand with only a visual, 
So let's jump into writing the actual code. First, we'll put previous node, which will have nothing stored at first, so we'll write none. Next, our current node is the node we're currently looking at, which is our self head at first. We'll be running a while loop with current node in our condition. And the first thing we do inside it is storing current node next in next node. You can think of it as saving the value of the next node in next node for now. We'll be putting the next node in this current node next. So this front node here is our head. And when we go down looking at each node, let's say we're looking at this middle node. We'll be storing this node to the right into next node. Then what we do is we make the next pointer of our current node point to previous node. For instance, if this one is our current node, the next pointer will have to point to this node before that. At first, previous node equals none. So if this were the head, none would be linked to its next pointer. But think of this as our middle node. That's why you made our next pointer point to the node before that. Now that our links are switched, we need code for our next iteration, which we shift over to examine our next loop. We skip a line, and to begin, we have previous node, storing current node. We shift it over to look at the node to the right, so our new previous node will be our old current node. After that, current node will be the next node that we had saved in the beginning. If this is our current node, our next node will be this one to the right, so now with our new value of current node, we run another while loop iteration. If you do it like this, now our arrows or links will be pointing to the nodes before themselves. Once you get to the very last node, we have to change our self head to point to this node. Once we are done with the while loop, we store the previous node from our last iteration in self head. Here we can see current node is stored in previous node. So this previous node is this last node here. So we store this previous node into self head as a final step. So that's all the code we need. We are now going to try out our code. So here's the list with one, two, three, with the zero inserted as well. That might have been confusing. So I'll change it to all append statements with zero, one, two, three, followed by a print. Once we print it out, we print out a row of sharps and then call L reverse iterative. Once that runs, we print the list again. Now let's try it out. We'll run the code and we see that it prints zero, one, two, three at first. After we reverse, we have three, two, one, zero, which means that our list was reversed properly. So we've confirmed that our code works. And now we want to do the same thing, but code using recursion. Problems like these frequently appear in interviews. Once we successfully made our reverse work with while loops, there are many cases where you are asked to now do it using recursion. So it may be useful to grasp how to code this with recursion as well. So here's our reverse underscore recursive function with none as our return value. Since we're using recursion, we need an inner function with an underscore in front and then using this same name as above. So we'll write reverse recursive. Our parameters will be current node, parameter type being a node. We also need previous node, which would be the node before that. Our function will have these two parameters passed in. Now we have these four lines above. This portion of our code can be identical, so we will just copy paste like this. Then we have this inner function, reverse recursive. When we call this function, it'll do the exact same thing as an iteration of this while loop. So now in the very bottom, we put reverse recursive with self head, since that's the first node that we're looking at. And we don't have any previous nodes, so we'll write none here. And just like that, we'll be able to call this function here. But just running this function once, we only call this function on self head. And this function here will not be called again. All we did was have this first node here, 
we have the next of this node point to none. We need to keep recursively calling this function, so we add a return here with reverse recursive, passing in the current node with its previous node. Now we pass in just self head at first, but here our function recursively runs again, as you see here, changing the values of current node and previous node through these lines of codes here. This allows us to keep calling this function as we go down the linked list, as we move towards the right. So how long do we repeat this for? When we use the while loop here, we ran the loop only while current node was not none. Since we're using recursion instead, at the start of our recursive function, we add if not current node. Since current node will eventually become none, when current node becomes none, that means we've reached the end, so we just want to return previous node. This way, we first call reverse recursive, and this next pointer in the first node will point to none. We shift over to the next node and recursively call the function on this node. As we keep calling the function down the list, we'll eventually reach none. When current node becomes none, we return as previous node to the last recursive call before that. Then, this value of previous node is returned to our last recursive call here, and our final value of previous node will be returned again through this line. This means that this final value of previous node will be passed up by the linked list, which will make our previous node become head. So here we put self head equals in front so that the last node we operated on will have to become self head. That's why the value of self head will be replaced here. Now let's try the reverse function that we coded using recursion. Let's see and try to understand how it all works. We'll just copy and paste the last three lines like so, but now instead of calling reverse iterative, we call reverse recursive. This time we're checking to see if we can get the list to return to 0, 1, 2, 3. After printing 0, 1, 2, 3, then we reverse the list using the iterative method. So let's write reverse iter here. Now we reverse the list again with a recursive method, which we can write reverse rec here. Let's run the code. Once we run it, you can see the first part printing 0, 1, 2, 3 as usual. The iterative method reversed that to 3, 2, 1, 0. And after that, our recursive method reversed it back to the original being 0, 1, 2, 3. So the list was reversed properly. So we were able to successfully reverse a list using two methods, using while loops, and recursion in our code. This concept pops up pretty regularly on many occasions, so understanding this may help you in the future. Now going back to the return value for this inner function, since we're returning a node, you might want to make that clear by putting down node. Now that we're finished for this video, our next lecture will feature an interview style quiz using the things we learned here today. Last time we learned how to code this reverse function, but this time we'll be applying this function as if we're being asked to solve a coding question. So below this, we will be adding on our new method. You may be wondering what kind of interview-like question will we have to solve? We have def reverse even, and you may be asked to implement this method. And what kind of method is it? Let's say we have a linked list containing the numbers 1, 4, 6, 8, 9. Let's say that we have a linked list with these numbers. We want to only reverse this streak of even numbers right here. So the result would be 1, 8, 6, 4, and 9. The odd numbers like this one are all kept the same. As soon as we find a streak of more than one even number, we reverse its order. So we have 8, 6, 4. Copying this row, let's say this row was altered to 1, 4, 6, 8, 9, then another 1, 4, 6, 8, 9 after that. The first half will stay as 1, 8, 6, 4, 9, and the second half will look identical, and it will also be 1, 8, 6, 4, 9. This first streak of even numbers are reversed, and then we hit an odd number here. Then we hit another streak of even numbers, which we would reverse once again. 
Now let's say we have a list of numbers without a streak of even numbers, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1 is odd, so we skip it. 2 is next, but we hit 3, so we don't need to reverse these numbers. So a list like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, with alternating even and odd numbers, it would just be kept as is. Now let's say we have a list of only odd numbers, like 1, 3, 5. Again, the order would be kept the same as 1, 3, 5. So this interview question will be asking you to only reverse streaks of more than one even number of the list. If you would like to challenge yourself to answer this question, you can pause this video right now and try figuring it out on your own. I'll be going over exactly how to answer this question from now. So let's get to writing our code. Similar to last time, we create an inner function, this time named reverse even. Defining our inner function, we pass in head with type node and previous node or the node before that in type node two. We'll look at the return value later. Moving on, we put our first if statement. If head is none, meaning it doesn't store any value, in that case, we just return none. Next, as an example, let's say I have a linked list with all even numbers like two, four, and six. In that case, the output would be six, four, and two. Like the reverse function we worked on last time, our entire list is just reversed. To write the code for this, first we put current node and store head. Once we do that, we go up here and copy this, the while loop we wrote last time. We copy this, then paste it under the code we have so far. So now it's been pasted. We want to make sure we see the entire function. So there we go. In this code, our only condition to run the while loop was for a current node to exist. Adding another condition to this, we add and a new condition data current node being even. If it is divisible by two without remainders, the number will be even. So we put percent two and zero. So this code will run with an additional condition of current node data being even. Then we'll write if current node does not equal head. We just reverse the even numbers through this code here. So head should not equal current node anymore. In these lines within the while loop, we kept moving through the list, so the head at the front wouldn't be our current node anymore. In this case that the numbers were altered using the while loop, we return our previous node after we exited the while loop. After that, we put self head, storing the call to reverse even function we just made, passing in self head, and since there is no previous node, we pass in none. So in this 246 case, 6 would end up being returned as our previous node, so 6 would be stored in self head. So it makes sense for our list to be 642. Let's try running what we have so far. Here is some of the code we used to test last time, and we changed the numbers to 2, 4, 6, just to make things easier. So delete the other lines, then print the numbers in the list, and we'll write print sharps. After that, we put L reverse even, and then put L print, and we'll try running this. As you can see, our original numbers, two, four, six in the list are reversed, looking good so far. Next, let's say you have a list like two, four, six, but now have an odd number like one at the end. The list would change to 642 and then the odd number 1. We'll be accounting for cases like these in our algorithm, so after the 6 here, we add 1. Running what we have so far, we get 2, 4, 6, 1. And underneath, we get 6, 4, 2. But then our last one was not printed at all. The reason behind this is this return of previous node here. We need to store current node into head next before that. We'll write head next equals current node. For those of you that aren't sure why we need this, our while loop had been running through all of the even numbers, but our current node would come around to be our odd one at the end. So when we go through all this code and exit the while loop, we come to this line self head equals reverse even. At first our head was this two, so its head next is four. 
But now that we have reversed the order to six four two, our head next is one. So we make this head next store our current node value of one, and then we return the previous node. Only after all that can self head become six. Okay, so let's try our code with the addition of head next equals current node. So now we have two four six one successfully turned into six four two one. Our links have been adjusted to work properly, allowing the one to show. It may be confusing the first time, but the key is to fix head next to store current node and to adjust the links to point to the proper numbers. Now we have our list of two four six one. And we want to add two, four, six. The streaks of even numbers are always reversed, so six, four, two should be added here. Going to this previous node, right here. So our list is two, four, six. Reverse them, then hit one. We just ran through this code iteration for one, but before we finish, we need to call reverse even. Now we'll be looking at the head. We want to now look at the ladder numbers. Which are one, two, four, six. So our head would be our next current node. When we call reverse even, we'll write current node here, and our previous node would just be none, so that the recursive call could take care of it. So once we call reverse even, our current node would be this one. When we call reverse even again with one, since one is odd, our values don't shift through this while loop at all. We need to add some code to account for when our while condition is false. To do that, we put else, and then how do we approach this? We'll say head next. We store reverse even, passing in head next as next, and head as previous node. Then we return head. This might be confusing at first, so let's see an example. A list with a streak of odd numbers like one, three, and five, followed by a streak of evens like two, four, and six. We'll call reverse even on each of these numbers with recursion. So from the start, our head would be one, and head next would be three. Three would be linked to five. Once we hit the streak of even numbers, they'll be reversed to six, four. And two. So originally, the next node linked to five was two, but now five needs to point to six. That's what needs to happen. So focusing on this reverse even here, if head was five, head next would be two. Since head is five, when we call reverse even, two, four, and six will be called on and reversed. Then return previous node. The previous node that will be returned in this case would be six. So the six or previous node that was returned would become this head next here. Now this five would point to six. That's how you think about it. When we start going back to these nodes through recursion, for odd numbers, the head next for the node before this is just five. So the numbers are already linked properly like this. So in a streak of odd numbers, you really only need this return head. When streaks of even numbers like two, four, six come in, we reverse them into six, four, two, and our previous node becomes six. So we set the six to five's head next, which is basically what these lines of code do. This might have been confusing, but we will be trying out our code. Here we have a list with two, four, six, one, but we add some evens, two, four, six, then try running the code. Once you run it, the first line will print our original list two, four, six, one, two, four, six. Only the streak of even will be reversed, so we get six, four, two, and odd here. Then some even six, four, two. So this looks good. Now let's try out a different example. So we have two four six one. Let's change this and say two four six one three five two four six three and five are odd, so they can't be reversed. Run the code. We still have our even streak of two four six, then one three five, 
then 2 for 6. Focusing on the even streaks, they're reversed to 6 for 2, and 1, 3, 5 stay the same, and the last even streak is reversed, 6 for 2. Our code is pretty much complete and works properly. So this code should get you all set to make this reverse even method. Now I'm going over small details, but let's go back to the return value for our reverse even method. Going up to typing, we can import something called optional. We'll import this and then now going back down to this function, we would either be returning none or previous known, depending on the situation. So in this case, we can just put optional here to indicate that we return none in some, but not all cases. So we add node here as well. This portion is not critical to our code, but just something extra we can do. Let's rerun with this new addition. Running it, we can see there's no errors, so adding this portion from typing works well. That's it for our reverse even function for this lecture. You should be able to gain a solid understanding as long as you understand the recursion and applications of linked lists that are used. However, this may seem complicated and hard to process at first. So in that case, I recommend reviewing this on your own as well. And see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to learn about doubly linked lists. Last time we were learning about linked lists, which consisted of its data and next pointer that were linked in one direction. A doubly linked list is linked in two different directions. So if you look at this node here in the center, this previous pointer points to the node before it. As a system, doubly linked lists take up more memory due to its addition of the previous pointer. However, by having the list linked in both directions, there's more flexibility in doubly linked lists due to the ability to access previous nodes. Algorithms with doubly linked lists are also pretty well known, so they're very useful to know. There are many similarities with linked lists, so our code for doubly linked lists have many similarities as well. And without further ado, let's get started to writing our code. Jumping right in, like last time, we import annotations from future. From typing, we import any and optional, which we'll be using later. Then we create a node class, and we'll begin creating a node that contains three working elements. This might be a little hard to see, but we have prev, data, and next. So we'll put def in it with the parameter data of type any along with next node of type node with a default value of none. Our previous node, written prev node, will also be type node with a default value of none. Return value is none as well. The rest is pretty simple. We put our data into self data, next node into self next, and then prev node into self prev. Our data structure for nodes is complete. We still need to think about the structure of doubly linked list as a whole, so we create a class for that. In order to do that, we'll put double linked list object, and then below that, we'll put def in it. We want to make a head, so our type for head is node with default value none. Our return value is also none. Now in our self head, we store head. This portion is really similar to linked list, so it should be okay. Next, we put def append, and we want to input some data for this method, so we put data any with a return value of none. Next, we make a new node. Inside, we store a new node with some data inputted inside. If self head or frontmost node is none, that would mean there's no data inside the list. So we just put new node inside self head. And then what we do is just return. Now we just completed our first node that the head can point to. So next, what we'll be doing is we will be adding the other nodes in append. For this section, we'll first write current node 
and we store self-head. In this example, we have three nodes, one, two, three, and we want to add more nodes onto the last node in the list. To do this, we have to get to our last node using a while loop. So we put a while loop running while current node next does not equal none. In each iteration of the loop, we replace the value of current node with current node next, allowing us to eventually place the last node into current node after all the iterations. Once we've done that, this next node after our last current node will be our new node. Then the node before that, or the new node prev, will be the current node or node we are at right now. As an example, let's say a doubly linked consists of these two nodes here. And we want to add this last node. The node in our list is this current node that we set up using our while loop. Our current node next is going to point to this next node that we just created. Then new node prev, or what the previous pointer of the node we just made is pointing to must be our current node. And that's this section, new node prev equals current node. Now that we've gotten this far, we're gonna test what we have so far. So we start off with name and underscore, underscore, main, underscore, underscore. We'll abbreviate wlink list as D. And let's initialize that like so, then put D append. Let's say appending one. Then we print d head data, and above we've only put one through the append function, which would be our head value. Let's try running this, and one is printed. Let's append two, so we'll change this to one and two. And now that we have another number, let's copy and change this line to d head next data. And when we run this, we get one and two, which means our data was entered properly. Again, let's add three. So we'll have one, two, and three, which would be our next, next value of head. So on the last line, we'll put D head next, next data, then run. When we run this, we see that it prints one, two, three. So in the visual on the right, it would be like having one, two, and three in each of these nodes. Now we want to access the previous node from this third node. Right here we have d head next next data, but we add in prev before data. We run the code, then we get one, two, three, two. We're adding another line. So copy the last line and add another prev here. And then we'll run the code and below we get one, two, three, two, one. As a doubly linked list linked in both ways, we're now able to use both the next pointer and prev pointer here, just like in this visual here. Moving on, just like we did with linked lists, we're going to create an insert function, allowing us to insert data at the front of the list. Our return value for this is none. And our first if statement condition is self head being none or having no value. The inside of this if statement is identical to this code above. So we copy paste these four lines into our code here. So this is all we need for when self head is empty. In the case there's data already put in like our visual here, we first have the self head prev, the node before head, and we store new node into that. So we'll write self head prev equals new node. Referring to this visual, our front node here would be self head and we would be inserting in front of this. So this prev pointer will have to point to our new node, which is why we store new node in here. Now new node next here will now become self head, which is this node at the front. So the next pointer should be pointing here now. So new node next is all set with this line. After that, our self head should be changed into our new node. 
So this arrow indicating head should point to the new node we just made. The code for our function is complete. So going back to main after our append functions, we put d insert and then put in zero. It might be confusing with too many print statements here, so we'll just print out the head node in the beginning. And we'll run our code and we see that zero has become our node in the front. Above here, if we decide to print d head next data and d head next next data, our next node will be d head next 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 data. Let's print all of that. So once we run, we see 0, 1, 2, 3. From this, we were able to confirm that our insert function properly added this node, 0, at the front. Moving on, as I said last time, printing all the nodes like this can get pretty tedious. So we put def print and add another method here. Our return value will be none. So first what we'll write is our current node will be self head. So that's what we'll write. And from this, we'll just go down the list using a while loop. We make a while loop running until current node becomes none. Inside, we print current node data. And for our next iteration, we change the value of current node to be current node next. This iterates until the end of the list. So below, we have our append and insert functions that we just tested, and we deleted the print statements below. We put dprint and run the code. And now we see the console neatly print 0, 1, 2, 3. So our print function here works basically the same way as our linked list from last time. Next is our remove function. We put def remove, we'll write self and then passing in data type any. Just like in our linked list, we'll be passing in the data we want to remove through our parameters. Let's go ahead and open up some space for our method below. First, we're accounting for the case that we are removing the very front node. We put current node to store self head. So that's gonna be our line right here. And our condition is if current node exists. So if we have a value in the head node, and also for our value for current node data to match the data at the front of our list. If this is true, it would definitely be our front node. We have just this front node and no other nodes to its right. And in this case, our code would be pretty simple. Our if statement for this case would be if the next node, current node next, has no value. So it has a value of none. In that case, the current node that we just want to delete will store none. And we put none in self head as well. Add a return statement and that's all there is to it. So when there's only one node in the list, we just delete that node. Now, if that isn't the case, so for our else statement, we store our existing value of current node next into a variable next node for now. Then we set our next node prev to be none. What this is doing is that next node next after this first node here is this node. The previous node before this node is originally the head. So we change its value to none. Now we just need to delete this current node. So we put current node equals none. We link to the next node by putting having self head now store the next node. Add a return and our code is all set. We can use garbage collection on this current node, but I'll just leave this current node and this current node down here as is to make the deletion of current node more clear. This portion of code might have been hard to follow, but let's see our next node here as being this node here. So I'll write next node here. This node will end up being in the very front. We have this prev pointer of next node and this would have to point to none which is why we added this line here. The next line current node equals none indicates deleting this node right here. And our self head here would now have to link to this node, which is this line self head equals next node. We just completed our code to remove the node at the front. So let's try this out as well. So back to our code below, 
we have append 1, 2, 3, and insert 0. To make it more clear, let's change this to append statement at the top. After our print statement, let's separate our code with a line of sharps and the word remove as well. After this, we put d remove, removing r0 at the front. Let's then check by printing d afterwards. Let's run our code now. And now we see 0, 1, 2, 3. And after we move, we have now 1, 2, 3. Let's edit the list to have only one node, 0 with no following nodes of 1, 2, 3. Just comment them out like this, and when we run, we see nothing after the node was removed. So there's no data in our list. We were able to delete the front node, but we also want to be able to delete nodes that follow like 1, 2, 3. So we'll be writing the code for that too. So now getting back to writing codes, over here is our code for deleting the front node. But for deleting the nodes that follow, we need to find the node we want to delete, first using a while loop. We went over this in linked list as well. So make a while loop running while current node exists and the current node's data not matching with the data we passed in. Inside, we replace current node with current node next. After we exit the while loop, we account for the three data. One, two, three. We account for the case that the data doesn't match any of these three nodes, and current node becomes none. We put if current node is none, and if that's true, we just return. Then we're accounting for when that is not the case, and the data matches one of the nodes. That's what we're going to write from now. Since this is a doubly linked list that links both ways, Say our middle node here is deleted, we have to link the first node and the third node to each other properly. If we're deleting the last node, the next pointer of the node before that has to now point to none. Let's first account for the case that we are deleting the very last node. So how do we write this section? We'll start off with our condition would be current node next is none, which would be our last node here. If that is true, we put prev equals current node prev. So the node before this node will be stored into the variable prev. Now the next pointer of this prev needs to point to none. So in prev next, we store none. We delete current node by setting it to none. Finish it now with the return statement. So when we delete our last node, the next pointer of prev or the node before will now store none. And that's basically all there is to it. Next, we're accounting for the case that we delete our middle node. In this case, we put an else statement and open up some space. This time, our next node will store current node next, which means this node to the right of the middle node. We put this into next node. In the same way, we wanted just our node to the left. We save current node prev into a variable prev node for now. Now we take the next node after prev node to store the node after current node, which would be next node. This next pointer will now point to this node in the right. This prev pointer here will also have to point to the left node. So now next node prev will store prev node. Now that we adjusted the links of the nodes before and after current node, we delete current node by setting it to none, then add a return. This might be confusing the first time, so let's review what we coded starting from this portion. This is the case where we delete the last node of the list. So in this case, it would be this node on the very right. To do that, we store this node to left to a variable called prev since it's the previous node before the node we deleted. This is what is happening in this line right here. Next, what we're doing by storing none in prev next is that we have this next pointer point to this none at the end. Here we deleted current node by setting it to none, so we just delete this node here. So that's the entirety of this if statement here. And now moving on to our bottom section. The bottom portion here is the case that we delete this middle node here. Our node on the right is stored as next node, 
and the node before that on the left is stored as prev node. So I'm going to write next node and prev node. So that's what's happening in these two lines right here. So next node equals current node next and prev node equals current node prev. Our next line, prev node next, is set to next node, which means that this prev node's next pointer is pointing here. Now the previous pointer of our next node will point to this node here, which is what this line did here. By doing this, we are able to complete our list connecting from both sides. Once both sides are successfully connected into a list, we delete this node by putting current node equals none. Once we got this down, we'll once again try out our code. I'm going to go down. So going back to main, let's try removing not the head node, but a node in the middle, like two. Run it, and we have our original 0, 1, 2, 3, but the 2 is removed to get 0, 1, 3. Let's alter it to remove our last node, 3. Run it, and our 3 is removed to create 0, 1, 2. We confirm that our code works, so our remove method is complete. Now that our remove method is done, now that our remove method is done, I'll see you in the next lecture which is about reversing the list just like we have done in the past for our linked lists. Last time we added a remove method for our doubly linked list, but in this lecture we'll be adding down below a new method called reverse method. Jumping right in, we'll write death, reverse, iterative, and just like last time, we'll be creating the method using while loop iterations first, and then using recursion. First, we'll be using while loop iterations. Our return value is going to be none, and we'll be looking at each node with while loops. Before that, we create a temporary variable, previous node, and set it to none. Then we put current node, which stores self head, creating our while loop below with condition current node exists so we can look at each node. Let's say we're going down this list and we're at this middle node. The node this next pointer is pointing at will be this node on the right. Now we need to change this pointer to point to the left node. This prev pointer currently points to the left node, but we also need to switch it to point or link to the right. And this is how we're going to be using our reverse method. Adjusting these links will not be too complicated. So let's go ahead and implement this in our code. First, we have this current node prev. Right now, this prev is pointing to the left. This right node, the next pointer is pointing to right now, we want prev to point to that instead. So here we store current node next, and now this previous pointer points to this node in front. Once we change this link, our node can't access our previous node over here. Before we run this code, we want to take the previous node that we created earlier and store current node prev for now. Once we've done that, current node next, should then store previous node. So this is the current node. By putting the previous node of this current node into a temporary variable, this previous node, we can save its value to use later. After that, in this next pointer here, we link that previous node. That way this prev pointer can point to the right, and this next pointer can point to this node on the left, and our links are properly switched. Then we set our current node to current node prev, which allows us to shift over to the next node. In the past, we went down the list to the right by looking at current node next, but we just switched the links in this code here. So when we look at the next node here, we're really looking at the previous node using current node prev. The values of each variable will be replaced through this code. So after we exit the while loop, we look at self head, which will have to be the previous node of the last previous node we looked at, which is previous node prev. By setting this to self head, this will now be the front of our list. Let's say that the links between these two nodes were already switched. The last node in our list would be the previous node of this node, which is this one. So this node will be our new self head. That's why we have previous node prev here. This may have been confusing the first time, but this allows us to switch 
or reverse the links in our doubly linked list. Looking at our while loop again, if current node happened to be none, our previous node here will also store none. So putting prev on top of previous node would cause an error. So we add an if statement. If previous node exists right here, and this statement is only run when the condition is true. Our reverse iterative method is complete, so let's try it out. We replace this remove to reverse iter. And here, instead of remove, we call our method reverse iterative. Once those changes are made, we run the code. The 0123 we had at first has successfully reversed to 3210. We just completed our method but now we'll try a different way without using while loops, but using recursion instead. This comes up quite frequently in interviews, so knowing this might be useful in the future. So first we'll put def reverse recursive self, and our return value is none. We make an inner function here by adding def reverse recursive, but this takes in current node to implement recursion. For our return value, we'll use optional for this, allowing the option of returning none or node as we did in linked list two. First thing inside our inner function, our if statement condition is current node being none, and in this case we return none since no value is stored in current node. Now we're working on this portion where we switch up the links. So we copy these three lines and paste it here. Changing the links or pointers in both directions works the same in this method. So we can just keep it as is. After that, we add another if statement. If current node prev is none. Let's say these nodes already switched their links. And when this node is called, the previous node for this node would be this none. In this case, we no longer need to recursively call this function, so we just return the current node we are at like this. And if current node prev is not none yet, we add a return statement, recursively calling reverse recursive, passing in current node prev. This allows us to go down the list recursive calling on each node. Let's say we call this inner function reverse recursive, passing in self head. What this method will do is that until current node prev is none, the function will keep recursively calling itself. This current node here would be our very last value of current node here, which will ultimately be our return value when calling this function. That node will become our new head node, so we set up this value to be stored to self head. So this is our other way of coding the reverse function. At first glance, our first way of using this while loop seems easier. Using recursive functions can get your brain tangled up. So recursive functions may be harder and harder to follow as we proceed. But breaking it down, we first call reverse recursive passing in self head. This reverse recursive function will be called the first time around and current node will now be our self head. This if statement won't run, so we move on this next portion with these three lines. At first, this previous pointer pointed to none, but through these three lines, this prev will now point to this node. This next pointer had pointed to this right node, but now it will have to point to this none here. Our current node prev would be our next node that we want to look at. The condition here is that for our current node to be none, so we skip that, and here we have a return of a call to reverse recursive, passing in current node prev. So if this head node here is the node we were at, we are now recursively calling reverse recursive on this node that would be our current node prev. By doing this, this prev pointer that was formerly pointing to our last node would now point to this right node. This next pointer will also now point to the node before it. After these adjustments, we move on to our next node and keep recursively calling the function down this list until we get to none, which in that case, this if statement will finally run. So current node prev will indeed be none, so we return our current node. This function will keep recursively calling itself until it gets to a return value, and when it gets there, we store the value into self head. 
The portion with recursion may have been hard to understand, but running the code step by step and going through the motions will definitely help. For those of you who are still confused, you can add print statements into these lines or add a debugger with breakpoints to check each step more clearly. As usual, let's try out the reverse recursive method we just created. We just tried out our reverse iterative method here, but now we're doing the recursive method. So let's change this to rec. Now we change this to d reverse recursive. And finally, we print with d print. Let's run our code. And running the code, we first see 0, 1, 2, 3, which was reversed with our reverse iterative function into 3, 2, 1, 0. On top of that, we called a reverse recursive method, changing it back to 0, 1, 2, 3. This confirms that our reverse recursive method works properly. Our method here is all done. So I'll see you in the next lecture for a review quiz type of video. Let's start our quick review quiz. Here is our doubly linked list visual for reference. Let's say the list contains several numbers like 1, 5, 2, 9, and so on. Our mission is to reorder these numbers. So if our original order is 1, 5, 2, 9, we want to order these numbers to have 1, 2, 5, and 9. We have three nodes in this visual here. So let's say they contain 1, 5, and 2. We would want to reorder the 5 and 2 here, but when doing this, let's not worry about changing the links for now. As a data structure, when we want to reorder the position of these two nodes here, we can do that by changing its links. However, changing links can get a little convoluted. So here in these two datas, we store 5 and 2. So without changing these links or pointers, you can simply switch out the 5 and 2 like this. In terms of the sorting algorithms, there are no strict limitations, so you can basically choose any of them. Personally, I'm going to approach this using a bubble sort. The way you perform the code isn't very important, as this question is mostly checking whether you know how to go through each node with a while loop. Interviewers also just want to know how you would approach the switching of data values between nodes. Their main goal is to have you use a sorting method that works with these doubly linked lists. And for those of you that would like to try it yourself, go ahead and pause the video and see how you do. What we'll be doing today is giving an example of code that will work for this question. If you're interested in trying out the problem yourself, please go ahead. Now let's get to writing the code. Here's the code we wrote last time, the reverse recursive method. And down below, we'll start with dev sort self. So our return value is none, and first we count for the case that self head is none. We wouldn't have to manipulate anything in that case, so we just return. Next, we put current node equals self head, and run a while loop running through each node until current node next becomes none. Inside the loop, we always end with current node equals current node next to shift down each node to become our new current node. Let's add a print statement here, printing current nodes data, and let's try running what we have so far. Down here, we have 0, 1, 2, 3, but to make things easier, let's fix it to 1, 5, 2, 9. Let's delete the reverse functions for now and change this row of sharps to say sort. Under that, put d sort, and we're all set. Let's see what this print statement prints when we run. Once we run, we see our 1529 show up, as well as the sorted numbers 152. Our code ran until current node becomes none. When our while loop iterates through 9, the next pointer of 9 points to none. Basically, we just looked at each node using the while loop until that point. So this is just a simple while loop. Now that that's done, let's remove this print statement and we want to start writing the sorting algorithm here. The initial value of current node is this head node. And you may remember working with values following this head node using the bubble sort or cocktail sort. So first you put next node and store current node next. Think about it like storing the node after the head node. We then make a while loop 
running until next node becomes none. I'll comment out an example here, but say we have a list with 1529. Our current node right now contains the head node, which is our one in the front. Our next node would be five. So through this while loop, we will be going through 529, so the remaining numbers here. Then we put an if statement with current node data, which is this one. If this is greater than the value of next node data, then we swap their values. So to do this, we put current node data and next node data. So since we're swapping their values, we replace each other with next node data, then current node data. This lets us swap the data they each contain. Once we do that, we look at the next node on the list with next node equals current node next. So we have 1529 here, and this one in the front is right now our current node. We're comparing one with the remaining three numbers, 529. And if any of them are smaller than one, we bring them to the front. For example, let's say we have a zero here. First, you would compare one and five, then one and two, and then one and zero. Since zero is smaller than one, we swap them by putting zero here and one here. Next, we look at zero and nine. Zero is the smaller number, so this code allows us to bring the smallest number in the list to the very front. Once we exit our while loop in this condition, we'll now move on to the next node after our current current node, which would be 5. We compare 5 with the remaining 219, and once again, our smallest number will be placed here. So we compare 5 and 2, then compare 5 and 1. So then this would change to 1, and this would change to 5. For this question, we don't know the length of the given list, so we're just starting from the beginning and keep bringing the smallest number to the front. This allows us to easily bring while loops into our algorithm. Now we want to test whether the sorting method we created actually works, so we call our method here. Then we check what's happening with dprint. We run the code, and our 1529 has successfully been sorted into 1259. So we were able to confirm that our sorting algorithm works properly. This is just one example, so you don't have to do the exact same thing you are welcome to get creative and use other sorting methods to answer this question as well. So this wraps up our study of doubly linked lists and see you in the next lecture. The next topic we'll be covering is hash tables. On the bottom right here, I have an example of a Python dictionary. At the very top, I have h equals and a set of braces. So I'm declaring a new dictionary. Then we put in car as a key of h and inputting a value, Tesla. And next we have PC as the key, inputting a value, Mac. So we've added data into our dictionary. And as you can see below, if we print H car, the corresponding value, Tesla, is printed. And if we print HPC, then Mac is printed. Dictionaries pair up keys and values to make it easier to find the desired value, just like how we got our value Tesla, right here. This aspect of the dictionary is structured through hash tables, which is what we will be coding today. Hash tables are known to be fast, but what does that actually mean? I came up with four keys here, car, PC, language, and SNS. Let's say we want to know where car is located. On the right here, we have car in a key value pair. Think of its location to be what index number the pair was put into. And think of the index as kind of a literal index or table of contents that you might see in a book. Right now, we only have four keys here, but let's say we have 10,000 pieces of data in our dictionary. The 10,000th data that we put into our dictionary will be found by searching every single index before that which means it would take a lot of time to find later values. So if we think of this index as an index in a book, we have 10 indexes here from 0 to 9, or better yet, chapter 0 to 9, if we think of it as a table of contents. 
If we put data into these chapters, our card, Tesla, pair, would be located in chapter 5. Once we know that, we can just flip straight to chapter 5 to find this data, making our access much faster. However, we have PC in index 4 and SNS also in index 4, which is kind of like having both datas belong in chapter 4. Even in this case, you would flip to chapter 4 and see the PC and Mac pair in the first page, then turn the page to see SNS and YouTube pair. So when you want to retrieve the SNS YouTube pair as data, you would simply go to chapter 4 and turn to the next page. So in a book with 10,000 pages, instead of checking each page from the beginning, we get to skip to an estimate of being located in chapter 4, then find the data we want, making the whole process faster. So visualizing this dictionary as kind of like a book index or table of contents may be helpful. When making this index, we have our keys of car, PC, language, and SNS. These correspond to various numbers in our index. The hash function is what assigns these keys to these indexes. We'll go more into this function later, so just have a rough idea of this for now. For example, this car will always be assigned to index 5, and the word PC will be assigned to index 4. We create a system like this. Additionally, hash functions will always organize data to fit into the index we provided, like the 0 through 9 index here. So even if we add language and SNS, they'll be put into an index between 0 through 9 too. As an example, this car key will be assigned to index 5 through the hash function, and then our key value pair will go here. In the example above, both key PC and SNS are assigned to index 4. Both keys are assigned to the same index. In this case, PC was put in first and linked first to index 4. So we have our PC Mac pair first, and therefore linked first to index 4. After that, SNS was assigned, so we add our SNS YouTube pair after, kind of like appending data in a list. This way, no matter how much data we put in, they will be assigned within the given index. And when accessing the data, we make the data easier to find by skipping to the index it's in. What this means for our code is that when we want to get this car here, we write hcar, calling our hash function to find the index it's in, which is 5. We skip straight to index 5 and find our key value pair with the key, finding our value Tesla that we print here. This part may be hard to understand with just the visual, so we'll implement this structure into code. We'll start by organizing the structure with a class. First, we make a class called hash table and then object. I know that Python users can use the built-in dictionary starting with h equals and a set of braces. You can use this, but many coding interviews and tests will ask you to code the structure from scratch, which is what we are working on today. So first in the class, we put def in it, and here we set the index size to be 10. We can always change the index size based on the number of keys. You may need to adjust the index size depending on the number of keys, but for today we'll have 10 to make things easier. So we'll set the size to 10. There's no return, so the return value will be none. In our function, we put size into self size, and for our self table, we'll keep track using a list. We want to make another list inside our list for this table. So inside the outside list, we'll use list comprehension and we put four in range and self size, which creates a number of lists equal to the value of self size. This might have been confusing, so let me show you something for demonstration. We'll put our header, if name, main, and inside we put hash table, storing the hash table object from above. We then print hash table table and run the code. Printed in the console, we see this list framing the outside and inside are 10 little lists. These are the little lists and there's 10 of them. The key value pairs like PC, Mac, and SNS YouTube will be going inside these little lists. So this list in the very front will be our index zero and we'll be filling in this list with data. 
So our table structure was just initialized as self table through the line we just wrote. And now moving on, we'll be making this hash function here. Within the hash table class, we put def hash self with parameter key, which would be a string like our car. We want our return value to be index number, so return value will be in. Our method header is complete. Now we go up here and import something called a hashed lib, which we'll be using in our method. We want to use the md5 function in hashed lib, so we put hashlib.md5. There's many functions in hashed lib, such as chat256, but for today we will be using the md5. As a key, we have string like car, but in this case, we have to change the key into binary form to pass into md5. So we put encode and then add hex digest to change into a string. This may seem complicated, so let's try it in an interactive shell. Put in Python 3, launching the interactive shell. Once we've done that, first we import hashlib and we try calling hashlib.md5, directly passing in our key car as a string. When we do that, we get Unicode objects must be encoded before hashing. So we need to encode this car first. So we'll write encode here. Once we encode it, we just created an md5 hash object here. Then we use hex digest on this object. So we'll add hex digest right here. And what will this return? We see a string representing the hash object. No matter how many times we repeat the code, you still end up with the same string. Let's try changing car to PC now. Then we result in this different string here. The important thing is that no matter how many times we repeat this, this hash will always result in the same string. So a certain string will always be converted to a certain string of letters and numbers no matter what, which we demonstrated using hashlibmd5. Now we want to convert this string into an integer. Right now, we have the hash lib that we just digested and even if we try to convert it into an integer like this, we get an error. The error code when we run it says we need base 10, and that's referring to these letters like B and C that are converted into a base 16 numerical system. To prevent this error, we state that the base is 16 like this. And now let's retry converting it into an integer. We successfully get a line of numbers like this one. So our string PC was converted into this number here. Again, repeating the same line, converting PC. PC is converted to the exact same number no matter what. We have our index 0 through 9, and we want to convert this number into the numbers in our index. We'll divide by 10, and then get the remainder. When we divide by 10, we get the remainder 4. Every time we repeat this line, we get 4. Now let's try changing PC into car. And now the number is converted to 5. Once again, we get 5 every time we run this line. So you want to be able to do this conversion in our code here. We'll close the shell for now. And right now we call the hashlib md5 with hex digest. After that, we need to convert to an integer, setting base to be 16 then find the remainder by dividing by self-size. We return all of this with a return statement, and it should be done. To test it out, below here, let's change hash table table to hash table hash and pass in car. Once we run the code, we get 5. This confirms we were able to properly make this hash function here. So that would be this part. We just created the hash function with this section. We just created our hash function to call on our keys so now we want to be able to take one of the keys, like car, and set it up to its corresponding value, like this Tesla here. To do this, we want to take its index, which would be 5 for car, and add the key value pair into our list. Let's begin implementing this into our code, which would be called add. We would pass in the key and value of the data we want to add, and our return value is none. First, for our index, that can be easily found by calling the self-hash we just created with our key as our parameter. Next, we'll write self-table index, so the index of our self-table, followed by append with a list containing key and value. 
Let's try what we have so far. Here we change hash table hash to hash table add, which the key car we add a value like Tesla. And once we've done that, we'll print hash table table and run the code. And running our code, our list with car and Tesla is properly put into our fifth index. However, here above, let's try putting the same add statement twice. Running the code, the same two exact key value pairs get put in as car Tesla and car Tesla, which is not what we wanted. So how do we fix this? To prevent this, before we add the data, we put a loop saying for data in self table index. And this will find the data currently inside that index. Let's say we put in five for a table index. It'll find our only data car Tesla. But how about index four, which contain these two key value pairs? This is just an example. But then in that case, we'll use a for loop to retrieve each of these pieces of data. Then if data and regarding the key, it's zero because key is listed as our first element in the list. So it's zero. If this key matches the key we want to put into our list, then we overwrite this value. So data one with value. Since the key value pairs are identical, we don't need to go through the for loop. So we break. And this append statement here will be in our else. This may be a little difficult to understand, but let's run what we have. Now we see car Tesla. We put in two add statements here, but we only have one value pair. Since you already had our first key value pair with car Tesla, once we added the second data, we would enter this for loop. This car Tesla pair, the key car matches this if statement. And because it matches this Tesla, is passed into this value. This Tesla here is set to data one. So the same value will overwrite the original. Then with this break here, we will skip this append here, then exit the for loop. Let's try changing this Tesla here to Toyota. Running the code, you can see that Toyota just overwrote Tesla here. In this if statement, the value of data one was updated here, and then broke. This would allow us to overwrite data values as many times as we want. To further our understanding, if we wanted to add a line under here, I'm going to copy and rewrite this to PC and Mac. When we run this, this index in self table would be empty. When it is empty, we don't directly go to this for loop, but instead we go to this else statement and appending the data right away. Let's try running the code. And we successfully get PC Mac. Next, we want to add SNS YouTube. So here after the line with PC, we add a line passing in SNS and YouTube. The index of SNS will also, in this case, be four. So when we run the code in index four, we have PC Mac. And following that, SNS YouTube is added. What's happening is that for this PC Mac pair, we go through the for loop. Then we get to if data zero equals key. When we run this a second time using SNS, the statement is not true. Therefore, we skip the if statement here, moving on to the else where we append the data value pair of SNS YouTube. This for loop and else situation might have been confusing. So I recommend reviewing this part on your own if you find yourself confused. And here the data structure is printed horizontally, which is a little hard to see. So to make it easier for the eyes, I'm going to add a function for that, just like this starting with def print. And this function will make it easier to see. So how do we do this? First, we want to look at each index. So we put for index in range self size. This will let your for loop run 10 times for the 10 index numbers. Inside, we'll put print index and we don't want to skip to the next line. So we'll write end equal space. Let's run the code and try it out. So commenting out this line for now, we put hash table print and then run. 
Now we get all of our numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, without skipping to a new line. If you do want to skip a line after each index, we put an empty print statement, and it will result in our index being printed vertically, just like this. The reason we don't want to skip a line every time is because, like this 4, we want to use an arrow after 4 and show what data this index contains. So that's why we print it without skipping to the next line. Next, we take the index of self table by putting for data in self table index. For example, we have PC Math, SNS, and YouTube. We're going to get the data for this, so we're going to put for data in self table index. And we'll print. First, we'll put an arrow ending with a space instead of skipping lines. After showing the arrow, we have another print statement, printing the data and once again not skipping a line, just like this. Running this code, we can see that in index 4, we have PC Mac and following that, SNS YouTube. Then we finally skip the line. And for index 5, we just have car Toyota. Through this code, hopefully you can see how this data structure is easier to see, and you can confirm it by adding more data yourself. Now we're working on retrieving our data. So let's start it out with def get self passing in key. Our return value can be a lot of things, like numbers or strings. So let's put from typing here, import any, and set return value as any, allowing the return value to be anything from strings to numbers. Let's move this line up here. So after placing our from typing here, we'll scroll back down. First, when retrieving or getting data, we need its index number. We'll write index, and then we find that with self hash key. And let's say if our key was this car, our code will find its corresponding index number, so index becomes 5. Then we add a for loop with data in self table, looking at each data one by one. Think of it like turning to each page in a book. And if the data's key happens to be car or matches with the key we're looking for, then we just return its corresponding data. We'll be trying this too. So scroll down to the bottom, and after all the data we added here, we print hash table get and pass in car. We want to print this after we print the hash tables, so we'll adjust the order and run the code. We see the inside of the hash table storing data like this, and the data with our car as the key is right here. It's Toyota. And we see our last line correctly printed Toyota. Now we want to retrieve the data YouTube right here. So we replace this car with SNS, run the code, and we probably get our value YouTube here. This confirms that our get is working properly, but it also works properly even for data that was added after another. Now we've finished coding the basic functions of a hash table these add and get functions here. You may notice it looks different when we call them compared to the built-in Python dictionaries. We're going to make adjustments to make them more similar. And to do that, we're using something called a set item. As a unique attribute, we pass in the key and value that we want. And for this object, a dictionary and this set item actually serves very similar purposes. We comment this line out and to follow a similar format as the Python dictionary, we would set our key right here and input our corresponding value. Tesla like this. When following this exact format, our set item here will be called. Once it's called, we would just call self add, passing in our key and value. Likewise, when retrieving the value, we have something called get item which we would pass in a key when getting the value. Our return value is any. Now we return a call to self get, passing in key. By doing this, this line where we call get can be adjusted to Python's exact format. For hash tables, 
setting up our key like this. Now let's just fix all of these to follow Python's dictionary format with the equal sign. So I'm going to add equal sign right here. And then the next line, we're going to say PC for Mac and then SNS for YouTube by using an equal sign. Now that we fixed it up, let's run our code. We see that we get the same hash table with the same data, allowing us to retrieve the data properly as well. So that's the basic shebang. So in this lecture, we went over coding the basic structure of the hash table on Python, exactly like this visual on the right. I think coding this would come easy if you have a solid understanding of how hash table work. This might come up in interviews or tests, so being able to code this without any problems may be very useful. In our next lecture, we'll focus on a problem regarding hash tables using the dictionary. Before we begin going over our quiz, here are the two problems we have this time. The first one has a given input of a list containing the following numbers, as well as an integer parameter of 12. Passing these parameters in, what our code needs to do is find a pair of numbers adding up to 12. In this case, starting from the front, you can see that 2 and 10 add up to 12. The code just needs to return the first instance of two numbers, that add up to the integer, so as a result, we should get a return value of 2 and 10. In the case that we pass in 12, but we don't find a pair of numbers with a sum of 12, then we must return none as mentioned here. The second problem, once again, passes in a list with the following numbers. On the right, we see that the output is 11 and 9. So in this list, adding 9 and 11 equals 20. But if you add up the remaining numbers of 2, 5, 10, and 3, we also get 20. This problem is asking you to find a pair that adds up to that certain number, where the sum of its remaining numbers will equal that sum as well. If there's no such pair, then we return none. Here's an example here, 11 plus 9 is 20, and the sum of the remaining numbers in the list, so 2, 5, 10, and 3 added equals 20 as well. We want to find pairs like this for our second problem. So jumping right into the code, our problems for today are actually quite simple, requiring relatively less performance skills. As long as you have an idea of how to approach it, it should come easy. We start off our first method with def get pair, passing in a list of ints as numbers and an int as our target. We prepare a parameter that can be like 20. Our return value is optional, which can be either a numerical value or if there are no numbers, just return none. If there is a return, we set it to a tuple with two ints. So now we want to create this function so that it would meet the requirements of our first problem. This isn't a complex function to code, so I'll start right away. First, in our variable cache, we store an empty set, which will allow us to store values inside later then run a while loop through each element in our numbers list. Inside our loop, we put cache add num. So going through each number in our list, like 11, 2, 5, 9, the numbers will be added to our cache. And since sets don't take two of the same values, we don't have to worry about repeats. So far, we took each number in our list and added them to cache. The first iteration of our loop takes our first number, 11, and the iteration after that would be 2. And when we take 2, if the value of target 2 is somewhere in our cache, then that would be our pair. To do that, we store target num into variable val. And if val exists inside our cache, then that would be the pair we need, so we return val and num. That's pretty much it. Trying it out ourselves, set up main, then set up our list L to our list above with copy and paste. Our target here is 12. Then we print our call to get pair, passing in L and T as parameters. Running the code, we can see here on the right that 2 and 10 were printed, so we were able to successfully output the 2 and 10 required in the problem. Making our L shorter in length, like for example 11 and 2, when we run this, there are no two numbers that add up to 12. 
so 9 is printed to our right. So if you were able to solve our first problem in a similar manner, you should be all set. Now moving on to our second problem, I made a new function named getPair half sum, and for parameters, a list of ints called numbers once again. Our return value is optional, the value choice being none or tuple with two ints. Once we've set up our correct inputs and outputs, let's begin the contents of this function. In variable sum numbers, we store sum numbers, or the sum of all numbers in our list. We add an if statement, and since we are returning a pair of numbers, if sum numbers divided by 2 does not equal 0, or if sum numbers is not divisible by 2, then it's impossible for a pair to be formed, so we just add a return here. If it is divisible by 2, then a pair can be formed, so we store sum numbers divided by 2 into variable half sum, then convert that into an int. Using this concept along with the concepts from problem 1 will lead us to a successful solution. Now just like in problem 1, we store an empty set into cache, then we run the same while loop again with 4 num in numbers with cache add num inside. In problem 1, val, or our wanted value, could be found through subtracting num from target, but this time we're subtracting num from half sum. And if that value exists in our cache, that would be our pair, so we put if val in cache. And if that is true, we would return val and num. So that should complete our function for problem 2. So let's try out the function. Get pair half sum that we just created. We'll just reuse the L list we made above, so pass that into our function and print our return value with a return statement. Let's run our code, and running the code 11 and 9 is printed here. The sum of 11 and 9 is 20, and adding its remaining numbers of 2, 5, 10, 3 will also result in 20. So that confirms that our function was successful in getting the right values. Being able to solve the problem this way is satisfactory, but this portion actually can be shortened. So here we found the sum of all the numbers in our list, checked if it was divisible by 2, returned, and that wasn't the case, we split the sum in half, storing it into half sum. There is a function in Python library that can do this in a single line. So to use that function, we put down half sum, variable remainder. The function div mod can return the quotient and remainder of two numbers in one go. So we just call div mod on some numbers and two. And if the remainder is zero, we would just return. I would say this code would be more desirable due to its conciseness. So let's delete these lines above. And this is our new version of get pair half sum. Trying out our new version just in case, we confirm that 11 and 9 are printed properly once again. So it works. Other than that, if we try changing this to 10 to 11, the sum of the numbers in the list is no longer divisible by 2. So rerunning the code, our output is now none. This proves that this if statement, checking divisibility, is working properly, printing out none. So a couple of key points for today is being able to use built-in functions like divmod, which might earn you some extra points. In problems like these where you must find a pair of numbers, you can use sets like these and find the other pair by subtracting it from certain sums, and finally seeing whether that value exists in your list. It's pretty common to have problems requiring you to take similar steps, so getting this pattern or process might be a good idea. In this course, we'll cover stacks and queues, but first, we'll focus on stacks. The coding part isn't particularly difficult, but understanding the concept clearly with a visual is a good idea, so we'll start with that. So here is our visual. Think of this empty as an empty list. In the empty list, we're putting a value 1 into the list, which is done through our function push. To add another value 2 to the list, we push 2 into the list as well, putting 2 on top of our first value 1. This is known as stacking. There is another function called pop. Another function, pop, is used when we remove values from the list. Since 2 was the value at the top of the stack, we would be removing the value 2 in this case. So pop will always remove the most recent value in the list. This concept 
will be applied in many algorithms for many situations, so having this concept down may be very helpful. Applying this concept to code is quite simple, so let's get right into it. We'll start off with setting up our stack class with class stack object, starting out with death init self. We'll have no return value, so the return will be none. We initialize self stack to an empty list. Here we set up our push function, again with no return value, so put none here. Here we just append the data to self stack like normal, super simple. Next would be our pop function, so we'll say def pop self. Its return value can really be anything, so we put any. Here let's get any imported with from typing import any, retrieving any data type that comes in like int, strings, and etc. In the function, we write if self stack. So if self stack exists, we return self stack pop, returning the very last element in the list. We used a list in this lecture, so I just named these functions push and pop to match the official stack function names. But interviews might just require a function that uses the concept of stack. All we need to do is call our function. Setting up main to test out our stack, first we put stack equals stack to create an instance of our stack object. Now we print the list that our stack object contains with print stack stack and when we run this line our empty list is printed like that. Once we've done that we put stack push 1 to push our value of 1 into our list and copy our print statement below, printing the contents of our object. Running the code previously an empty list was printed but now we have our 1 inside the list. Now we add another value to copying our former lines and let's try running it again. Now we have one and then we also have two added, just like this visual here. Now we want to remove values using pop. So we put stack pop and add a print statement around it to see what value we removed. After that, we'll recheck the contents of our stack object like this. So once we run, we see that we just removed two out of our object, ending up with one. This might seem like common sense, but one more time, let's try removing another value, which would be our one. Then we check the content of our stack object. Running the code, we see that one is removed, making our object an empty list. So this lecture was mainly grasping the concept of stacks by applying it to code. It's pretty much just like a normal list. So there's no need to overcomplicate things. Many algorithm quizzes will test your conceptual understanding of stacks, like adding in 1, 2, then removing the most recent value too. In the next video, we'll be doing our own quiz, checking our understanding of stacks. Let's begin by reviewing our problems for this lecture. Here we see an input containing data formatted like a JSON string. Our task here is to check whether the format is executed correctly. Starting from the first line, here at the top are curly brackets here, properly open at the beginning and then closes at the end. There's an opening and an end, so it's correct. And next, these square brackets. These square brackets open and close correctly. The round brackets also have an opening and closing, so our final output is true. Let's look at our second example. These curly brackets are fine, but this square bracket here does not have its closing half. All brackets or quotes need to be in an opening and closing pair. For example, these have an opening and closing and opening and closing. And if that isn't the case, our output should return as false. So our problem today is to create an algorithm checking whether the format is correct or not. Let's start with defining our function validate format. Our parameters will be a string, so let's put chars. Then str for strings. Our return value is true or false, so we put bool for boolean. So to approach this problem, let's look at this input. Looking at each character using a for loop, we'll encounter this curly bracket first. In this case, we create a stack, putting in the other closing half of the curly brackets. Next, we'll encounter this square bracket, and now we will stack the other closing square bracket into the stack. Once we encounter the closing half of the square brackets, we'll check whether this closing bracket exists in our stack. The closing square bracket does exist, 
So in this case, we remove it using the pop function. Repeating this process, now we encounter this round bracket, so we put in the other closing round bracket into the stack. Once you encounter the other closing half of the round bracket, that will match our round bracket in the stack, so we pop it out of our stack. Lastly, we encounter the other half of our curly bracket, so this curly bracket will be removed from the stack as well. Once the stack is completely empty, we return true. Testing the same thing with our second input, this would start off with a curly bracket, so we push in the closing half, like so, and next, and we encounter the square bracket. So we add the closing half for that, and same thing for this bracket, we add in its closing half, the closing half comes in, so we pop out this matching bracket. This is the round bracket, and we put in the closing half, and it matches the bracket, so we pop out of the bracket from the stack. However, this last curly bracket here is not a match with this square bracket in the stack. As soon as we get a non-match, we return false. For this input, we only had one non-match, but it's possible to have something like round bracket, square bracket, closing round bracket, square closing bracket. Although both brackets have their opposite pairs, putting a format like this in JSON would give us an error. So this combination of opposite pairs doesn't work. We can confirm it using the same process we went over. So let's try this. First, we put the closing half of this round bracket into the stack. Next is this bracket. So we add its closing half, and next, we encounter the closing half of the round brackets. However, it does not match the square bracket in the stack, so this will become false, resulting in a return value of false. Let's look at another example. What if the first bracket in our input was a closing bracket? We're dealing with a closed bracket from the beginning. The desired return value would be false as well. In this case, the stack would still be empty at the time of its encounter, so there's no bracket to remove. Therefore, it would return false. Next, how about if the bracket format were completely accurate until the last character, which happens to be an opening square bracket? The loop would end with the stack containing a single closed square bracket. We would not end up with a clean, empty stack. We'd be left with a square bracket. So in this case, we would return false as well. So in our code, we'll need to account for these numerous cases where the return value should be false. Now that we've gone over this, let's get to writing our code. We start with a variable lookup, storing a dictionary organized with key value pairs. In the key, we put in the opening half of our curly bracket, putting its closing half as the value. We'll do the same with square brackets, putting in the opening and closing half. Repeat for round brackets as well, organizing in the key value pair. Next for our stack, we could be using another container called a queue, but for today, we'll just use list for simplicity. Moving on, we want to use a for loop to look at each character in our parameter chars. So we can do that by putting four chars in chars for each character. Through this if statement, we check whether its character exists in lookup keys. If the character does exist, in that case, just like this, we append lookup char into our stack. For example, if we encounter this curly bracket and we have our value here, but we would append its value here into our stack. As we continue the loop, we would encounter this opening square bracket and we have this value here. So through this if statement, we would append its value of the closing square bracket into our stack. The next bracket we encounter in our loop would be the closing half of the square brackets. To account for this in our code, we put an if statement, testing if char exists in lookup values this time. In that case, if char does not match the most recent char, we are popping out of our stack, so we would return false at this point in our code. Adding one more condition, if we encounter a closing bracket in our input while our stack is still empty, we would put false too. So we add a return false statement here. Once we finish checking these following conditions for each character in our input, we need to check one last condition. We put if stack because our stack needs to be empty at this point. But if that's not the case, we would return false as well. 
If none of these conditions apply, then we are finally able to return true. Our code is complete, so let's test the algorithm. We're going to start off with if name main, and then we're going to copy the string from above. Then store that in J. Next, we pass J into our created function, validate format, and print its result. Now let's run the code. We now see that true was printed on the right. Let's try putting in a square bracket at the start of our string. Rerunning the code, now we get false, which is the correct result. But we just added verified our if no stack condition to work. The computer suddenly encountered a closing bracket, and since nothing was in our stack, it returned false. We can also try the example I showed at the beginning, adding in square bracket here. Running the code, we got our correct result as false, as you can see here. And that covers this if statement. We want to know what would happen if an opening bracket was thrown in at the very end. That means that a bracket remains in the stack making this condition true. Running the code, once again, we get false. So if you were able to write your code similar to ours here, you should be all set. That's basically it for this lecture. The code itself here is quite simple. So this problem is testing you on how you approach this problem, your thinking process, and being able to organize each situation when the Boolean would become false. The coding part is not too complicated. So the important part is having a solid understanding and reflecting that understanding in your code. So for this lecture, the problems really had an emphasis on the ability to formulate your ideas on the spot rather than the complexity of the coding. I hope this video helps you fluidly come up with a solution when you encounter a similar problem in the future. Next, we'll be covering queues. Unlike stacks, queues remove values from the front instead of the back. Think of this as a list with a front and a back. So we first put one, then two, then three, then four from the back. This is how we typically append values. In queues though, we call this process enqueuing. When removing values previously on stack, we call this popping values. So in this case, it's the four. In queues, this process called dequeuing. And we always dequeue from the front, which is this one. For example, when working with networks, we have packet coming from the back and we process them one at a time. This is how we can use queue to process information. So if data like packages keep getting added from the back, we can have them temporarily stored in the queue and process each piece of data from the front. So these situations make queues very useful. Again, this will just be a conceptual overview, but hopefully this lecture will give you a solid idea. So just like we did with stacks, let's start coding our queue. First, we import any and start off with our new queue class. Put in object as well as def in itself with a return value of none, since we're just initializing our list for now. We store an empty list in self queue and move on to our nq method. The parameters are self and data of type any, and our return value is none, once again. Now with self queue append data, we insert the data into our list. Next is our dequeue method. Since we're taking data out of our list, our return type is any, if self queue, so if some value exists in self queue, we return self queue pop or the value we removed using pop. Here, by assigning a specific index number of remove with zero, we are able to remove the value on the front. The default is to remove from the back, so be careful to always assign with zero. So pop zero is a necessity when dequeuing. And should you use append or pop zero? To explain the concepts in queue, I created a separate enqueue and dequeue method here. Again, let's try out our code to solidify our understanding further. We'll say if name main, here we put queue, storing the empty queue object. Then we call enqueue, adding in one. Let's copy the statement, changing the values to two, three, and four. Then we print the contents of queue. Running this code, we see the four numbers added to our queue. And now when removing values, we call dequeue on queue, which we're printing the contents we removed. Since our front value is one, 
we'll be removing one, then two, three, and four. Running the code, we just removed each value in one, two, three, four from the top, so we get one, two, three, four printed through these four lines. So that was the basic concept of queues and how they work. These queues that we learned about already exist in the Python library. I just pulled this up from the browser, but this is commonly known as a deck, which already exists under class collections. So in the deck, this append x will add values from the right, append left will add values from the left. So deck allows you to do both functionalities of queues and stacks, as you also see here, like insert, pop, and pop left. I used pop zero just now, but pop left is an easier to understand method, and we have pop here, then pop left. We also have remove and reverse. So the method specific to queue that we just created, like nq and dq, can all be done using deck in the class collections. So just something to remember. Using this will also benefit your performance, so you can just use the methods from this library instead of creating your own methods like this every time. So let's try redoing our code using the library. From collections, we import deck at the top. And now let's go towards the bottom and comment out the print statements. And we initialize Q with a deck just like that. In Q, we append one like this. Copy that line, changing the values to two, three, and four. Now we print Q, and running the code, we have the contents one, two, three, four printed, just like we did with our in Q method here. And next, we're gonna do print Q pop left, repeating the line to remove two, three, and four in our deck as well. Running the code, we have one, two, three, four printed, having the correct values removed. Formerly, we did the same process by making our own Q class and its method from scratch. However, you do the exact same thing easier by using this pre-made deck module from collections. Deck won't have the same method names like nq and dq. Instead, they're named append and pop left. I've noticed that many Python users are more used to the method names append and pop left and might get confused by the method names nq and dq. So keep that in mind, some Python users are more used to append and pop left. We also can replace pop left with the other method pop in our module, which will make our code have the functionalities of a stack. So running the code, instead of removing one, two, three, four from the front, we get the opposite. So removing four, three, two, one from the back. So dex can make our code function like a stack as well. So make sure to note this module deck from collections in the back of your mind. Today we went over the concepts of queues and introduced the deck module. You may find this to be very useful. Our next video will be a short and simple quiz covering queues. We're going to get started with the quiz. And for this time we'll be using the deck module we just learned about. Let me first erase the unnecessary code from last time. We imported the deck in the first line, and then we made a deck object here, appending one, two, three, and four into the deck. Then here we printed the contents. We're gonna erase everything below those lines and run the code. Now we see our deck with its contents one, two, three, and four. Now we want to reverse the contents, so we call the reverse method in our module. So on this line, we'll say Q reverse. Once we print Q again and run, we see the numbers, were reversed. The values here, one, two, three, four, have been reversed to four, three, two, one. We just used the reverse method in our module, but today's quiz will be asking you to reverse the contents of the deck without using this built-in method. Jumping right in, we make our new function by starting with def reverse, passing in q as a parameter, which we want to reverse the contents of. You should see that doing this will be quite simple. First, we make a new variable, new q, storing another deck inside. Now we are bringing in a while loop, and our condition for this is while q, or while q contains a value. For example, inside the loop, we add a print, passing in q pop, which will be removing values from your queue. 
So basically, we'll be removing values and printing them until no values remain. Let's comment out these lines that we used earlier using reverse. So now we can use the reverse method we just created, passing in our queue. Let's try running the code, and we get 4, 3, 2, and 1. We removed each of these numbers through pop and printed them out through the print statement, which was each iteration of this while loop. If we pop out each value in our deck, the deck will eventually become empty. So this while loop had repeated until our deck was empty or had no more values to remove. Now all we have to do is add each value we removed into the new deck we just created. So we put new queue append around it, appending each number we removed into the new queue. Now I return that new queue and our method is done. Going back down here, we call reverse on queue, which we store into a new queue. Then we print its content. Let's try running what we have. And running the code, below we see our 1234 correctly reversed to 4321. So this was a pretty quick quiz, but it tests you on key points like using a while loop on queue, or this one line code directly appending the value we popped into new queue. If you are able to meet these points, you are right on track. You might run into actual cases that require the use of these codes while coding or in a development environment. So understanding this and being able to write this is pretty important. The rest is just little details in our code, but if you want to mention the data type of Q as DEC, we can add DEC here, as well as our return value of DEC. Other than that, the Q we passed in in the beginning has just become completely empty in the code above, so we can also choose to override our Q with new values. You can use a list comprehension passing in D for data taking out each value in new queue using a for loop. Now the new values will replace the contents of our original queue, so we don't need to return anything. Now running the code, the values are correctly reversed to 4321 once again. So this is just another way of writing your code. These are just the small details, so as long as your reverse function works properly, it should be fine. See you in the next lecture. Today we'll be introducing a new data structure called a tree. The most well-known type of tree is a binary tree, and within that there are many types of binary trees. Binary search tree and heap are the most mainstream ones. These two are the most useful in creating algorithms, so we'll be focusing on them for this lecture. Let's look at the Wikipedia page for binary trees first. And here is a visual example of a tree. And if you scroll down, you can see you can see the different types of trees, and there are many types of trees here, like 2-3 trees and 2-3-4 trees, AA trees and ABL trees, so you see many different types of trees. But going back to the slide, for this lecture we'll be focusing on binary trees. I want to first give you a brief explanation of what binary trees are, but before that, some of you may already recognize the word binary, imagining the numbers 0 and 1. So, what binary trees do is keep dividing into two branches. So the starting node of a binary tree is called a root. And let's say this root contains the number 5. If this was a Python list, we would just have 5 at the root of our list. Then we can add 3, 1, 10, and other numbers into our list. In our binary tree data structure, we would add values like this three in a tree-like structure. And now let's add one here, and let's add on a ten here. We can add on more values to our tree. So let's put a nine here, and here we can put eight. So just like this, data continues to be added or connected in our two-branch structure in a binary tree. Our five here is our root, branching out into so branching into three like this is not an option here, or it won't be a binary tree anymore. So at all time from the root, we branch out the first time, the second time like right here, and no more branches. Adding more, we can put our new node here, for example. As long as there are no more than two branches coming from one node, binary trees are created like this. And once again, I think it's easier to understand while looking at actual code. But before that, we'll dive into the binary search tree using a visual. Let's get started with our explanation for the binary tree. 
説明していきたいんですけどもまずインプットでこれ3 6 5 7 1 1 2と入ってきますよね。でそうしましたら最終的になる形がですね、まあ、このようになるんですけどもちょっとですね、まあ、これ一つ一つステップを確認しながらやっていきたいと思いますでまずですねこちら3が入ってきますよねこれインプットで3が入ってきたらこれがルートということでこれ3が入ってくるんですが、まあ、次6が入ってきますねで6が入ってくるときにこの3と6を比べて6の方が大きいということであればこれ3の右手にですね枝を作るなので6が入ってくると右手にこれを出すで次に5が入ってきますよね。で5が入ってきたら3と5を比べたら5の方が大きいのでこちら5が右に行くんですね。で次6と5を比べた時に5の方が小さいですよね。でその場合には左に枝を作るということなので今度6の左にですね枝を作るわけですね。なのでテスライドが入るんですが5が左に付くということになります。でこのパターンで同様にやっていくと次7ですよね。で7と3を比べたら7の方が大きいので右に行き6と7を比べたら7の方が大きいのでこちらの右手に7が入るということでこちら7が入るんですね。で次1が入ってきますよね。で1が入ってきたら今度3と1を比べたら1の方が小さいので今度1がこの3の左側に付くわけですね。で次10が入ってきたらこれ同様にやっていくと、まあ、3と10を比べて10の方が大きいので右に6と10を比べて10の方が大きいので右に7と10を比べて10の方が大きいので右にということでこちらの右下に付そうしましたらこれ最後にですよね。で2が入ってきた場合には3と2を比べたら2の方が小さいので左に行きこちらに1があるので1と2を比べたら2の方が大きいので2の方がこちらの1の右手に行くと、まあ、このような形でバイナリーサーチ3構成されるということになりますでこれ何が利点かというとこれ例えばですね3657112ということでこれリストにアペンドしていったら、まあ、例えばですねこれ2を検索したいといったときにこれ先方からこれ数えていくと、まあ、2が最後になりますので遅いですよね、でもこのバイナリーサイズ3という構造であれば、まあ、1回目にこれ2を検索したいということで3と2を比べたらこの2というのは3よりも小さいので左側にあるんですよね。なのでこちらに移動してで今度1と2を比べて2の方が大きいので右手にあるはずだということでこれ右に行きますねそうするとここで1回ここで2回ということで、まあ、2回1区分で判定したらもうこちら2にたどり着きますよねこのようにすれば2の検索が早くなるということでこちらのバイナリーサイズ3には優れているというふうになりますねであとはこちら3 6 5 7 1 1 2を小さい順に並び替えてくださいと言った時にもですねこれ相当しなければいけないですがこのバイナリーサイズ3の構造を持っていれば、まあ、一番小さいのはこのルートから左の枝にあるはずなんですねなのでこちら1になるんですねでこの1の左の枝ってもうないですねこの場合には右に行くというようなルールを設けてきて次2が表示されますよねこの場合には左と右に枝ないのでこれ戻って戻って今度3を表示してこの3の左側も見たので右に行きますよねでこれ左に枝がある場合は左に行くので左に行ってこの5には左と右の枝がないのでこの右手の3の中でも一番小さいですよねなのでこれ5を表示して戻って6を表示してまた右に行ってこれ左に枝がないのでこちら7を表示してこちら10に行って左に枝がないので10を表示するというふうにすれば123567と10ということで小さい順に表示できるというのが利点もあるんですね。なのでこのようなデータストラクチャーを組むと、まあ、サーチにしろ、まあ、小さい順に表示するにしろ、まあ、やりやすいということでこちらのバイナリーサーチ、はい、そうしましたらちょっとデリートもやっていきたいんですけど例えばこのようなツリー構造があってこの1をです、ね、削除したいと思ったらこのツリー構造崩れますよねなのでちょっとです、ね、こちらのデリート1ということで1を削除してみたいんですけどもこの1を削除するときにはですねこれ左と右を見てですね左が何もツリーがないということであればこの2をですね、まあ、単純にこれ上に持っていけばいいですね。So、なので、ちょっとこれ切り替えるんですけども、1を削除したら、2をそのまま上に持っていくというふうにしてやれば OK ですね。なので、まあ、左には必ず小さいものがありますので。まあ、それがないのであれば右にあるものをこれ上にどんどんこれ持っていけばそれだけですよね。でこれ今左がないケースやったんですけども例えばこれ右がなくてですね左しかないというケースでも単純にこちら左のものを上に持っていくということをすれば OK なので、まあ、削除したいものの枝がどちらか片方しかないという場合には単純にこれを上に持っていけばそれで OK なのでね。まあ、ただし例えば右のようにこちらが6ありますよね。でこのようなケースでは5と7ということで両方あるんですがこの6を
So in our next video, we'll be implementing this binary search tree in our code. First, we have a node here and want to make each one of these nodes a class object. We'll write node here and we create a node class with death in it inside. As for what we pass in, for this first node here, we would be passing in a value of 3. So we put value here with type in it. Our return value should be none. We store the value we just passed in into a variable self value. Next up is self left. See how we have nodes to both the left and right side of this type node. We'll eventually put these nodes in, but for now we initialize self left as zero and the same for self right. And now we're done constructing our node object. As for smaller details, I made this value an integer and we have three, one, two here. And later on, we'll determine which one is bigger using integer. But for example, in the case that you want to use alphabetical characters instead, notice how a is less than b returns true. Testing the opposite expression, we can see that the character a is indeed less than b. So you can definitely include characters in your value. And in that case, we can import any from typing, change the type here to any. For our example today, we'll keep the type to an int. So I'll remove what I just wrote since we'll only be using integers and we'll be moving on to coding the structure of the binary search tree. And we could always start with creating a BST class from scratch. However, the process might seem too complex at first. So we'll start by creating the functions used in the binary search tree. So how will we approach this? We start our first function, insert with def insert and we'll add in the node and value as its parameters. So our node is of type node, and our value is of type int, like the three in our first node. We want our return value to be the root or our top node here. So our return value will be node. So to call this function, you first put an if statement with name and underscore underscore main. Our root does not store a value yet, so we put none. Then we override it by putting root equals insert root three. So now we store three into this root. At first root is none, but in this section, root becomes this three, causing this top node of three to be stored in root variable. Adding some code here, we put if node is none, and then that statement is true, we just return node with its value as a parameter. So in this case, this node containing three will be stored into this root variable. Now we want to add our node containing six. So replace three with six here. And how will we reflect this change? We'll do that right up here. First, we'll add an if statement. So we'll write if value and value is six. And we'll take the six and this top node containing our root here, which is three. We'll compare these two, and if this value of 6 is bigger than node value of 3, then it'll go to the right. And if smaller, it'll go to the left. So starting with the case that value is smaller, in node left, we store a recursive call to our insert, passing in node left, which currently only contains a value of none. This might seem confusing at first, but let me continue and write an else statement. So if that isn't our case, we would store insert passing in node right with its value of six in our case. Once we've done that, we return node to our function. This is our code and let me explain. This first root will match this first condition here, returning our root immediately. Next, we called insert 
and passed in our value of 6 here. When we pass in our 6, let's see which condition it meets. It meets this if value is less than node value. When we evaluate this condition here, our value is larger than node value, which will match with our else statement. So this node right or the node to the right of our root will store the return value from calling this insert function. So for this insert node right, the node we're currently at is our root node here. So the node to the right wouldn't store any value. So this is none and value is six. In our second iteration, this if statement will run. So six will be passed into our node value and return this value to store into node right. We have this three and to the right, six will be placed. And since this node is our root, this function will return the three in our root, storing three into this root variable here. The next node we're adding after six is going to be five. We're basically repeating the same process here. But to explain really quickly, we just added our node of values three and six. We're now adding this five. And right now, three and six are structured like so. Our root node that's passed in has a value of three. So when calling insert node, our node will be three and our value will be five. And down below, here node will be three and value will be five. This statement would evaluate to else, which would call for another node right. And when this node right is called, this node right now contains three, the node to the right contains six. So that means that this node right will store six and our value would be this five. So at the very beginning when three was called, for the node to its right, we just called insert. And we used i for insert for this with parameters six and five. And now it's just waiting for the return value. The return would just be our node right here. So that means it's gonna be the six. Return node would return six. So now we just stored six into node right. When we call this three for the right, the six will be returned. That's what we're storing in this node right right here. So this part should be pretty clear. Now this node of six and five are called and we enter another iteration of insert. This time our parameters will not be three, but instead it will be six and value will be kept at five. So our value here will be five and our node that was originally three will become six. Comparing these two, six is larger, so now we make a node left that stores insert node left value. So in calling insert, notice how there's no node to the right of six. So in this case, none will be passed into node left and five will be passed into value. When we run another iteration, if notice none is true, so we have to create a node to return. So our value of five will be returned as a node. Therefore, we'll be creating a new node containing five here, which will be returned this node containing six. The return value of the insert that we called here is five, so five will be returned. Then we store that return value into node left. We process through our code ending up at return node, which is six. We return six back up here, and when we call insert on the node before that, our value of the node used to be three, so our root containing three will be stored into our root variable here. This might be confusing the first time, so in that case, I recommend slowly reviewing each step. The recursion used over here may be the most difficult to understand, so reviewing that part on your own might be a good idea. Regarding this insert, for our next code, we'll be using the print function to print each value stored in root. We'll want to display the beginning value in our root. And when we run the code, we see the value three is printed. We just set up our node to contain three, six, five. So how do we print six? I'm going to copy the code above, and this time we're gonna say root right value, which would have to be our node of six on the right. We'll run our code and we get three and six, confirming that our code works properly. Again, based on the three, six, five structure, we have here, we copy this line and change this to root, right, left value. Now we get three, six, five. And notice how we have these nodes contain three, six, and five set up, but no nodes to the left of the root. So what if we add an additional print statement with root left value? In this case, no nodes are set up here, 
So we get an error code, none type, object has no attribute value. Let's now remove value and print root left instead. And once we run the code, we see none is printed. We can see that the structure of binary search tree is reflected nicely in our code. And erasing our print statements, let's go ahead and copy these lines and altering them into our binary search tree structure on the right. We have five, seven, one, 10, and two to complete our structure. So now when we print root left value and running the code, what do we get? We get one properly printed. Next, we wanna look at the root left right, which would be this two. Changing the print statement to root left right value and running the code, we get two printed. We can really see that our binary search tree is set up properly in this tree structure through our code, which means that our insert function was programmed properly. In the next lecture, we'll be covering the searching portion of our binary search tree. And now underneath our insert function definition, we're making a new function called in order, passing in a node. For example, we could pass in our root nodes, then print its contents through this function. Working with a binary search tree, say we pass in our root node of three here. The in order function will first look to its left. And if there's no value to its left, we return one and look to the right. That's the order we refer to with this in order. And as usual, I'll explain while writing the code since it'll make it easier to understand. First, we put if node is not none, because if node is none, we wouldn't have to run this function. That's why we're writing this as the condition. And after that, we recursively call our in order function. Let's say our node containing three was passed into our function. We first want to look to its left child, so we pass in node left. We then call in order on node left, which does not have a value of none. So we move over to this node containing one. We recursively call in order on its node left, but now it will not pass our if statement here. So we'll no longer call in order. Then we print node value. And after displaying our value here, we want to move to the right. So we put in order node right. This code is quite simple, but also complex. So now let's erase the print statements from our last video and test out our in order function by passing in our root. We'll write in order root. And running the code below, we get one, two, three, five, six, seven, and 10. The value of our nodes were just printed in ascending order. Our in order function only has a couple of lines, but you can see how well it works if you understand recursion. So basically starting from our root, we look to its left until there are no more nodes to the left. Once node becomes none, we move on to the print statement. Think of this as a mini triangle with its root printed. Once it's printed, we move to its right, which is this, is by calling in order on node right. Using recursion, we'll eventually return to this node containing three. So we print the three through this print statement, then move over to the right. So we've completed the logistics of our in order function, but one thing to keep in mind, I'll write as a comment here. In in order functions, it's a basic principle to look to the left, then root, then right. In something called a pre-order, we always look at the root, look to the left, then look to the right. We also have something called a post order, which we always look to the left, to the right, then to the root. This is just some background information that's nice to remember. So just know that in our case, we look to the left. If nothing is on the left, we print this root here, then we look to the right. In binary searches where we want to print numbers from smallest to biggest, we'll use this in order function. Now let's eliminate two, five, seven, 10 and use three, one, six. Our in order function will first print one, then three, then this six. That's the in order. Pre-order looks at root, left, right. So that means the three, then the one, then the six. Post-order will look at this one to the left, six on the right, then pin three. So these pre-orders and post-orders are just something to keep in mind for a future reference. 
in order is the most well-used function, which is the one we're working on today. And now moving on to the search function. So underneath here, we put death search, passing in our root node, as well as the int value we are searching for as a parameter. This function will return a Boolean, telling us whether or not they found the expected value. So first, if the root node that we passed in had a value of none, we cannot find that node, so we return false. So we'll write if node is none, return false. Next, we'll look at the value of the node we passed in. If the value of the node we passed in was equal to the value we wanted to search, we can just return true right there. To make this easier to understand, let's give an example of how to call this function. I'm going to comment out this line and let's print our call to search, passing in our root node, followed by the value of three from our top. And we're going to run the code and we obviously get true. Our value of three was at the top in our root node. So this if statement would return true. Testing a different case like this one here, we would have to look at the left child as well. So in the case that we want to search one, we need an L if our condition being node value being greater than value. When that's true, we recursively call search. We need to look at its left child. So we pass in node left and value through its parameters. So now let's change this three to a one, which will let us search for a value of one. When search is called at first, this if statement doesn't run. The node at the top is three, so three does not equal one. Our if statement here will not run. Our third if statement here will run since one is smaller, so we call search. This node left will be one, and our value will also be one. So now in our next iteration of search, this if statement of if node value equals value will become true. Now we can return true to the top. Now let's run this code and we can see that it properly returns true, telling us that a node containing one does exist. Now instead of the three, let's look at the value six. We'll rewrite this to six. And in our search function, we add the opposite of this if statement through an L if, this time node value being less than value. We put return a call to search, passing in node right. We basically just switch one part up and running the code, we search for six and we get true. We're using recursion in this situation, which allows us to look at the number after one, the number after this three, and the number after six, which is five. Let's try the same thing with five now. And running the code, we probably get true printed in our console. Let's try searching for a number that doesn't exist, like four. Running our code, we get the proper result false. This confirms that our search function here is working properly. In this lecture, we applied recursion. If you are confused about some of the concepts introduced here, I recommend reviewing this on your own as well. And in our next lecture, we'll be going over the delete function in the binary search tree. Next, we'll be going over the delete function. I'm going to open up some space after the search function, and we're going to start from here. I'm going to put def remove, passing in node of type node, and the value you want to delete. Let's think about how we'll call this function. To call this function, let me scroll down below and erase this print statement. And calling remove, let's say our node has a value of none, meaning our root is none. So for now, I'm going to change this root and rewrite it to none. And let's say one is the value you want to remove, but right now we're unable to remove this value. So let's start adding the code for this case. We'll say if node is none, followed by a return of the top node. Let's say the following data was already added, constructing the visual to the right. When we want to delete one from it, we need to be able to locate the node containing one first. The process for this is the same as our search function from our last video. So if value is less than node value, we recursively call remove on node left, passing in the same value. When we keep calling remove, Ultimately, we'll end up with a node containing none, which in that case will return node. If node is none, we'll return node. So here in our node left, we'll place our remove into node left. 
We'll review this more in detail later on. And now we'll do the opposite direction. We add an elif with value greater than node value. When that is true, into node write, we store our recursive call to remove passing in node write and our value. Below here, in the case that we want to remove one, we first go to our root containing three. We go to this root three and running this if statement. So when this remove function is called again, node left will become one with our value, which is also one. So when this remove function is called again, these if statements and elif statements will run since node left equals value. We'll write this section from now and to account for the situation, we put else, which is the case that we are able to locate one and we want to delete it. At this time, we type if node left is none, like how no node exists to the left of this one. In that case, we would delete one and bring this two up here. So we just put return node right. That's all we have to do. And node right in this case is this two, which will be returned to this node left right here. So now we have this three here and two will be located to the left of three. And now in the case that this two doesn't exist as a right child and instead a left child exists, we can just do the opposite of what we just went over. So we put L if node right is none. And when that condition is true, we just have to return node left. This may have been confusing, so just to clarify, here are three with a one to the left and a two to the right of the one. In this case, this if statement will run. So when we delete this one here, we bring this two up here, which is what these two lines are doing. As for the lines below it, let's say we have a three here with a one here. And now instead of having a node to the right, we have, let's say, a zero to the left. In this case, when we delete this one here, we replace zero to be the left child of our root node of three. So this is what these two lines are doing. The replacing process is done through these lines with node left equals and node right equals. So our code should probably account for these situations. Now we're accounting for cases outside of these if elif statements, like when we want to delete this six here, for example. In this case here, we have five and seven on both sides, which we will be accounting for in our next portion of our code. And to do that, we first want to add another function up here. So I'll scroll up and starting with def min value, passing in a node, which allows us to find the node containing the smallest value. For instance, when deleting this six, we will be bringing up this seven. But if a child existed to the left of seven, like a smaller number, we would have to locate that child and replace the five instead. We'll check out such cases later, but starting with the code, we store our current node in variable current. Then by putting a while loop of current left, we can keep iterating until we find the node containing the smallest value under the node we pass in here. So we run this while loop in the condition that current left is not none will eventually reach a value of none. But until then, we'll keep putting current left into current and searching down each node. This way, the minimum value will eventually be stored into current, which we will return by putting return current. In our example here, there are no nodes to the left of seven. So our minimum value will be seven after we delete six. To save that value down here, we create a temp storing min value passing in our current node right. We want to try calling remove down here. So instead of removing one, we replace the value with six. In this case, when we call it remove, we go down each node with this if statement. So we look at three, going to the right, we reach six, which matches our expected value, which runs our else statement here. Then this min value is called, passing in this right child of six. And seven is the right child of six. After that, there are no nodes to the left, so seven will be stored into temp. Now put node value, which is currently six, and in node value, we store the value of temp. So we just took this value seven to be placed inside the node that contains six. 
Now that we've done that, we store our call to remove into node write. This time, passing in node write and temp value, which is seven in our current case. Regarding this remove, this temp value is seven, and when we bring seven up here, this number ten below will be placed again underneath seven as the right child of seven. This is what we're doing with this recursive call. So here, node right is seven, and temp value would also be seven. So when we call remove again, there are no nodes to the left of seven. So this if statement of if node left is none will be true, returning node right. This node right will be this ten in our case. So ten will be returned and set here. This might take a bit to process, but this is how our function works out. And finally, we return to the function by putting return node here, which will return the root node from when we first called our function. Down here, we'll store this call to remove into root, so that the root node after we remove six will properly be stored into root. Then by calling in order root, we could print out the nodes after the values are removed. So now we want to test our code out. Here we want to print our root by calling in order before we delete our value. And here we add some shards before we remove our values just to clarify. Previously we passed in none into remove, but now we are passing in root, which we just added above. Then we print out our new nodes by calling in order again. Let's run our code. And here are the results. We get one, two, three, five, six, seven, ten. And above here, you can see we're now removing six from our binary search tree. Below, we can see that six is not printed anymore. This confirms that six was properly removed through our remove function. Next, I'm going to explain this min value function a little bit further. When we deleted six from our binary search tree, we only need to bring seven up here. However, if seven had a branch to its left, like so, we can't simply bring seven up here. Through min value, we would have to search for the smallest value, bringing that value up here. Let's say we have three at the top here. We'll put six to the right and five to the left. And to the right, let's put a value a lot bigger than seven, like 20. To the right of that, we have 30. And to the left of 20, let's put 18. And underneath 18, let's put 16, followed by 14. So in this case, a branch of nodes stretched down to the left of 20. When we delete six in this case, if we simply bring 20 up here, 20 will come here, but you can see that values like 14 will remain in the left of 20, even though their values are smaller. This is clearly a problem. So surpassing 20, we go down the branch looking to the left. We go down each branch, bringing this 14 up here. Then our binary search tree would not have any problems. This node will store 14 and this will be removed. And since 16 is larger than 14, we look at this 20 first before finding it down the left branch. 16 is larger than 14, so this will work out. When you encounter cases like these, we find the smallest node on the very left and then bring it up here, which our function min value allows us to do, like with this 14 here. Once we find the smallest value, this node value line allows us to replace values like the 14 moving up to the node formerly containing 6. Hopefully you're able to see the many cases that we have to account for in our remove function. Some parts may be difficult to understand, but really visualizing the process will help you understand this remove portion here. Now that we went over our remove function, our next lecture we'll be working on moving all of these functions into our classes instead of separate functions. In our previous lectures, we've created functions like remove and many other functions, but now we're going to put these functions into a class. We start off creating a new class by writing class binary search tree. So now we've created our class and here we have our init method with def init self. To initialize, we put self root having no value at first, so we store none. Then we have these functions down below and we'll just include them into our class. Moving these lines over one more time, they'll act as inner functions to recursively call. So on top, we put def insert, and since this is a class, we'll put self. 
We don't need to pass in a node, just our value like so. You don't need a return statement for this function, so we'll put none. Right now, our insert function here and inner function here have the same name. So let's add an underscore to the inner function. And let's add underscores in the code where we call the inner function as well. So this completes our inner function. And before we run these inner functions, there are some things we need to check. First, what we need to check is if self root is none when we insert. In that case, we can just store our value in self root. And then we just return. Then let's look at when self root isn't none. If self root isn't none, we would have to use this inner function accordingly. So we call the inner function insert and I'll write it down here as insert. And this is an inner function and passing in self root and our value. And this insert function is the exact same function we have been using. It's just that we turned it into a class method using inner functions. We'll apply the same process to our other functions. So here we'll shift the function over once and then another time. To make this an inner function, we copy this line and for the outer in order function, and our method is in order and we need to pass in self and we don't need to pass in a node, so we just delete it. Return value is kept at none. Below, we want to make this an inner function, so we add an underscore here, adjusting the other lines here as well. Now we just need to call this function, so we'll put in order, passing in self root. Now that we've completed this, search down below will be done in the same way as well. We want to make this an inner function, so we'll shift these lines over twice. Then we'll copy the search function header and our outer function pass in self since it's a class method and we don't need to pass in node. We'll add underscores to our inner function and fix our error lines in red by adding an underscore. Now these will refer to our inner function. Then we return search passing in self root and value. This function should now work properly. And regarding this min value function below, we'll also make it a class function. And for this, we don't need an inner function. So we just add in self. We just call this function from remove. So we just needed to put this function inside our class. For this remove function too, we shift it over once and then another time, setting up our adder function. We pass in self. So I'll write self here and delete our node parameter since we don't need to pass it in, leaving value in. We don't need to return our root anymore, so we can just change this to none. Let's fix the inner function's name again with an underscore. Once again, changing the recursive call to refer to the inner functions. Here too, we'll add an underscore, changing the recursive call to refer to the inner function. And this min value will now be changed to self min value. This will also refer to our inner function by adding an underscore. Now we finish off putting remove, passing in self, and value. And now moving down below, previously we always started off with root as none. This time we add binary tree, initializing it to the binary search tree we just created earlier. Now we call the insert within our binary tree, inserting three. Copying this line after inserting three, we insert our number shown on the right. So we'll add six, five, seven, one, ten, and then finally two. Once we inserted all of our values, let's erase our old code. And now we call in order within our binary tree class. And now we're going to run the code. For our results, we get 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 10. So our values were printed correctly. Let's try calling search from our binary tree, searching for an existing value like 6 and printing the return. We'll run our code and we have true printed on the bottom. Now let's search for four, which doesn't exist in our tree. And now we get false, which is correct. Now down below, instead of search, let's try calling remove from our binary tree, removing the value six, which is a number we previously used. Let's distinguish the change by printing this extra line with remove, then rechecking the tree is binary tree in order. Now we'll run the code. And when we do, these are our results. We have 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 10 with false from our search function. 
Then we remove the 6, which explains why 6 is included here. This proves our function is working properly. So in this lecture, we adjusted our function to belong in our binary search class. If putting the methods in a class makes more sense to you, expressing your binary search tree as a class may be a good idea. Now that we finished going over our binary search tree, we will move on to the next lecture. In this lecture, we'll be going over heaps. Written here is mini heap. And let me explain. Looking at the overall heap structure here, the smallest value comes to the top. Notice how this 6 here is greater than 1. And this 9 here is greater than 6. This 13 is also greater than 6. The higher you go up, the smaller the values become in this tree structure. And this is what a mini heap is. There's also a structure called a max heap, which makes sure the higher up, the greater the values. If you understand mini heaps in this lecture, max heaps are just the opposite. So let's jump right into mini heaps. Our inputs for this are 5, 6, 2, 9, 13, 11, 1. Before we begin creating this tree structure from these inputs, one key aspect of this structure that is useful to remember is that once we have this top node, the next node goes on the left. So it would be the 6. And the next node goes on the right. So next up would be this left node here, then the right, then this left, then this right. Each node branches down into two nodes, which is a key characteristic of mini heaps. These details on the left here, I'll explain later. So let's move on to the different rules we apply to create this tree structure. First off, from our input, we have this 5, which we directly put in. Next, we have 6, which we just plop down to the left. When we compare 6 and 5, 5 is smaller, so we don't have to rearrange anything. Next up is this 2. The right branch of this 5 is open, so we just place the 2 there. And at this time, we compare 2 and 5, and 2 is smaller, so we have to swap their positions. So as you see here, we've switched the positions, like so in our next slide. And 2 is at the very top. Since 5 is greater than 2, 5 comes down here to correct the structure. After that, we have this 9 which we place down here to the left. Once the left and right branches are filled, we would have to add this 9 here. Comparing 9 and this 2 and 6, 9 is greater so we don't have to rearrange anything. Next we have 13 and we add it to this open space on the right here. 13 is also greater than 6 and 2, so we can keep it in this location. Next up is 11. 11 will be placed in the next open position here. 11 is also greater than 2 and 5, so no need to rearrange. Lastly, we have this 1. We would first place it down to the right here, but we can see that 1 is smaller than 5 and also smaller than 2. So this 1 needs to move up here. In this case, we swap 1 and 5, making 1 go up a layer. Even after doing that, we can see that 1 is smaller than 2, so we swap their places again, now making 1 end up at the very top. So this process of comparing and swapping is the key to mini heaps. Next, we're going to go over something called popping. In mini heaps, popping refers to when we remove this top node of the hierarchy. According to mini heap rules, this node would be the smallest value. So removing this would remove the smallest value. As a key characteristic of mini heaps, let's say we were system engineering and using a ranking system to find what ranks at the top. At times when there is a hierarchy, popping makes it easier to remove that top value out of a designated order. And in this case, we'd be removing the smallest value. Let's look at how our structure shifts from doing that. So first, we would be removing this one. After that, we shift our focus to the very last value in our list. So we would bring this value up here. So let's bring this five up here for now. Once that's done, we notice that this two is smaller than this five even though it's below a layer, but the 6 is fine as it is. When comparing 6 and 2, this smaller number needs to be swapped with this top node. So comparing 2 and 5, 2 is smaller, so we swap their places. So now 2 and 5 are in these positions, and the smallest number is at the top. This process we just did is called heapify, where we bring the very last value up to the top and swap values to adjust the structure according to the rules. 
I'll clarify this process with code in the next portion of our video. So here's our final mini heap structure. How are these values expressed in a list? We first have this root here, then we go left, right, left, right, left, right. So inside our list here, this top value of one goes here. This minus x here will work with further in our code, but it basically has the smallest number in our system. After that, we would have this one here, and next is this six here. And then our two comes here. Then this nine goes here, this 13 goes here, this 11 goes here next, and finally our five goes here, completing the storage into our list. We'll use this index number list and later on do things like swap one and two. The first index number is zero, followed by one through seven in order. Let's take this six as an example. This six has an index number of two, as seen above here. Once we know its index number, the index number of its parent can be calculated with what we see here on the left hand side here. So we see here for the parent, two, two slashes, two, which is division where the answer is truncated to an integer. One slash would make it a float, but two slashes make it an integer, which would make our answer one. Two divided by two is one. So the index number of this parent is one. If you see up here, in index number one, we have the value one. That's why this parent is one. Now, what about this left child of six, which is this nine? Here we see the left child is solved through two times two equals four. The index number of six is two. So when we multiply that two by two, we get an index number of four. Looking at the list above, nine is indeed located in that index number. This confirms why nine belongs here in the tree structure. For the child next to it, we just need to add one. So for this right child of six, we do two times two and adding one after that to make five. So looking up here to see what value is in index five, we properly get 13. That's why we have 13 in this tree structure. Applying the same process here or any part of the structure, just remember that these principles on the left will work every time. In the next lecture, we'll be using these principles to swap positions with parents and other related ideologies. Hopefully, seeing the concepts we learned from the visual applied to code will improve your understanding. And now let's move on to our next lecture and start writing our code. For this lecture, let's start with creating a new mini heap class. For this mini heap class, inside we'll put death in it. And for our initial setup, we prepare a list by saying self heap. The beginning of our list must contain the smallest possible value, so we put negative one. And multiplying this by what we are just going to import, we import sys above here and back down here, we multiply negative one by sys max size. And our initialization is complete. So what exactly are we doing here? As usual, underneath we'll put if name underscore underscore main, and our heap will be h for short. Then we'll put print h heap, running the code, we see an extremely small number printed here. We'll be inputting our data based on this number later, which is why we use this sys max size this time. Moving on to the size of our heap, we also want to save this value as self current size. Technically, the size would be the smallest possible size calculated here but only counting data in our heap, our current size would be zero. So we store zero for now, and we just made this portion here with negative x. Now we're implementing this portion that I explained earlier with the parent, left child, and right child. First, we want these principles recorded. So let's start with death parent index, and we pass in our index number of type int with our return value, which is also of type int, since we want to return the resulting index number. For example, in this visual here, the six is currently in the index number two. Passing this value in, our method would return the index number of the parent node, which is one. So now we'll put return index divided by two. Two slashes indicating int division, which will return the index number of the parent. In the same way, we create left child index, which we also pass in the index and return an int. 
This time we put return with two multiply by index. After this, we'll put def right child. Do the same thing, passing an index and a return value of int. Our return is two times index plus one. So this code corresponds to these principles written blue. Previously, when we placed this one at the very bottom of our tree, we had to move one up here by swapping values. So we are creating a method to take care of that process. So first we put def swap, passing in the index number of the value we want to swap places with. Add the index of the value getting swapped to, which would be our two parameters. Now we check if there are values already in self heap. And if so, we swap the contents in index one of self heap with index two of self heap. So on the other side, we write out self heap index two followed by self heap index one so that the contents are replaced. So we just added the method for swapping. By using the swap method we just created, we want to be able to move values up the tree like we did with our one. For this, we'll use a method called heapify up. Heapify basically means swapping values. Here we pass in the index of the value you want to swap with. And here we'll use a while loop. We put while self parent index, passing in index, and we run the loop while it's greater than zero. What this means is, let's say we have two at the very top, followed by five, and we want to input one in here. We would first put one here in the very bottom, but we want to keep bringing this one until it reaches the very top. So this is what the condition self parent index index greater than zero is making sure after each iteration as it moves up a layer. So now we compare our one with its parent, which is five. And if one is smaller, we swap the position of one and five. We repeat the same process with our while loop. So our one comes up here and then our five comes down here. Then we compare this one and two and we swap their positions too. We just compare the value of the two nodes, and if one is smaller, then we always swap positions. Now let's implement this process in our code. So we would compare the call to self heap on the index of the value we're at, and the self heap self parent index index, which is the index of the parent value above. And if the parent value is greater, we need to swap the values. So we call swap on the index we're at and the index of its parent. Having these two as the parameters will ensure that their positions will be swapped. So now we want to look at each value with a while loop. So we replace the value of index with its parent index. Now we can go up the tree checking every value that needs to be swapped. Now let's use our heapify function to also add some values. But first, we'll make a new function called push, passing in the value you want to push in. And then regarding our return value, our return value is going to be none. And first, we'll say self heap, containing this empty list, or technically this value we set up here. We want to add a value using append first. So we put value inside, and we add one to self current size. We'll refer to this later on. We then put self heapify up, which is the method we just created. We put in the index number of the value we just passed in. So the current size we just initialized can also act as our index number. Let's try adding a value with our push function. We call push on mini heap. Let's try using the value five. Then we'll print min heaps heap and run our code. We can see that our smallest value with sysmax and the five that we added are printed. We basically just added it with push, appending it through this line and increasing current size by one. When we call self heapify up, our parent index becomes zero. So that means that we'll exit this while loop here. Now this time I'm going to copy this line and let's try adding six this time and running our code. Below we get five, six. Six was appended through this append statement 
And since we don't need to rearrange the positions, we didn't need to run these lines in heapify up. Let's now try adding a smaller number like 2. Let's call push on 2 and run the code. Below, we see the 2 that was appended last was rearranged into 2, 6, 5. So the numbers have been rearranged. Let's look into this a little more. We originally had the numbers 5 and 6 here. But when we added 2 here, we compared 2 and 5, which 2 is smaller. The two then swap positions. Originally, our list contained 5 and 6. But since 2 entered here, this 2 and this 5 ended up swapping. Our order became rearranged to, therefore, 2, 6, and 5. This confirms that our heapify up method up here is working properly. So even when the tree keeps expanding like this, we can repeat the same process through the while loop until we reach the parent. And this is done through this heapify up push section. So now that we finished our push function, we have the smallest number, which is this one. And this time we're going to remove this one here with the pop function. So now I'm going to open up some space here. And this time our function name will be pop. We'll be removing the smallest value so our return value will be an int. So I'll write int here, and first we put if len self heap. If self heap only contains the value we put in with the sysmax, our length would be one. So in that case, we can return right away. In that case, we wouldn't be returning an int, so we go up here, importing optional from typing. This way, we let the compiler know that none could be a possible return value too. Let's move this optional importing line up here and return to our inworks code over here. So we would immediately return if the heap only contained the sysmax value. But if that's not the case, we remove the first number in self heap. So meaning this index number one. We return this value that we're removing back to pop. So we save that into root. So in our case, looking at our list here, this will refer to this one. This one is the smallest value in our heap. And through this line, we just saved that value into root. Now we can just return that value by putting return root. Once we pop that value out, you take the very last value in self heap, which in our case would be this five. We have to move this five up here and rearrange this entire tree structure. So we just got the last value in our tree through pop or referring to our list here. In our case, it's the five. We save this into a variable data for now. And after that, and next we'll say, if self heap after you move the value only has one value left, we can just return the root. What this means is that let's say we start with negative x. And after that, we only have one data. Once we pop that last data, the length of our list would be one. At this moment, we no longer need to restructure our tree, so we can just return root and be done. If that's not the case, so say we have one, six, two, nine, 13, 11, five. We have this line with data, and this line with data just popped out this five here. At this moment, we still need to restructure the tree. So we'll do that in our next portion of our code. And how will we do that? We'll do that by putting self heap one, and we change the very first value into five. So in self heap one, we store data. The heap will change into what I wrote in this comment, where we brought the five to the front. We just remove data using the pop function, so we decrease current size by one by putting negative equals one. Now we have to implement heapify down, where we will need to move this 5 down to its appropriate position. We have this 2 here right now, instead of up here where this 5 is. So here we add a new function, and this new method name is going to be called heapify down, passing in an index number of 1, which would be this 5 right up here. So through this function, we want to move 5 down to its intended position. We'll do that by maybe above our function here, 
starting with def heapify down. We pass in our index number, so we put index int, and the return value is none. Now we make a while loop just like we did with heapify up. Our condition this time is self left child index, and passing in index being less than or equal to self current size. We continue to run this loop while this condition applies, and our while loop will move the 5 down by running on this condition. To clarify, using pop, we move the 5 here, and we have 6 here, and 2 here, and 9 here, and 13 here, and 11, and originally we had our 5 over here. We had 1 here at first, but we popped the 1, and this 5 that was originally here, we moved this 5 to the top. And now we need to restructure our tree. So when we compare this 6 and 2, 2 is smaller, so we have to swap these two values. And as a result, this becomes 2 and this becomes a 5. We've swapped these two values around, and now that we've done that, we need to compare 5 and 11, which we don't have to swap as of now, since 5 is smaller. We continue this process until there's no longer a left child, which in that case, there are no more values to check. So this condition here, comparing self left child index with self current size, ensures that we continue this process until that point. This is easier to understand following the code. So now let's move on to the code. We're actually adding one more function here, which is min child. With this function, we want to find the smallest value in the tree. We previously moved five up to the very top, and when we do that, 2 is the smallest number in this tree, so we have to bring 2 to the very top. So this min child will bring us this minimum value in our tree. So up here we create one more function with def min child, passing in index and returning an int, which would be the index of our smallest value. We want to work on our method first. So first, we compare the left and right on the bottom, comparing which one is smaller. To do this, we'll put if self heap, and our left child's index will be found with self left child index, passing in our index. We want to compare this index with the right child. So first, I want to go down a line, so we surround that with parentheses. We put self heap this time with self right child index, passing in our index. We just need to return the index with the smaller value. If the left child is smaller, we return self left child index. If the right child is smaller, in that case, we return self right child index. With these lines, we can now easily retrieve the index of the smallest value. Next, like I've demonstrated earlier, say we have our 5 here, 6 here, and 2 here. Comparing 6 and 2, 2 is smaller, so through this min child, we'll return the index that this 2 is located. What if we had, let's say, 9 here, 13 here, and 11 here, with nothing to its right? Originally, we had our 5 here, but there are some cases where we only have a left child. In this case, we have to return this value on the left. So when this 2 does not own a right child, in that case, we would have to return this 11 as the smallest value. Basically, if you have a left value but no value to compare on the right, we can just return the left. This case is pretty straightforward, and we just return the left value. If both the left and right child exists, in that case, we would have to compare the two like we did with the 6 and 2. This is accounted for in these lines, so let's write the code accounting for when the right child doesn't exist from now. Our condition for this will be when self right child index surpasses self current size, which would mean there is nothing on the right. So in that case, we would return the index of self left child index. And then this if statement will account for when there's only one child and when they're both children. Now in our heapify down method, we can say the return value of our call to self min child. If minchild index is clear to you, we can change the method name to add index at the end. Now that we save the index of minchild, the rest is pretty simple. We put if self heap with our current index. So if 5 was at the very top, 
we would pass in the index our 5 is located in. Our condition is, if 5 is greater than self-heap, passing the index that the smallest value is located. So if a value smaller than 5 exists, we just need to swap positions. So we pass in our index and the index of min child, and swap their positions. So now we keep moving down the tree. We now overwrite index with the index number of min child, and eventually move 5 down to its intended location. This is how this heapify down will work. Now let's begin trying out the code we created down in main. We originally have 562 appended, so let's add in the rest of the data from our visual on the right. So after 562, we have 9, 13, then 11, and 1. Let's run what we have so far. And we get the result 1, 6, 2, 9, 13, 11, 5 which is exactly the same as our visual. Like here, we see them ordered in the same way. Our heap is properly structured thanks to our heap phi up. Now that we've confirmed this, let's go under here and print min heap pop. Our pop function will take out our value at the very top and restructuring our entire tree. So after we print and pop, let's check our heap with print min heap heap again. Running the code, our original structure of the heap is shown here. Through pop, we took out the very top value of our tree like this. Now looking at our current heap, the smallest value is this 2. Here we can see that the 2 has successfully moved up here. The rest of the values in our heap are properly structured as well, which confirms that we can properly delete values from our heap. Out of this lecture, the concept of heapify may have been especially hard to understand we kind of breeze through it. So I recommend reviewing what is run on each line and how the values are swapped using Heapify. Using both the code and maybe jotting it down on paper, really tracking how each value is swapped is a good idea. So heaps are quite a difficult concept to master. So maybe you'll be able to avoid getting asked about heaps in interviews, although I can't guarantee it. Binary search trees are more often asked in interviews in most cases, so if you found heaps difficult, you could try to focus on understanding binary search trees first. Now let's move on to our next lecture. For this lecture, we're going to do a quick quiz on heaps, but before that, I want to introduce the heap queue that's built into the Python standard library. And scrolling down here, we can see heap queue, heap push here or heap pop, which are both heap functions we created last time, except these methods are already implemented into the library. And here we have heapify, where this heapify here passes into a list, then makes that into a heap for us. There are many other heap methods as well. I like to start the quiz after we look through a couple of these methods. In this lecture, we're focusing on heap queue, but if you recall learning about binary search trees, in our previous lecture before heaps. The standard library for binary search trees actually are not in Python. Python doesn't necessarily need the binary search tree since lists and dictionaries are already built in, allowing us to already have several sorting procedures. However, heap queues is a unique tool for ranking data or finding the min or max, hence its existence in the standard library. Now let's move on to our code for today's quiz. Before we start the actual quiz, first we'll import heap queue and review a few methods. Here we put in some random numbers into a list. We'll put in numbers like 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. It can be any kind of numbers. Then we'll initialize heap data. And now we're going to convert the data above into a heap. We put 4 num in numbers to retrieve the numbers in our list and we want to insert them into heap data that we have right here. In order to do this, we'll write heap queue, heap push, which is the method we saw earlier. And then we pass in heap data to tell it where to insert and pass in the numbers as well. So now the code above will structure our data into a heap. And let's say we want to retrieve the numbers. For this, we'll say while heap data and to print out the numbers in the heap, We'll write a print statement with the function heap q heap pop 
to pop out each number, specifying heap data. And let's run our code with this. And when we run our code below, we see the results and they are listed as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. All the numbers are in ascending order. As soon as we call heap push, the data is input into heap data in the form of a heap. And to pop the numbers back out, we use heap pop. And now in between these lines, let's put a print statement printing heap data just to make things a little easier. And running our code, our data is printed as 0126354789 in the form of a heap still in the tree structure. From there, we made the console print each of these numbers in ascending order. Let's comment out our code above for now. And on the top and scrolling to the top, we have numbers here, which contains a list of numbers. If you want to directly change this into a heap, we can write heap q heapify, passing in our numbers. Now when you print numbers and run the code, we get these numbers structured into a heap tree. By doing this, instead of printing each number with heap push, we can simply use heapify and put numbers into a heap tree structure all at once. So as you see here, it's not necessary to create heap data and then use heap push. Now let's go over a few more methods. We'll put print heap q, calling n largest, which prints out the three largest numbers from numbers. And erasing these lines now and running the code, we get the largest three numbers of 987. And copying this line over, we change this to n smallest. Now with n smallest, we run the code and we get the smallest three numbers of 0, 1, 2. As you can see, by using this heap q, we can access these methods allowing us to find the largest and smallest values. So these methods in heap q might be useful to remember later. Let's now move on to the quiz. The quiz for this lecture does not use n largest or n smallest. We don't want to use either of these and let's say we have a list of words that contain words like Python, C, Java, Go, Python again, and C again, Go again, and Python once again. The value that occurs most frequently in this list is Python, as we see it once, twice, and three times. Next up would be the C and the C here, as well as the Go and Go over here. This list contains programming languages, and these three will be the top three most frequently appearing programming languages in our list but there's only one value of Java here. So the problem for this lecture is we want to create a ranking of the most frequent values in the list by using heap q functions. The requirement here is to refrain from using n largest and n smallest in your code. Other methods such as heapify and heap push and heap pop are free to use. And we'll be using this for our next problem, but tuples, can also use heaps as well. As you can see here, we declare a list h here, and in heap push, we pass in h, and we specify the front value as an int using tuples. After that, we pass in write code as our string. We repeat this pattern of passing in a number, then string, a number, then string, and we call heap pop after that, the value with our smallest number one, write spec, will be returned like so. So using tuples alongside the heap push function will allow you to do things like this. I'll be utilizing this in our next problem, so I recommend keeping this concept in mind as well. If you would like to solve this problem on your own first, go ahead and pause this video. And from now, I'll begin going over the code. First, we'll write our function name. And for this time, we're gonna name our function as top n with heap since we're ranking the top n values. We'll pass in words, which is a list containing strings, and n, which will be an int. For example, if you want the top three, then we say n is three, and so on. The return value is also a list containing strings. Now below, we import our list with from typing import list. By doing this, we can see the error line here disappear. And let's erase the extra lines of code here and then on the bottom portion, 
we'll put if name underscore underscore main and inside main we have our words list. Actually, let's change it to W. When calling our method, we would just put top n with heap. Passing in our list and let's say for this example, specifying for the top three with our other parameter. We'll print out our return value with a print statement around it. And now let's start writing our function. First, we want to be able to count. For example, how many pythons are in our list? One way to do this, we can declare a dictionary here and put for word in words, running through each value of the list with a loop. In our dictionary, we put our word as our key and we want to add one, but when there's no value matching the word, we'll get a key error. So we put d get word to check if we have the word from d. And if there's no match, we just return zero. So if the word is not in our list, zero is returned. And when it is, we add one to return the number. And next we'll write print d and then we'll run the code. And when we do, we get three pythons, two c's, one java, and two goes allowing us to count each word. This is one way to do it. Another way to do it is to say from collections and import a class called counter. This lets us do the same exact thing. So commenting this portion out, we'll put counter word. And all we have to do is pass in words into our counter class. Next, we'll print counter word and then we're ready to run the code. In the counter class, we get three pythons, two Cs, two Go's, and one Java. So this is another way to count the words. In this lecture, what we want to generate is the top three most frequent words. And in counter word, there's a method called most common. And we can do this just by passing in N. We want to see what this does, so we'll include a print statement here. And when we run the code, we get three pythons, two Cs, and two Go's. So only our top three words are generated. However, in this lecture, we're not gonna use most common function, but we wanna use heap Q. So let's comment out this line with most common. If you recall, just now we had three pythons and two Cs. But when we put these into a heap, the word that appears the least has to be placed at the top here. So since we have three pythons in our list, it'll have to be placed in the very bottom. So if there are three pythons in our list, we can reverse the sign and say there are minus three pythons instead. We'll create data here. And by using list comprehension, we can put minus counter word with word as the key. So now if the count or python was three, our value would become minus three. In this case, we would have the value minus three, then the corresponding word, which would be Python. We then iterate using list comprehension, putting in forward and counter word. Let's see what we've created so far by printing data and running our code below. We have minus three Python, minus two C, minus one Java and minus two Go. By making the count a negative, the word with the largest count can come to the top of the list as having the smallest int number. Once we've done that, we'll use heap q, heap phi, passing in the data from above to convert it into a heap tree. Let's erase this print function here. And now we take the data we just made into a heap to pop each value out. So we pass in data and with list comprehension, we put for underscore in range, iterating n number of times from our parameter here. Our n value is three. So let's look at the content of this list when the loop is run three times. Adding a print statement and running our code below, we get minus three Python, minus two C, minus two Go, taking the smallest three values from the heap above. Since we only want to return Python, C, and Go, in this case, we use tuples. The index would be zero and one, and we only want the second value, so we can just tell it here to return one. We change this into a return statement and now running the code, we get the result Python C Go. We were successfully able to retrieve the top three ranked most frequent values in this list. This lecture was a practice of creating basic algorithms. In our next unit, we'll begin learning how to actually solve algorithm problems on your own.
Now that you've come this far in the course, you can say that you've gained some knowledge on algorithms and data structures. In this lecture, let's try answering some coding questions. I'm going to provide you with the answers to these questions, but if you want to challenge yourself and try to solve it yourself, I'll first ask the questions, and before I show you the answer, please pause the video and try figuring it out yourself. Regarding these coding questions, being able to solve all the questions is something that is extremely difficult. And after trying to answer many and many coding questions, you'll be able to figure out a pattern as to how you should answer the question. The important thing to solving coding questions is to practice answering many questions. The quantity of questions you try to answer is key. You won't be able to answer all coding questions unless you practice answering many, many questions. So if you're not able to answer all questions, that's fine. If there is a problem you don't know how to solve, then watch the solutions that I provide and try to memorize it for now. For example, it doesn't have to be about coding. It can be about solving a question on a math test. Try to memorize the answer and then that might give you a clue as to how to answer a different math question. So even if you can't answer a coding question here, that's completely fine. The main point is to be proactive in trying to solve many coding questions and memorizing the solutions. Once you do that, you may be able to answer coding questions like the ones that I'll introduce here better. Starting from our next lecture, we'll be introducing coding questions.